Okay. So welcome everybody here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. It's a great day in New York City. It's nice outside, but it's also a great day, I think, for um, theater, for literature, and for the celebration of life and the arts. I think this is an absolutely outstanding event, perhaps a highlight um, of our season honoring one of our own who got the Nobel Prize uh, for Literature. It happens very rarely that a writer um, does get it. There was, of course, uh, Pirandello or Dario Fo, or Shaw and others, but it's very, very rare and we are extremely proud. We also had actually an event with Elfriede Jelinek, uh, who also is one of the honorees of that important prize. And I would like to thank you all for coming. I would like to thank HowlRound, uh, our fantastic national and international nonprofit theater global streaming platform, uh, VJ and uh, Thea for being back uh, with us. And it's now my great uh, pleasure to um, open the day. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of programs here. We bridge academia and professional theater, but especially international and American theater. And anybody who knows about us knows that the events like this are right at the core of our um, work. We are kind of the United Nations uh, of theater here in New York City, and it's a great um, really, really great honor and also pleasure to host Oslo elsewhere here. Two friends, Anna oh, and Sarah, who are with us, and I would like to ask you to come over here. But before I do that, please do take out your phone, and I'll do the same. And it should be uh, sound off, and it never rings at ours. So I really would like to thank the entire team, all the fantastic cast of actors, and um, Sarah, Anna, the floor is yours again. Thank you for your dedication, for your hard work coming with the project to us. We worked a lot on this, you will see. So um, <laughs> let the games begin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> yeah, it's all I think. It's de this is definitely a game that's a good way to think about today. Right? Oh, where are you? There yeah. I am. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we haven't we haven't really talked about who's going to say what or what we need to say, but we, we, we know what we need to say. Yeah. So we'll just get started. What you saw before I ran over there, talked to her, she came running back there. That's going to happen during this because we're experimenting and figuring things out. So so there will be some, uh, there'll be ad hoc during this project. Yeah, so think of today, hopefully those of you who are SVP got the email where we sort of said, think of this as an open studio workshop day. So we haven't rehearsed with the actors. We know and love all of these actors who you're gonna see and hear today, um, but they're, we're kind of like just going for it. We're, we're thinking of it like, okay, gathering a bunch of artists in the room, the audience included, and we're just going to hear these plays today. You know, we're gonna we're gonna listen. We're gonna see what we see, what we hear. We're gonna see what we see. Mm -hmm. um, because Anna and I started. We founded Oslo Elsewhere back in two thousand three, three or four. So we we this is complicated. Well, because the premiere happened in two thousand four, but we really started working in two thousand three. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was like. 21 years ago now, long time. So the first premiere happened exactly 20 years ago in June in 2004. And that's the first play we're doing today, Night yeah. Things It Songs. Night Things It Songs. Um, and I feel like there was something else I was going to say about that. <laughs> and now I'm forgetting. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going along this whole... It's funny with the microphone because you feel like you're like really presenting something, but actually we're all in this together. So... Um, yeah. Yeah. I think um I think we should maybe just go for it. Yeah. Is that oh I know what I was gonna say. Um <laughs> it was that because since since we did all this work 10 to 20 years ago, you know, our careers have gone in different directions. Anna's become a filmmaker, I've moved my practice towards a more visual art performance realm and so one of the things we're thinking about today and why we're going to be experimenting with video and sound is thinking about what are what's possible in this moment now with Fossa. how we really hope that um his work will get a bigger life over here that it will go beyond just our productions and that more and more people will be doing um, interacting with his plays and so we're playing with some ideas um, and, and and we have some thoughts about what could what could happen so that's what that's what you're going to experience today um, you may hear us start and stop you may hear something some crazy things happen but we're, but we're just all in it together 
Yeah. I think that's what I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the experimentation is also a matter of what are the different ways of listening to Jun Fossa? Because for many of you who have read a lot of Jun Fossa, you know how his language sounds in your head. And it's a different thing to see it performed or hear it read. But what are all the way, different ways that we can listen? So we're trying also to have the readings of each of these five plays to have a, a bit of a different perspective on what it means to listen. Yeah. And what it means to see it. Totally. Do you want to start with this one? Yes. Okay. So ready? So we're, this is Night Sings at Songs. I think all of you who are reading the role, you know where your place is. Um, so we basically, we've, we've, we've like given a little bit of a geography of the space um, for the actors, but they are also free to do what they want. Um, and I think I kind of think we should just go for it. One one thing I'll just say um, for everybody as we as we go into these plays right now is that um, a lot of times people think of Fossa as being really sort of dark and bleak um, um, because some of the sub the subject material is hard. Um, but I think if you can listen to the if you can you know listen to the the words play and just like hear them trust yourself and 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 actually like go towards the humor letting all of the possibilities um come out on the table that's when we when we play against the tragedy is what i'm saying it's very strange to say this into a microphone right now um okay so enjoy have fun let's let's just go over it do you guys feel ready yeah oh, yeah be a surprise no no that's the other thing we first supposed to say do you want to say something about Yes, sure. Yes, I'm going to say that. So part of our, our visual experiment for this one is to see what happens if we layer the footage from uh, from the 2004 production. I was telling some of you earlier that um, I put the, we we recorded this for archival purposes, and then we literally like went into a drawer. And I took it out last week for the first time because when you record theater, it usually it, it, it's nothing like the live experience. And this is what people on HowlRound are not going to feel what we're feeling in this room today. But um, but hopefully you still get a sense of it. And that's kind of what's interesting here is just to to see what's happening. And we have two actors from the original cast that are you're going to see on the screen here, Anna and Diane. Actually. And let's introduce everybody who's playing. Who's playing what? So Anna's playing the young woman. James is playing the young man. Diane is playing the mother. Rain is playing the father. And surprise later, she's <laughs> playing Vazda. Um, and then the other experiment we wanted to try was because Anna speaks Minosh, or she speaks Norwegian and Minosh. She can speak Minosh. Um, so we are actually putting, we're going to try to have uh, the first half of the third scene is you're going to hear her best about the Minosh. Um, and there'll be some subtitles. Uh, that you can follow along. So hopefully that'll work. But that's you might hear us. That's where we might stop for a second and then try that. In this play. In this play. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Did we not tell you that on Thursday? No, no. I, don't, I just didn't know which. which yeah, yeah. yeah. It's good. Yeah, it's okay. so <laughs> You'll hear it. I, yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure I will. So. Okay. Any questions before we start from anyone? No. The setting. Mm. We're going to actually hear a little bit of the setting, um, but it, it's a, in a home, mostly. But it's a good question, actually, because, you know, a lot of times when, when people think, oh, there's a Norwegian writer, you think you must be in Norway. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily true. And what's what's interesting about, you know, Foss's work are so universal, um, and that's why people around the world really love them. So I think we're also, we're in a home. Anywhere. You know, anywhere. <laughs> At any time. It could be anywhere. It could be New York City. It could be Oslo. It could be Bangladesh, Dhaka. You know, it could be, it could be anywhere. So um, but we're in a home. And you'll hear a little bit more. We will have stage directions read to help set the scene. Okay? Here we go. Let's do it. Video.
One, black, lights up. A living room, a sofa, an easy chair, and a coffee table a bit to the right at the front of the stage. A large window at the back, a bit to the left. It is light outside. On the right side of the window, somewhat high up, hangs a clock. It shows 2.45 p.m. Under the clock, a bit to the right, hangs a picture of a baby boy. To the left side of the window is an unusually large sideboard. One door in the short wall on the left and one door in the short wall on the right. The young man lies on the sofa reading a book. The young woman comes in from the door on the right. I cannot stand it anymore. No, I can't handle it. We cannot live like this. The young man sits up slowly, closes the book, but keeps his place with his index finger. You lie there reading, you don't go out, you don't do anything. We don't have any money, you don't have any work, we don't have anything. And, you know, you go out less and less before at least you went to the store to buy food, went to the post office. I mean, you've never even liked going on walks. I have always loved to go on walks before. Yeah, before I met you, I always went on walks. Every Sunday I went on a walk and other days too. And I had friends, maybe not tons of friends, but I had friends, girlfriends. But hey, they never really come here. Not even Marta comes over anymore. She'll ring the doorbell stand outside and talk to me, but you won't come inside because you just sit there radiating gloom. My girlfriends came here a few times, but you just sat there stiff and awkward, didn't say a word. <laughs> what an atmosphere. No, it was unbearable, and that's why... It's no wonder they don't come anymore. No one comes here. You're not okay. You can't stand people, yeah. No, I can't handle much more of this. <laughs> now that someone's finally coming to visit, it's your parents? <laughs> Just so happens your parents come here too. Not so long since the last time they were here. Besides, I'm not the one who asked my parents to come. Well, at least they won't stay very long. Yeah, yeah. It's not that strange that they want to see their grandchild, though. Isn't that allowed? They come here to see their grandchild. Do you understand that? There isn't any other reason they would come. Yeah. And it's about time to come see the baby. Hard to believe they're not interested at all. They could have come before. Yeah, yeah, I mean that. I just want to be. Oh, yeah, well, they have to come, of course. Of course they have to come. So I guess I have to clean up now before your parents arrive. It should be nice and clean when a mother-in-law comes to visit, isn't that right? The young man puts the book on the table, rises and walks around the room. You can stay put. Stay put. I can't handle watching you pace around the room. I'll straighten up, so don't you worry yourself. The young man goes back to the sofa, sits down. I'll take care of everything. You just relax. You, you read. Just keep reading your book. You, you just keep reading. Or maybe you would like to go do the shopping? Or, or do I have to do that too? I'll do the shopping. Clean the house, fix the foods for your parents. No, you can do the shopping. Well. You dare to go out? But you don't dare to go to the store anymore. So why are you saying yeah? Should I have said no? No, you just lie there. You lie there. Just lie there and read. I can clean up the house. Good. But shouldn't you be writing now, reading? How's it going with your writing anyway? Are you writing or are you just lying on the sofa? Mm -hmm. Actually, I think maybe yeah, I sent something to a publisher a while ago. You sent something to a publisher? Yeah. But they probably won't want it. I'm sure it'll be okay. I think it will. You know, you're, yeah, ever since I've known you, you've been writing and writing. The years add up after a while with you writing and writing. 
writing and more writing. Shh. Did you hear something? Is he crying? I can go check on him. The young woman exits the door to the left, and the young man takes the book, moves through the pages looking for his place, lies down on the sofa, finds his place, and begins to read. The young woman comes in again. No. Are, are you reading again? We have so much to do. Weren't you going to clean up the house? The young man closes the book, marking his place with his index finger. He's asleep. Yeah. You don't want to go shopping. You wouldn't dare, no? No, I, I, I cannot handle much more of this. You never go out. I don't understand you. I cannot handle much more. No. Your parents, are they, uh, are they here already? That was the doorbell, right? They were supposed to come later. Well, you think it's your parents? He remains seated, puts the book on the coffee table. Should, should I open the door? He just sits there, and she exits the door to the right. He gets up, goes to the window, looks out, turns, looks toward the door on the right where a man in his 60s appears, dressed in a blue quilted down parka. He's carrying a brown shopping bag. The father looks down, looks up when he sees the young man, takes the bag in his other hand, and with his arm outstretched and head bowed, he goes toward the young man. They meet and shake hands, but they do not look at each other. Yeah. Hello, hello. Yeah. And I must congratulate you on the baby. Thank you. Thank you. The young woman and mother come in. The mother has on a coat. The young man looks toward the mother. Oh, there you are. There you are. She puts her hand out, goes toward the young man who goes toward the mother. They shake hands. She stands there holding his hands. And I must congratulate you on the little one. She lets go of his hands. Oh, this is so nice. Finally, we get to see our grandchild. I have, uh, oh, we have waited a long time for this, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, we have. But where is the child? He's sleeping in the bedroom. Oh, but I need to see him right away. You can have a seat. Oh, yeah. Thank you. The father goes and sits down in the easy chair, sets the bag by the chair. The young woman and the mother go toward the door to the left. You have to come, too. You've got to see the little one. No, no. I, I can wait until he wakes up. The mother goes out the door and the young woman follows her. Yeah, so this is where you live. I live here. Yeah. Well, yeah. Hmm. And you, is everything okay with you too? Everything's basically the same, yeah. With the others back there too? Yeah, I can't think of any news, not offhand anyway. Well, that's how it goes. Yeah. And you are well? I can complain. Uh, things are pretty much the same. But do you have any work? No, well, probably not that easy to find something to do, though. No. But you are getting by? Yeah. You have a nice place, in any case, and it's Pretty central, right? It is. But it must be expensive to live here. Pretty expensive. But you two are getting by. We are. <laughs> In a way. Anyhow. Uh, yeah, we had to come into town. Me and your mother had some errands to run. So we just had to... Yeah, well, that's how it goes. A crying baby is heard. 
I guess he woke up. Yeah. He oh. sleeps most of the day. He doesn't cry too much? The crying subsides. I guess he calmed down again. He sleeps a lot. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's how it goes. Well, we just thought we'd stop by since we were down in town anyway, yeah? Yeah, makes sense. It won't be long just stopping by. Yeah. He woke up just for a second, but he went to sleep again right away. Oh, it was stupid of me to wake him up. I didn't mean to do that. Oh, no, that was really stupid. She goes and takes a seat on the sofa. You have to see him, a beautiful little boy. You have to see him. Yeah. The young woman exits the door to the right. It's not easy to tell who he looks like. But uh, my, he's beautiful. He certainly doesn't look like you. <laughs> no, he, not you either. No, he definitely doesn't look like you at all. And he doesn't look like me either, as a matter of fact, and not like her either. But how are things with you two? Oh, yes, uh, everything's fine. Thanks. And the baby's doing well. Oh, yeah. yeah, everything's fine. But... So you came into town today. Yeah. yeah, we had to come and meet the little one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you had some errands to run. Yeah. But we mainly came to see. <laughs> I guess I should go out and get some food um, for the guests. Oh, no, not at all. No, 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 no need to. No, no need to. Uh, yeah, uh, you surprised us a bit. Yeah, we came a bit early. Uh, yeah, please forgive us. It's okay. We just wanted to stop by for a few minutes. We should go soon. Yeah, they changed the bus schedule. But you have to see the baby too. Uh, yeah. Me too. Um... Why don't you go and have a look at him? Oh, I, I can wait. No, go go on and have a look at him. <laughs> yeah. The father gets up, and the young man and the father exit the door to the left. But I should really run to the store now, so I can offer you something. I, I was on my way out the door when you oh, came. Oh, no, no, you don't need to. We have to go soon. The bus leaves soon, you know. We, we're just stopping by for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> but we... Just had to see the little one since we were in town anyway. Yeah, my, he's beautiful. Yeah. He, yeah, he really is a beautiful baby. Yeah, you've been lucky. <laughs> and everything's going well with both you and the baby. Nothing unusual. Everything's happened the way it's supposed to. Everything is fine. Well, that's good. And you're on maternity leave from your job. Yeah. Oh, it's so nice that you have a little time to be with the baby. Oh, yeah. We uh, brought a little present, <laughs> of course. She goes to her bag, lifts it up, places it on the seat of the easy chair, unzips the bag, takes out a package, then remains standing with the package in her hands. Oh, well, it's nothing much, just something small. We wanted to bring something for the baby. Thank you so much. That's very nice. It's nothing much. The young woman remains standing, fidgeting with the wrapping paper. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is one fine baby. The father comes in the door. What do you think? Yeah, he's a fine boy. Oh, we got a present. We 
maybe we should open it. Yes, thank you very much. The young, the young woman sits down on the sofa, begins to open the package. It's nothing much. It's just a small thing. The young woman opens the package and takes out a blue blanket, holds it in front of her, and then holds it up toward the young man. That's nice. Yeah. It's so difficult to know what you buy. It's just a little something. The young woman lays the blanket on the coffee table, gets up, takes the wrapping paper and with her and exits the door to the right. The mother picks up the blanket, looks at it. Yeah, wasn't he beautiful? Yes. But who does he look like? Who knows? <laughs> she folds the blanket, places it on the coffee table. No, oh, I, I can't tell. Not like you in any case. No. Maybe like, no, I, I, I don't know. The father goes and sits down in the easy chair. Yeah, you've got a, a beautiful son. The young woman comes in. She has put on a jacket. Oh, oh, no, 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 don't trouble yourself. We're just about to leave. That's how it is today. They've changed the bus schedule. Isn't that right? Yeah, we have to go soon. It's just... About time. We, we, we just wanted to meet the little one. Yeah, this is just a quick visit. The father gets up, takes the bag, and lifts it up, pulls the zipper shut, then walks across to the center of the room. Mother gets up, and she also walks to the center of the room. Yeah, we'll save a longer visit for another time. But that's how it is. Yeah, you know, there aren't that many buses running these days. It's actually the last bus of the day. They have stopped running the other routes. Yeah. But they should really drop by. But you should really drop by our place, all three of you. Yeah, you really must do that. In the summer, when it's light and warm out, you really should come out and visit us then. Okay? Yeah. Well, thanks for stopping by. And it'll be a longer visit next time. The mother and father go toward the door to the right. I'll walk into the door. The mother and father go through the door, but stop. Yeah, this was short. Uh, but that's how it is when one doesn't think to check the bus schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Goodbye. The mother and father go out the door to the right. The young man goes after them. The young woman goes and sits down in an easy chair, opens her legs wide apart, looks a little dejected. The young man comes back. The young woman gets up, walks across to the center of the room. The young man goes and sits down in the easy chair. Now you see, no one wants to be here, not even your parents. They practically left before they had arrived. Had a quick peek at the baby, talked a bit about who he looks like and doesn't look like, and then they just left. They hardly believed that you were the father. The young man gets up, lies down on the sofa. I don't think they liked him at all. Yes, they did. Well, I don't know. Yes, they did. Why are you saying that? Maybe they liked him. They liked him. Of course, they liked him a lot. Yeah, I guess they did. Okay. But I guess I should go shopping now so we have something to eat. And if he wakes up, you have to pick him up. The young man nods, and while the young woman stands and looks at him... He takes the book up from the table and searches for his place, finds it, and begins to read. Yeah, okay. I'm going now. He nods without looking at her. She goes out the door to the right. He puts the book down on his chest, continues to lie there, staring straight ahead. Lights out. Black. Two. Black. Lights up. Twilight outside the window. The clock shows about 5.30 p.m. The young man still lies on the sofa with the book on his chest. He gets up, goes to the window, and looks out. The young woman comes in the door to the right with jacket on. She has a shopping bag in her hand. The young woman holds out a letter to the young man. Letter for you. I don't know how much we should wait for this, Sarah. What do you think? Sure. Let's wait for yeah, it. Yeah, should we wait a little bit? Black lights up. We caught up. We were yeah. <laughs> there we are. 
I think it's there's that clock. Five thirty. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be a little out of time. Yeah. And now that there we go. Yeah, now it's probably. All right, let's do it. Yeah. Oh, uh oh. Oh. What happened? Well then, then let's get that back on track and we can. Give us a second. How's everyone doing? Yeah, this is it. Uh, do we have enough chairs or do we need to take uh, out a few more chairs? No, we're good. We're good. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Letter for you. A letter. Yeah. It's from a publisher. She goes over to him, hands him the letter. He remains standing, looking at it. Aren't you curious? Yes, I guess. A little. Yeah, maybe. But you were gone so long. Yeah. Yeah, I stopped by Marta's place. Oh, oh, by the way, she's actually coming here. Big day today, first your parents, and now maybe Marta. I can't remember the last time we had so many visitors. But your parents weren't here very long. Is he still sleeping? No. Now there's no way he'll fall asleep tonight. Did he sleep the whole time? Yeah. You haven't been in there to check on him? Yes, I have a couple of times. Well, now it's time for him to wake up. But hey, Mart and I were thinking about going out tonight. Yeah? Yeah, I hope that's okay. I cannot just stay inside. You know? Yeah? She's coming pretty soon, and then we'll go out for a bit. She lifts up the shopping bag. I bought some food so you can eat it if you want. I can't handle making dinner. I had a bite at Marta's. Marta's coming here. Yeah, obviously just as far as the door. Obviously she's not going to stay here with the atmosphere you create and spread around you. Yeah. Yeah. He went over to Marta's. Yeah. But hey, open your letter. No, not right now. Why not? No. I guess I'll wake him up. He shouldn't sleep. He shouldn't sleep all day long, you know? No, he shouldn't sleep any longer now. I have to wake him up, or you can wake him up, change him, feed him. I can do that. What time is Martha coming? She's coming now, any minute. I just have to get ready. But you do understand, don't you? Even though you want to sit inside all day long, even though you never go out, I must be allowed to go out. I cannot handle sitting inside all the time. You hardly speak. You just lie there, just lie there on the sofa reading, yeah? Yeah, I know. Martin and I used to get together all the time. She'd usually come over to my place. We'd sit there laughing and talking, having a great time. But since you and I moved in together, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't work. Yeah, I know. Go on, open your letter. They don't want what you've written? But you thought it would go well this time, didn't you? Yes, I guess I did. But how long are you going to continue with this writing of yours? You cannot just sit there writing year after year. You can't just... Maybe you're not supposed to be a writer. Yeah, I, I mean that. Either you have to get something published or you have to find something else 
to do. You can't just sit inside, never going out and writing things no one cares about. No. He puts the letter down on the windowsill, goes and sits down in an easy chair. So you can't go check on the baby? She goes and puts the shopping bag in front of him on the coffee table. Here's your food. Anyway. She goes out the door to the left. Then she comes in again, carrying a small mirror, some makeup, and a blouse. No, he's sleeping so soundly, it's better to leave him. You can change him when he wakes up. She goes over to the coffee table, puts down the mirror, makeup, and blouse on the table. She points to the shopping bag. Can you take this stuff to the kitchen? He nods, gets up, takes the shopping bag, and goes out to the right. She takes off her jacket, puts on the arm of the easy chair, pulls the sweater over her head, stands there in just her bra. She sits down in the easy chair, takes some makeup, and begins applying it. The young man comes in and sits down on the sofa. How long until Martha gets here? She should be here any minute. She's coming soon. But those parents of yours, they really are... She continues to put on the makeup. Imagine coming like that and then leaving right away. I'm sure they didn't like the baby. It's probably because they don't like me. That they don't like the baby. They've never liked me. Your father could hardly be bothered to look at the baby. That's not true. No, okay. But why is it then that your father couldn't care less, hardly bother to go see the baby? He's just shy. Doesn't want to be a burden. Just like you. She has put on some bright red lipstick, gets up, walks around the room to, with the mirror in her hand, makes a face, and puts on some more lipstick. She turns toward him and makes a face. Looks good. Yeah, it does. Ah, it's too bad about that publisher that they don't want to publish your work. She takes the blouse up from the coffee table, puts it on, buttons it. She walks around a bit, looks at herself again in the mirror, puts on a little more lipstick. She walks over to the window, stands there and looks out. Hips thrust out a bit to the side. The young man sits and looks at her. She turns toward him. But here comes Marta. I see her down the street. I think I'll just go down so you don't have to see her. She gets the jacket from the arm of the easy chair, puts it on, picks up the sweater from the floor, takes it and the mirror and makeup, and puts it all on the windowsill. Then she goes to the door on the right. She stops. I have to run. I'm going to be home. I, I won't be late, but don't wait, wait up for me, okay? Just go to bed, okay? Hey. What is it? My plan's called. Really? Any particular reason? No. They just called, and then my mother said that she had been so overwhelmed by seeing her grandchild that she said she forgot to give another little present she had for him. A little toy, I guess. It's nice that she had a present for him at all. She picks up the blanket from the coffee table, remaining standing, and looks at it. She said she'll send the toy. Your parents don't call very often. She goes and pulls out a drawer in the chest, puts the blanket in, and closes the drawer. And they also said that they got home safe. The doorbell rings. That must be Marta. I just thought I should tell you that. Well, I, I have to go. The young man nods. The young woman goes out the door to the right. There are clean baby bottles on the kitchen counter. He gets up, goes over to the window, stands and looks out. And then he takes the letter, stands and looks at it, puts it back on the windowsill. Then he goes over to the sofa, lies down, takes the book, flips pages, finds his place, reads a little puts the book aside on the coffee table, gets up, goes over to the window again, stops himself there, looks out, takes the, little, the sweater from the windowsill, remaining standing and fidgets with it, lights down black. We're gonna hold for a second here.
Okay, so the titles are going to be on the professor element instead of that. On this one? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Okay, go for it. Okay. All right. Three. Lights up. Outside the window, it is dark. The clock shows about 2.30 a.m. On the coffee table stands a baby bottle with a little milk in it. The young man lies on the sofa and stares straight ahead. He rises, goes to the window, looks out into the dark. The child begins to cry. He goes over to an old baby carriage, which stands close to the window with its top up, and begins to roll the carriage back and forth. He stops and stands still while rocking it up and down. The crying subsides. He goes and sits down on the sofa, but then gets up again and goes to the window. He takes the letter with him and sits down on the sofa, sits and looks at the letter, puts the letter on the coffee table, gets up, goes to the window, looks out, remains standing there looking out the window. He goes over and lies down on the sofa. The young woman comes in the door to the right with a jacket on. She is in relatively high spirits. He looks at her. Men är du uppe? Jag trodde är han vaken? Isha? He's been sleeping for a while now. But he kept waking up almost impossible to get him to sleep. He falls asleep, wakes up again. Get that up all night. Han ligger i barnvagnen. There's no way to get him to settle down to his bed. He just keeps waking up. And if he's lying down in his bed, it's impossible to get him to fall asleep again. I had to rock him, push him back and forth, just to get him to fall asleep. Det hjälpte inte med smoken heller. Not at all. Goes over to the baby carriage, peeks inside. Men nu ser han tryggt och gott. Han grej mätt i stad. Du har skiftat på han? Ja, yeah, twice. Och du har gett han mat? Ja. Yeah. Jag hade inte väntat att du skulle vara uppe. Det blev ju ganska sent. Du sitter och väntar på mig? Ja. Uh, yeah. uh, no, he... Um... <sighs> Uh, he just kept waking up, you know, so I had to get up. He just kept waking up, so it was easiest to just get up and come into the living room. So du hade lagt dig? Yeah. He sits up on the sofa. You had a good time? Yeah, then. You want friends? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, Martin. Yeah. You're so late. Du har vänta. Yeah. But where have you been? Yeah. Nej. Det ska begynna nu igen. You can at least tell me where you've been. What? Kan vi själv gå lägga oss? Det är sent. Jag har lust att lägga mig. Jag kan fortälla imorgon eller heller. The young man doesn't answer. He lies down again on the sofa. The young woman goes over to the window and looks out. You go ahead. You go to bed. 
Men vill inte du och gå och lägga dig? I don't think I've done any sleep. I'm tired. But I won't be able to fall asleep. Jo, det gör du nog. Vill du bara pröva? Ja. Yeah. Jag är er i alla fall trött. That car I saw, I stood here looking for you, wondering if you'd come home soon. I mean, who drove you home? I mean, don't get me wrong. But, yeah. Det var den natta. Jeg tar meg litt vin. She goes to the door to the right, comes back with a bottle of wine in one hand and a half full glass in the other. Så, nu er jeg klar. Spør i vegg. No. I'm not going to ask. Jeg er bare litt trøyt. She drinks. Yeah. Det har ikke skjedd noe særlig, så vet du det. Men hva er det du vil vite? Hvor har du vært? Hvem har du vært sammen med? Og så videre. I'm sure you can tell me something. Ja, vel. Drinks wine? No, you don't need to. I'm just a little anxious. <laughs> I don't know. Ja. Ja, jeg tøfte venninna mi, Marte, og så åt vi middag på en restaurant, og så gikk vi på et diskotek, og så, ja, så gikk vi på en nattklubb. The young man sits up on the sofa and looks toward the young woman. Var det så noe mer du gjerne vil vite? Ikke? Kan vi nå gå og legge oss? Jeg er trøyt, jeg vil sove. Jeg skal bare drikke ut dette glaset, og så kan vi gå og legge oss, kan vi ikke? Sant? Kan du komme over her? Sitt med meg for en minutt. Pakk med meg for en bit. Jeg vil ikke være til å falle sleep. Jeg kan føle det. Kan vi snakke for en minutt? Prata. Yeah. Du lyssnar. Jag har väntat upp för dig. Du behöver really inte gå till bed right away. Men jag är er så trött. Jag är uh, lite full. Jag är er kanske också. Dricker jag mer nu, känner jag i alla fall till att bli full. She drinks a little wine, goes over to the sofa, sets the bottle and glass on the floor picks up the letter which is lying on the table, sits down and looks at the letter. She looks at him. Du skal gi ut bok. Snart. Nå vel. Det må vi skåle på. She puts down the letter, pours more wine in her glass, lifts it toward him, but sh- he shakes his head. Men nu skal du ikke bare sitte her og skrive og skrive med, men få ut ditt nokka til og med. Ha, ikke verst. Can you stop? The young woman puts the glass on the floor, takes the letter again, reads it. Give it to me. No. Nice response. I've spent at least a year working and working on it. Seek it longer. Yeah. Anyway, it's been a lot of work. Men det er jo mange forlag. She picks up the glass, drinks a little. Nei, dette kommer til å ende opp med fyll. I've had a lot to drink. Well, you seem pretty sober. I have not drunk so much. But now it's good with a little wine. She drinks a little more. Have you done anything? No, I've just been sitting here walking around and pushing the carriage. Waiting for you. But where have you been? Can't you tell me something? You were with Marta. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.
Wefer? Oh, I can't handle it. it, it it's too stupid. Saida? No. I can't handle it. Prefer Isha? No, we're not out with Martin. The young woman drinks some wine. So they are you, Isha. Do hard. Uh... And no one has ever believed that either. No. Is she there? No. No, well. In fact, I'm supposed to say hi from Martin. Don't lie. Why do you have to lie? The young woman looks down. So, you weren't out with Marta because she called for you a little while after you left. Nivel, so har jeg ikke det da. Skal vi krangle, eller hva er det du vil? Kan vi ikke heller gå og legge oss? Vi kan prate i morgen. The young woman sits down next to him, puts one arm around his shoulders. They sit like this a while. He sits and stares straight ahead. She rubs his shoulders a little. Can we just go and lay us? Do? Can we just? I can tell you tomorrow. He just sits there, looking straight ahead. Sits and fumbles with the paper. Come. We go and lay us. She presses cl him close to her. Do. Come on now. Can we just? Kan vi ikke snakke i morgen? Jeg, jeg kan fortelle i morgen. You can just tell me where you went, at least. You weren't with Martha in any case. Jo. Det har jeg. Du bare lyg. Hun kan ikke ha ringt. For hun har nemlig vært sammen med meg. Jeg kjenner deg, triksa dine, at du orker. Jeg kjenner deg jo så godt. Get that car. Who drove you home? Ja, ja. Nei, greit. She withdraws her arm. Vi kan sitte her og måpe, slik vi alltid gjør hver eneste kveld. Kanskje vi kan se på fjernsyn også, selv om det er midt på natta. Now, we'll go ahead and go to bed, okay? I mean it. Du går jo aldri ut. Du vil ikke noe. Sitt her bare skal liksom skrive. Ja. Ingen kjem hit. Ingen orker å komme på besøk hit. Og så deg foreldre dine da. Kom i dag. Gjekk nesten før deg var kommende. Du. I know. I know all that. Du. Okay, we're together, right? Aren't we? Jo, jo, det er ikke det. And you were the one who really wanted us to have the baby. Jeg kom bare med den også. At du ikke bare blir lei av deg selv. At du ikke kjeder deg selv. Ja, det har du søkt mange ganger. Må du alltid si det? Kan du ikke finne på noe nytt å si? She goes toward the door to the left, stops, looks at him. Nei, jeg vil gå og legge meg. Du vil jo ikke noe. Du, du vil ikke engang gå utom døra. Ikke engang på butikken vil du gå. Du sitter bare inne. Skal liksom skrive. Jeg kan ikke bare sitte inne. Jeg orker det ikke. Jeg blir galen av det. I think you just tell me. Tosses the paper ball on the floor. Who drove you home? No, stop it. Don't start again. I'm tired. Can't we go to bed? It's late. Oh, is it really that late? <laughs> I didn't realize how late it was. Come on, let's go to bed, please. He's going to wake up soon. This one, only a couple of hours <laughs> until he's up and at him. The young woman goes over to the sofa, reaches out with her hands toward the young man. Come on, let's go to bed. I can hold you. 
come on now, can't we? We can hold each other and sleep. Come on. The young woman sitting. She withdraws her hands. Here's to the night. She sits down next to him on the sofa again, picks up the glass, drinks a little wine. She looks at him. Hey, can't we go to bed? We can hold each other, comfort each other. The young man gets up. But I've waited up for you. You could have come home a little earlier. I, I sit here waiting and waiting. Walk to the window, walk back to the sofa, lie down for it, but get up again, waiting and waiting. You shouldn't wait up for me like that. There's no point. You could go out too, you know? Every now and then, at least. You can't just sit inside. In any case, I cannot handle sitting inside all the time. You never go out, not during the day, not at night, not even for a walk. You never want to go for a walk, not even with me and the baby. You just stay inside all the time. Yeah, yeah. I cannot just sit inside all the time because you do. I am not like that. Something has to happen. I have to see people. Yeah. And if only we could have people come to our home, but that doesn't work either because then you just go out and hide yourself as soon as anyone comes through the door. You disappear into the bedroom. It doesn't work. I can't go out and meet people and they can't come here because if someone does come and you don't disappear into the bedroom, you stay out here and you're so stiff and so strange that the atmosphere becomes so tense that it's unbearable. Your own parents left almost before they'd arrived. Everything becomes so tense and horrible. It doesn't work. I cannot handle people coming here. No. They are afraid of people. It doesn't work to live like this. The young man sits down in the easy chair. But you're home so late. You said that you would come home early. Yeah, yeah. But you had such a great time. Yeah, we had a great time. Yeah. That the hours just slipped away. Yeah. And now the rest of the night is slipping away too. You won't say anything. Tell me anything. Yes, I will, but I am tired. Have you won? Yes, I've danced with many men. Is that what you want me to say? Chatted. I had a nice time. I did. I met up with some people I work with. I've got to be able to see them every now and then while I'm on leave. I met Jan and some of the others. I cannot just sit inside, even though you do. You just sit there, yeah? But we really went together. <laughs> Aren't we? Yeah. 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 Yeah, of course. We're all good. It's not that. I know. We are really good. And we've stayed together so long. Things aren't so terrible between us. No. But we were just so young. We met in high school and ever since... Yeah. I've got to be able to spend time with people besides you. You weren't like this before. You're just getting worse and worse. I can't just sit inside all the time, even though you do. You know? And can't you... Go back to school. Or something. <laughs> That's what you wanted to say. Yeah. You need to find something... Get yourself a job or something. Get a haircut and a real job. Is that what you wanted to say? So funny. But you can earn some money, you too, you know. Yeah, I mean that. And this publisher doesn't want your manuscript. You can't just sit inside writing, though, year after year. Either you have to get something published 
or you have to find something else to do. But I'm sure people usually don't get published. That's the way it is, isn't it? Everyone gets rejected, don't they? I'm sure it's not that easy to get something published, though. Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't worry about it. Maybe writing isn't what you should be doing, though, when it comes down to it. Hmm. It could be that you're supposed to be doing something completely different. Maybe. Not really to concentrate with him there. All day long. It was better before he was born? Is that what you mean? Maybe not. One rejection isn't the end of the world. It doesn't mean that much, does it? I want at least 10. No. No, you don't, do you? Yes. <laughs> the young woman pours wine into her glass, gets up, goes over to the window, stands as if lost in her own thoughts, daydreaming, and looks out. She takes off her jacket, remains standing with it under her arm. Yeah, I have 10, at the very least. I just haven't told you. I get the letters and then I throw them away. Yeah? The young man gets up. Just haven't said anything to you. I always get the mail. And each time, yeah, I just throw them away. Let's go to bed. I've been rejected by one publisher after another. Can you listen to me? I'm listening. I am tired. You are not listening. You're just standing there, looking outside. What are you looking for? And it drove you home. Can I tell you it was? Man that drove me home. Who was it? That drove me home? Yeah. I took a cab. The young man stands there, looks straight down. The young woman turns and looks at him. Yeah, I did. Oh, why? I saw it. It's not a cab. I was looking outside when you got here. The young woman walks around the room a bit. Yeah, so I got a ride. But I couldn't tell you that Buster drove me home because if I did, you would have started raising hell and here's to the night. So, yeah, I got a ride home with Buster, so now you know. Did you meet up with him while you were out? He, he didn't turn on him. It was Buster, did he? No, come on, of course he didn't. Why did you sit down there in his car for so long? I didn't sit down there in his car for so for for very long. Now you've got to stop this. No. Okay. We just talked for a bit. The baby whimpers and the young woman young woman goes over and begins to roll the baby carriage then stands quietly, rocking the carriage up and down. The baby becomes quiet. I want to go to bed. I'm tired. She goes over to the window stands and looks out. Why are you standing there dreaming? I'm not dreaming. I just have to be able to see people other than you. Then go home with your colleague in the evening, in the night. Now, while you're on leave. No. I know it. I know that you have been out with him and not with her, your girlfriend. Just something to say. I, I understand that much at least. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I have. Then I have been, I've been with Buster the whole night. Went back to his place. Is there anything else you want to know? Yeah. 
We drove around in his car, listened to music, and we talked too. And we went back to his place, him and I, just the two of us. Are you pleased now? That's what you did. No, I'm just teasing. I've been out with Marta. That's the truth. And you won't get me to believe that she called you. But I saw it. Yeah, but that car. Yeah, yeah, I told you what that was. You weren't joking. It was just Marta's boyfriend. He picked her up, and so he drove me home too, okay? Can we please go to bed now? I can't handle it. What is it you can't handle now? Oh, are you lies? I am not lying. Yes, I can tell I'm lying. Yeah, fine. I am tired. I want to sleep. She drinks wine. I'm sure you'd really rather go out again. Go out and drive around in a car. Listen to some music, have a nice time, like you say. You could go to the best place. That way, at least, you wouldn't have to sit inside with me. Whoever goes out, he gets relatively close to her. Just go. Go home to your best. You don't need go to your best or whatever his name is. I can go out. Okay. The young woman begins to pace around the floor. The baby begins to cry. The young woman begins to roll the carriage around the floor, stops, rocks it up and down. The young woman goes to the door on the right. You're going. No, they're going. I didn't mean it. It's something from the night. Come on. Don't go. The young woman goes out the door to the right, and the young man walks around the room, rocking the carriage up and down. Lights out. Black. Four. Black. Lights up. It is a little lighter outside. The clock shows about 4 a.m. The coffee table is, in a, is a bit out of place, and the baby carriage is now where the coffee table stood, alongside the sofa. The young man is lying on the sofa, staring straight ahead, with one hand rocking the baby carriage up and down. The door on the right opens. The young woman comes in quietly with her jacket on. She looks at the young man who lies there with his eyes shut. She goes out the door to the left, comes back in with a bag. She opens a drawer in the sideboard, and the young man opens his eyes and looks at her. What are you doing? So you're awake. The young man sits up on the sofa. The young woman throws some clothes into the bag. What are you doing? Can't you see? The young man gets up. No, you don't. Yeah, you can't. The young woman opens another drawer, takes out some baby clothes, throws them in the bag. Can't you say something? What is it? Say something. I'm moving out. You can see that. The young man goes and lies down on the sofa. The young woman takes the bag and exits the door to the right sets the bag down outside and comes back in with Basta, who is a few years older than the young man. This is Basta. Yeah, I called Basta. It was in the middle of the night, called him up, but he came, didn't you, Basta? Yeah. The young man sits up. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't joke around. I'm not joking. I called Bas Basta. I cannot handle any more of this. <laughs> Can't you stop this? No? Okay, I called and Basta said that he would come and pick me up. Do you understand what I'm telling you? No. Not really. You haven't. When he said anything. I can't handle it anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I'm leaving. Moving out. Do you understand? 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I'm moving out. I cannot handle it anymore. No, don't say that. Wait for a minute in the hallway, okay? Basta goes out the door to the right. We're such good friends. Okay. It was him who drove me home. Yeah, Basta. Tonight. But that much you understand, right? Tonight, yeah. But I guess you know that. You know that he was the one who drove me home, don't you? I've told you that. But you don't believe it. No matter what I tell you, you don't believe me. And you go, you've got to at least get that much that it was uh, that I was with him tonight, not my girlfriend. I'm telling you that Basta and I have, yeah, loved each other. I guess that's what it is, even if it sounds stupid to you. Yeah, Basta and I have loved each other for a long time. Just so you know. It's true. Don't you believe me? No, okay. And in case you're wondering, yes, we've made love many times. Tonight we made love in his car. Are you listening to what I'm telling you or are you completely dense? Do you understand or don't you believe me? Don't you understand anything at all? The young woman goes and sits on the sofa and the young man gets up and begins to roll the baby carriage back and forth across the floor. The young woman turns toward him. I can't not handle it anymore. Don't you understand that? I can't handle it. The young man stops, remains still, and rocks the carriage up and down. I cannot stand it any longer. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Going. So now you can definitely go to bed. The young woman gets up, goes to the door on the right, and calls out. Hey, 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 come on in. You don't need to stand in the hallway waiting. Come on. If you don't believe me, come see for yourself. You can see Basta there. He's standing there in the hallway, and he was just in here. Didn't you see him? He was just here. Come and see. Just come. Come on, see for yourself. You don't want to. <laughs> but come, he's standing right there. Come on in. Don't just stand there in the hallway. Basta comes and stands in the doorway. He looks toward the young man. Then he turns and goes out again. The young woman looks at the young man. You saw him, didn't you? Now you've seen him twice. He's the one I've been out with, like you say. We have driven around in his car. Do you understand? The young man just stands there and rocks the baby carriage up and down. She looks toward him. I'm leaving. I can't handle it anymore. Don't just stand there. Say something. I can't handle anymore. I'm leaving now. It's enough now. I can't handle anymore. I'm moving out. The young woman goes out the door to the right, and the young man goes and lies down on the sofa. The baby begins to scream, but just but he just lies there. The young woman and Basta come in. She turns towards Basta. Can you rock him for a minute? Push the carriage around a bit? Basta goes over to the baby carriage, begins to rock it up and down. And after a bit, the baby stops screaming. The young woman goes out the door to the left. The young man sits up on the sofa, looks at Basta, where he stands, rocking the baby carriage up and down. Then Basta realizes that the young man is looking at him, and he looks at the young man. They both look down. The young woman comes in with another bag in hand. I had to pick up some baby clothes. I'm not taking too much now, but I'll come back tomorrow and then I'll get the rest. The young woman goes over to the sideboard, pulls out another drawer, takes out even more baby clothes, looks at them and puts them in the bag. She takes out a small brass dish from the sideboard, remains standing and looks at it for a long time, then puts it on top of the sideboard. I, I'll just take a few things now and I'll have to pick up the rest later. Basta and I... We've known each other for a while, right, Basta? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. A long, 
Long time. A year, maybe? Once at the baby carriage. It seems like you are the father. Anyone can see that. <laughs> the young man gets up, walks out into the center of the room. Are you going to beat me up now? The young man shakes his head. He goes to the window, stands there, and looks out. The young woman goes out the door to the left. It'll be okay. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. It happened a little suddenly for me, too, this year, but... <sighs> Baby begins to scream, and Basta starts rocking the carriage up and down. She said that you threatened her, but... The baby stops crying. The young woman comes in, and she has another bag with her. So this is where I've been living? What do you think? Nice or what? Well, it's not bad at all. <laughs> yeah, I got us this apartment. He um, has never done anything. He writes. Did you know that? So you write. <laughs> and gets rejected all the time. Well, uh, it's not that easy to write and, and, and get it published, mm -hmm. I guess. Just that he thinks it is, that it's so simple. <laughs> but, but he isn't getting anything published. He just keeps writing away and complaining that the baby cries. The young man goes out the door to the left. The young woman throws the bag to the floor and stands looking at Basta. After a while, they walk toward each other, hug each other, stand there holding each other tight, release each other, and go sit down on the sofa. The young man comes in the door, stands in the doorway, looks at them. What time are you going to get your things? Yes, I guess you're going to kill us now. Both of us, him and me. What time are you coming to get your things? You are certainly busy all of a sudden. Can you pick up my things, uh, rent a truck tomorrow? Could you do all that by tomorrow? Yeah, uh, that should work. What time is good for you? Does it matter to you? It'd be best if it could happen pretty fast. I I'm thinking about the crib. We, we need that. Maybe you could get everything tomorrow? Uh, that okay? Yeah. Sure. The young man goes out again to the left. This isn't exactly the best way to do this. This, you know, middle of the night or whatever time it is now. But I couldn't handle it anymore. I couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, but he... Don't worry about him. He'll be okay. Or he won't be. I, I can't handle anymore. It doesn't matter to me. He's taking it pretty calmly. Yeah. Doesn't he care? I don't know. I haven't a clue. I guess he does in a way. I don't know. Shouldn't we get out of here quickly? <laughs> I don't understand why I dared to come up here. I must have must be really in love. Um, I'm crazy at the very least. Me too. <laughs> she kisses him on the cheek. I can't stand being without you. I think about you all the time. I have to be where you are. This is what has to happen. This has to happen. And his parents, they are absolutely dreadful. And, and he's just like them, exactly like them, just as clumsy and helpless. His father just sat there, staring straight ahead, totally confused. Can't we go? Yes. I do love you. And now you and I will be together, right? Yeah. And you must never abandon me. You must never leave me. Yeah, I mean that. You must never leave me. Like you're leaving him. Never, never. I promise I will never abandon you. 
I will always stay with you, always. But let's go. Because if you left me, yeah, I, I don't know what, what I'd do. I won't leave you, never. But you know that I will never leave you, and you must never leave me, either. Well, let's go. We, we, can, we can't stay here any longer. We, we have to go. Pasta gets up. She nods, but remains sitting. He goes and reaches out to her with his arm, but she remains sitting and does not take his hand. I have to pack some more. She gets up, picks up one of the bags and goes over to the sideboard, pulls out a drawer. She takes out a photo album, opens it. Uh, no, this isn't exactly the time to look at pictures. Not now. She slams the photo album shut, puts it in the bag. Hey, all this stuff, we can pick it up later. Why don't you just take the necessary things? We can come back tomorrow or another day and pick up all the other stuff. Okay. She nods. She goes over and takes the brass dish she had put on the sideboard, stands and weighs it in her hand, looks at it. Can't we do that? It's late. She nods. She puts the brass, brass dish in her bag. We can pick up the rest later. Yeah. Just take the necessary things now, okay? So we can get out of here. It's late, and... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, for his sake, yeah, um, you understand. She nods and goes over to the sideboard, pulls out a drawer, takes out a tablecloth, looks at it, puts it back. She looks at the picture of the baby boy on the wall. She takes it down, stands and looks at it, puts it in the bag too, stands and glances around. It's so odd. It's as if the things are pulling at me. Can't we just... Uh, yeah, get out of here. Uh, yeah, we, we don't need to drag this out, can't we? Yeah, but it's so strange to be leaving this way. No, come on. Uh, don't, don't joke. We've lived together a long time, him and I had a child together. Yeah, you understand that? We've got things together. Not so many things, but some... It would probably be simpler if we had a lot of things, not just a few. A few pictures, bowls, tablecloths, just a few very simple things is all we have. That's Come why... Come on. Right now it feels so sad. Everything is so wrong. It's as if I'm about to cry that... No, don't, don't, don't listen to me. I'm, 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 just, I'm just babbling. That brass bowl, though... It's the saddest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, it's true. Everything is so, yeah, I don't know. Don't joke now, okay? You were the one who called. Yeah, I, I, I know that, but, and I know that you and I, belong together yeah there's no doubt about that but he and I he's always been so good to me yeah he has and he has been very good with the baby taking care of him and he was there when I gave birth helped me as much as he could yeah and so do you want me to leave no no don't go I can't handle that. I miss you too much when you're not here. I can't handle that. You cannot leave. Basta goes and sits down on the sofa. The young woman goes and sits in the easy chair. It's just so... Yeah, it's so heavy and sad. Everything is so horrible. It happens so suddenly. Something always happens, you know? You know? That something or other always happens? I don't like it that something happens. I'd rather everything stayed calm and that only the usual things that you're used to would happen. But something unusual always happens, always. She drinks some wine. I don't know what it is that always makes something happen, but it must be something because something always happens. I don't want something to happen, but it happens all the same. 
what is it that makes things happen? Is it me? Something else? I don't know, but can we go? Can we talk later? Yes. You know what I've been thinking about? It's so stupid. I'm thinking about the frying pans out there in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how I'm leaving the frying pans out there in the kitchen. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm totally crazy. Do you or don't you want to leave? You you have to. <laughs> uh, yes, you have to. You and I have to be together. We have to be. Right? Right? Come on. So let's go. The young woman gets up, dries her tears. <laughs> it's so sad. Everything is so sad. Come on. I must be sobering up. Don't joke. We've talked about this so often. Now it's almost here. Now we just have to leave. Come on. Come on. Yeah? Yeah? Come on. She goes around the room, looks at the sideboard. Go she goes over to the baby carriage, looks down at the baby. He's sleeping so sweetly. Have you seen how sweetly he sleeps? Come, see. Basta gets up, goes over to her, looks down at the baby. Yeah, he's sleeping now. Safe and sound. I guess he was restless tonight. He told you that? And now the two of us are moving to live in a new place. And you will be a father in a way. No, I can't do it. I can't. He has always been so good to me. He hasn't figured out what good he can do out there. And he's so helpless. Won't dare to go outside. Days can pass when he won't dare to go outside. He won't even dare to go to the store. And that writing of his is totally hopeless. I'm sure that everything he writes is hopeless. He thinks that's the only thing he can do, is sit inside and write. But of course no one will publish his work. He's not talented enough. He's not good at anything, was miserable in school, flunked at a lot of subjects in high school. We went to high school together. Yeah, you knew that. I've told you that before. I've known him since high school. We've been together since then. At least until now, yeah. He is nice, but he understands little about nothing. <laughs> I was the one who had to organize everything. All alone, he cannot go. It is completely insane. But I can't go. It won't work. But then you can't. What about us? I don't know. I do love you. I'm in love with you. I cannot live without you. That's how I feel. But I don't know if I can leave either. Not now in any case. I don't know. What time should we meet then? I don't know, but we have to meet. Basta goes toward the door. Oh. Yes, now you have to decide. I'm staying. Basta stops, stands, and looks down. I don't know. I miss you already. I can feel that. I can't go either. Not like this anyway. I don't know. Then maybe it's best that we don't see each other anymore. It will be... Uh, too painful. No, don't say that. You must not say that. We have to meet. I do love you. Okay. Come on. Decide. This doesn't work. This is crazy. I mean, <laughs> come on. She stands there and looks down. You're not coming. Okay. I'm going. Then. Can't you come with me? 
Um, she stands there and looks down. Then I'm going. Can't you come with me? Then I guess I should go. Yeah. If he goes along with all this, well, then... I don't know. I'm, go I'm going then. You don't love me. Not enough. Anyway, uh, good to know that. And anyway. That's not true. And you know it. At least I know that now. But... A powerful sound from a rifle is heard. The young woman looks up fearfully at Basta, who is startled. Did he shoot himself? I think he might have shot himself. That, that, that was a gunshot. I heard a, a, sh a shot. I think he shot himself. Hey, hey. He goes and pushes the young woman. She just stands there as if she has lost touch with reality. Hey, hey, you, you have to go see. See if he shot himself. It, it, it was a gunshot. Go. Shout for him at least. You, you, have to, you have to do something. The young woman walks slowly across the room out to the left. Basta stands and looks stiffly after her. She comes back in and nods. He shot himself. She nods again. He shot himself. There is only a little bit of his head left. We have to. The baby begins to cry. He shot himself. I, yeah. Um, <laughs> we have to. I don't really know. I, I, I can go call. Call the police. Uh, doctor, I I'll call. He goes out the door to the right. Don't go. Long pause. Lights down. The baby gradually stops crying. Black. That was great. Thanks, guys. Um, how was the experience of hearing the Norwegian? I'm I'm curious. Like from how how the experience was to hear the Norwegian inside of something. Yeah. Right. Right. It, it's it's. Um, that's yeah. I think we just want to take a very couple, very quick, yeah, move around, do whatever you want. Um, amazing job, actors who are reading, Xavier, David, everyone, Raymond, Diane, thank you. Um, just, the, I think also Anna and I forgot to introduce ourselves when we started. I'm Sarah Cameron Sunda. <laughs> I'm Anna Guto. And you need a mic so how around can hear you. Yeah, yeah. And um, and actually, we just learned that the mics are really hot. So actors, you don't necessarily have to hold them right up to your mouth. So um, the uh, yeah, and that we have some amazing people in the room who were part of that first production. Lauren Halpern is right over here. She designed the set. Um, yes, which is <laughs> which yeah. is what you're seeing over here. And Ra Grand, it was he ran the soundboard, which is oh, amazing. And Paul Walsh was very important for us because in terms of talking about the art of translation and um, getting us to really, as we were thinking about American English translations of the plays, we were in lots of conversations. So um, key people in the room. Mm. So tell us about how did, it, how did you feel about restaging it in this way, this play? <laughs> well, it wasn't really restaging. We're just hearing it. You know, there's something so amazing to me about how you can just, if you just like slow down and hear things out loud, it resonates, you know? Um, that was, I think, my big discovery. Mm. And it was just fun to see you. This was fun to see you, this old video that I've never watched ever mm -hmm. um, with you now. It's mm -hmm. fun. 
Yeah. What about you? Cause you're like, you're in a very different place in your life now than you were 20 years ago when we did it. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting to revisit a role 20 years later, because since then I've had kids myself, I have kids now, which, uh, which really changes the relationship to the character because I know how hard it is and I know how difficult relationships can be in that, especially that first year of having babies and how challenging it can be. So, so that's, uh, so that really informs, like, I, I feel like there was so much I didn't understand back then when we did it. Yeah. Things that I just completely went straight over my head. But you saw other things in it, as they say, a book, not you just read the book, the book also reads you, you know, yeah. over time, that's why we have to reread the things. Just want to point out, there's a big tradition of performing in front of screens. It was called the Japanese reading after World War II in Japan. It was a big demand for American films, but there were no translations available. So actors would wow. be in front of the screen, the original like sound ADR, down, live ADR. and they would do live uh, reading. And people actually uh, loved it. Mm. Um, would you do it differently, the show today? Would you have new ideas looking at it? Um, oh, yeah, definitely. Um, what comes to but it's, but it's actually interesting. I'm I'm more interested in people taking this translation and doing this play themselves. I think, like, uh, the, the one play that we'll do today that I feel like I want to do again uh, here is Dream, Dream of Autumn, because I haven't done that one in New York yet. Um, and I think I think other people should do this one. This was your first play, the first translation you did? This is the first translation. Tell us a bit how complicated, how easy was it? Well, it was hard, um, but I had many amazing support people. Um, the, you know, and just to give a little story, there's a few articles that are out there about now about this translation thing, but um, I, I didn't actually intend to translate the play when I started working on it. I, I was, I had been in Norway saw a, a, a first read um a play winter and then saw the production at national theater that night and was like who is this guy this is amazing writing i've never read anything like this before i've never seen anything like this before it was just such a false's voice was it was so unique and i was so moved by it and so i was like i need to bring him to new york he's been translated into over 40 languages and produced all over the world but not in the u.s like that's so weird no, no performance have taken place nothing it was so strange mm. and so and i was like i speak norwegian i can do this and so i ended up getting in touch with him getting the rights met anna at the consulate thank you norwegian consulate um we were there one day and we and i was like i'm doing this she's like i want to do that too and we yeah we because we teamed up we had both been wanting to do um to do to, to stage his place in new york and to make that happen so then meeting each other, then we could join forces to actually make it happen pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. So we made it happen really fast. And um, and then and what happened in terms of the translation was that um I was in conversation with Yoon about the translation and or, or because I had initially like been thinking I would just do the published version, which was a British translation. And I was like, oh, I'll just change a few idioms to from British into American English. And and then as I started looking at it, I was like, uh-oh, this isn't quite working. And Yoon sent me a translation, a two other attempts at American English translations. And one was like too American and one was too sort of literal foreign sounding. And I went back to the Norwegian. I was like, none of them are doing exactly what is happening in with the Ninosk mm. and and I, and especially I had this big realization about class like we as Americans we just accept British writing all the time but actually when you're hearing the the idioms and the the syntax of the sentences is very um it's very specific and culture and humor lies underneath the text right so if you if you it, it's like crazy actually that we think we can just like take a play written in another language, put it through this British filter and expect it to move our bodies and move mm -hmm. through the actors and come out and touch our ears and hear it and feel it in the way mm. that it's intended when we're putting it through a whole nother culture's humor and cultural mm -hmm. understanding. It's like crazy. So then, yeah. So then with the help of Marie Louise Miller, who will be here later, Paul, Anna, my dad, <laughs> We sort of all just teamed up and did a lot of work to make this translation really um, 
hopefully it's sing, do justice. For very good reminder how significant translations really are. Often translated are not even mentioned. Mm. Meanwhile, the choice of translation is like a choice of stage design, choice of costumes, mm. choice of casting. It's so significant and different. And many people argue every 10 years, every great play should be retranslated. Anyway, so you also created the translation think tank. We hosted it here. It was a, we should actually get back to that. We I should think. get back to that. Uh, after Corona time. Uh, maybe one or two comments or marks from the audience, then we should mm -hmm. move on. Yeah, and I, I just want to say, because translation really is adaptation. You can't do a translation without it being a, a certain level of adaptation. And that's why it's so important mm -hmm. to have it culturally specific. There's definitely things I noticed actually in hearing the text this time that I was like, oh, if yeah. there's a production, I will update. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. It's so interesting how time changes. And that's changes, kind of an yeah. amazing thing about mm -hmm. translation is you can keep fussing with it. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah. And in a way, a director also translates the work on stage and then the actor mm -hmm. translates once again. And then the audience member hears it once again. You know, we just hear the word tree and everybody will think. A different thing in as, as someone said even the word understanding has so many meanings right for everybody but um one or two uh, uh remarks i will come with the mic because how round have it something about the reading or a question only if easy if you have or any of the people who saw the original production i'm curious what this was like for you thank you sarah i thought it was really interesting just to hear this again 21, 20 years later. 20 years. Um, because I think my own ear has attuned to this kind of dramatic uh, text, but mm. more so. And you know, I see now, I see I'll say in the in a a long line of of contemporaries uh, um, in English from from you know Pinter and and um, and, and Beckett to um, I've, I've been working on this play by uh, Stieg Dagerman a Swedish playwright from the 1940s who also has that same kind of quality of the um, the, the completely um, opaque, concrete language that is also so so versatile and so, so um, malleable. To hear it now with uh, older actors also was, was a revelation, a revelation. Older actors who are still, still have contact with that, with the youthfulness of these characters. So it was, in those sense, I, it was... Um, a wonderful way to start to start a Monday. Thank you. Great. <laughs> After trade ride. One more comment, or yeah, yep. Yeah. Hi, I, th I thought it was terrific. I, I was really delighted to be introduced to this voice that I didn't know in the theater. Anna, I'm wondering, twenty years later, what did you learn about the character? Did your understanding of her change? Uh, because our understanding of her keeps shifting. Mm. in the process of listening to mm. it. Uh, and I'm I'm wondering what you found out about her psychology. And I'd also like to ask what the uh, what the actor Yeah, now was... now he actually just went oh. to eat lunch. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just sent him to eat lunch. But 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 how 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 did revisiting the character mm. uh not just that you have changed, mm. but what did you learn about her? Well, I mean, one of the things that surprised me as I was reading, because as you know, as we said initially, we've had no rehearsal for this. And obviously, because Sarah and I are sort of conceptualizing, directing this entire event together, I've had a few other things to do this week, <laughs> other than sitting with this text. So it's not like I had time to really go through and beat out everything from an actor's perspective. So, uh, so, so I was still... Uh, experiencing things as I was reading it. And and one of the things that I wanted to really embrace are exactly what you're saying, how, how the shifts, it shifts, and you don't know. You don't know what really the truth is. In, in terms of, has she slept with Buster before? How much of it is a lie or truth? How desperate, it, you know, what makes her de her desperation make her lie, but in which direction? And so, so it's very interesting what, what you're saying. I mean, that was my experience too, is that I felt the shifts much greater now. I don't, I, I, I don't even think she knows the truth. And, and I think that's part of what is so strong in Jun Foss's work is that there's always this, uh, it, it dares to live in the uncertainty all the time. And uh, Sarah has this wonderful thing she often says to the actors of how, you know, go with one choice and play that, but also play the other choice. 
Play, yeah, play the opposite. Something like that. Play yeah. the extreme. We should stop. Yeah. yeah. To be continued. To be continued. Yes. Thank you. Everyone take a break and we hope you'll stick around. Join us for the next one. When will it start? It's well, maybe we should give ourselves. Let's do at least 15 minutes. 15. But yeah. there it was supposed so to be. Let's say one o'clock in, in 10 minutes, one o'clock. One o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. yeah. Let's do one. And okay. there is some snacks, I think, over there. Stephen, right? Is there some food? Yeah. yeah. There is some snacks. People can bite.
Are all the mics on? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we actually what we want on, so I'm going to get a little mic off if I get here. You want to turn them on when you talk? Do you have my ancient daughter? What are you going to do? That's the trick. We're pretty well with the face out of the Got it. Just a simple neuro Am I supposed to be here? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. that here. worked out well. This is so I'm going to move the... you a tiny bit right there. Okay. 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 Yep. Yeah. I am. The mics, the mics are real hot, so you don't have to worry about being right One of them is Right now, then I don't think you have to pick you up for sure. Okay. Sister. Are you in my sister? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm not sure how close how close do they have to be. They don't have to be close to cool. make it off. Right. Yeah. Because it's pretty the mics are very live. Okay. Yeah. Very live. Okay, we're still waiting on a couple actors. And then do hey Sarah. Yeah. Who's reading the stage first? Yeah. Oh, it's nice. I, it's turn it on. Testing, testing. Yeah. yeah. Testing, testing. Yeah. You're good. Yeah. Good if you're good. Does it seem fine, Paul? Like, I like the exam. A little closer, him. Oh. oh. Like this? You're good. That's why. Gotcha. Oh, you so you okay. he wants this low. Oh, okay, okay. There's a oh, there's I see, a I see. Is this good? Mm -hmm. Okay. There. Yeah, should we do this one? Yeah, I think that's our first. So episode. what's the... <laughs> so that's after the... Yeah, that's after the oldest daughter has arrived, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Or has she been there before? Mm -hmm. The oldest daughter comes in. Okay, so after the oldest daughter... And then I'm sure this will be red. Yeah, that's it has to be red. Yes. Oh, we'll oh, yeah, yeah. here. And then we'll follow here. And then... Genius. Hey. <laughs> Frank, I want one too now. You came with Sal. Did you drive this way now? No, he's been in the back. 20 minutes after I tested him. I'm going on stage. At least I went to the left. Well, that's our whole one, right? I didn't see. But I was just going to be on one. I'm not a good show. Let's see what I do. Raymond, one of the band. 
We said there was one here. I had one from the last reading. See if that one's been open. And then I, I can't, we do have some downtime. So, yeah, so we don't want to like just hover. Like, well, they lifted up. So, the announcement they made at the beginning of the first reading was here. Where yeah. will you give it a little bit of we feel like introduction? Yeah. I'm just going to stand and stare at them the whole time. Hey, gonna, I'm going to just walk amongst them. <laughs> you, grab you said do what you want to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can't really see. Can you see? Hmm? My, Can you see? Are you not in the light? Maybe I should get my glasses. Yeah. Oh, sure. I'm older since the last time we did this. Okay. All right. Are you ready? Yeah, I feel like Are you are you now this? I am that. I'm that nice. Okay. Every, ooh. All right, That's everyone. It. Are you ready? We're moving on to play number two. Um okay. So Sakala was the third production that we did in 2008. We have some original cast members here. Still alive. Just, <laughs> well, I oh. mean it like wait. Oh my God. Some some of them are still with us. Actually, we did want to dedicate this reading to Catherine Cates, who is who played the mother in the original production. She is um, she passed away a couple years ago and we love her dearly and she was amazing. Um, but we still have, um, many of us are still with us. I was making fun of our age. God. <laughs> we know what you meant, Raymond. It's okay. We got it. Um, so, so we have Raymond and Frank who are, um, playing their re re imagining their original roles of Henning and Johannes. We have Trina who on a, uh, was Trina in Sakala. And we have Birgit, who was the, is the oldest daughter, um, reprising their roles for this reading. Um, and then we have Deb, who's playing the younger daughter. We have Lizanne, who is the mom. And we have Xavier, who is Karsten. And we have David, who is the brother. Did I get every... And, and very importantly... We have, um, this is one of our experiments for this one is that um, Mary Emra, who is an incredible journalist, author, and runner of literary academic things at Wesleyan University and The New Yorker, um, she's a, an amazing, she's written an amazing article on FOSA, so she's, she loves FOSA. You'll hear from her later. She's going to, she's going to run our panel later on, but she, we were like telling her about how one of the experiments for today is to have um, anyone can step into a fossil play and read it. So later, we're going to encourage you to check out the participatory fossil booth in the back here when there's a break. And we have live actors who will read a fossil scene with anyone who wants to. Um, and Mary is, has generously offered to read a role in one of these actual readings or the kind of readings for the public. <laughs> You don't no need to be sorry. Um, so that that's part of the experiment of this is what happens when you put when when real people try to read uh, read read the the fossil play. How what happens? And that's fun, right? Um, okay. And the other experiment is this is our first time playing with live feed here. So we have two cameras that will be capturing um, mostly what's happening in the hospital because in this play we have. Two places, two spaces in one, right? So this is the hospital area. And then on the outs outskirts around, that is the party. Um, or the, yeah, the party. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. The, the live feed cameras are going to focus on the hospital. You'll see that. I think that is maybe all we needed to say. Did we have anything else we need to say? There's something. The, the table in the middle is the cake. Yes. The birthday cake. For the party, for the party, imagine that there's a, a a birthday cake that the party is focused on, that happens to be the hospital on top of that birthday cake. Make sense? We'll sort of. Um, the other thing, just to for the, all the actors, you guys are amazing. It is such a thrill to hear you attack these words again. Um, with your microphones, you don't actually need to be super close to them. They're super hot. So um, you can just know that you you have some space there with them. 
Gretchen, do you have something else you want me to say? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you guys know how to work microphones, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, make sure they're on. And if you're not in the scene, feel free to turn them off to save battery. Okay, I think that's it. Let's do it. Is this as light as it gets? I'm just double checking. Because I'm not as young as I was when we first did this. <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> well, I can see fine now, but I I know it felt dark over there. That's all good. It's all about the mood. Do you want a flash? Uh, no. Is it too? It's good. Yeah. Is it also because of? I'm actually no. It's Jesus. Spotlight. Oh, that's you good. This is what I was born for. Get out, guys. Get out. Yeah, I mean, does it help to pull you forward or something? No, we're good. We're good. Um, yeah. I don't want to take up that much time. We can go now. We can do it. Oh, you don't want. You don't want to take up that much time. Oh no, not that much more. <laughs> To the left, a window, a sofa. To the right, a window. Henning comes in. We married sisters, you and I. <clears throat> that's what happened. Johannes comes in. Yeah, yeah, that's what happened. I, Henning, took Hildy. And I, Johannes, took Nora. And when you marry the daughter, yeah, well, mom comes too. So both of us are married uh, to mom. And clearly, yeah, clearly you attend the party when mom turns 60. And the big day, yeah, today's the day. Because today, she, the great, the grand, the incomparable, turns 60. And that should be celebrated. It must be celebrated. Of course, it will be celebrated. At the very least. But uh, there'll just be a few of us. There isn't really enough space. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. No, obviously not. It'll be the uh, immediate family, as they say. Yeah. And then, of course, she is coming. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> She's coming, yeah. Trina. <clears throat> but unfortunately, apparently, she's bringing her husband. She has a husband. Yeah. And he's coming with her. Trina. Yeah. She and mom are such good friends. And they're so alike. Well, maybe that's why they get along so well. Yeah, definitely. Apparently, his name is Karsten. Trina's husband? Yeah. She's quite a lady, that Trina. Yeah. In oh, so many ways. Trina. Yeah. I've been there. <laughs> you have? Yeah. You sure? <laughs> Pretty damn sure. And it wasn't half bad. You've been there? Yeah. Long time ago. Not too long. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> you too. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I've... I've um... Been there many times. But a long, a long time ago. I wouldn't say that. I wonder what Trini's husband is like. <laughs> Me too. You never met him? No. No, obviously not. <laughs> By the way, yeah, it's, it's it's nice that you and Hildy are throwing the party. And Hildy felt like, yeah, like we should do it. Yeah, we could have done it. Instead, it's okay that we're doing it, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> Mom didn't really seem to want to throw her own party, but she probably would have. <laughs> yeah, if, if no one else had done it. I mean, it's not like she's the type to not throw any party at all to celebrate her life quietly or whatever you'd say. 
Yeah, quiet isn't her forte. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. She is nice, though. Sure she is. Very nice. She only wants what's best. It's like she wants everything to be okay. And she is kind. Yeah. As the day is long, she is kind. She is. Well, she did welcome me into the family. Me too. She's generous in her own way. Generous and kind, yeah. She is. And you, yeah, you're, you're doing okay. Oh, yeah, thanks. And you? Oh, yeah, thanks. Pretty much the same, yeah. And then goes over to the window, looks out, then looks at Johannes. Yeah, that's how we met. Yeah. We married sisters, you the youngest and I the oldest. That's what happened. Yeah. Johannes walks over to the window, stands next to Henning and looks out. What a beautiful day. Hmm. It was a beautiful day, the day she turned 60. That's good. Because we do love her, don't we? We do. Of course. And they'll be here soon. Oh, I'm sure they will. Henning goes and sits on the sofa, and the nurse and the youngest daughter roll a hospital bed on stage, place it to their right. Yeah, this is the room, yeah? Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I, I don't think I told you yeah, that it's her 60th birthday today. No. No, you didn't tell me that. She turned 60 today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she and she and I, yeah, I was supposed to pick her up. We the immediate family were supposed to celebrate her birthday. And when yeah, when I got there, yeah, I found her on the floor in the bathroom. She lay there. Yeah, you told me that. And I'm thinking, yeah, how long could she have been lying there? Well, the doctor thought, yeah, that she hadn't been lying there all that long. That that's what he said. That's what he's I'm sure she hadn't. But that nothing can be done. Sometimes that's how it is. Yeah, there's too much damage, and yeah, like the doctor said, yeah, it's a severe stroke. But it's so awful, yeah, that nothing can be done. Yeah. The youngest daughter sits down on the edge of the bed, strokes mom's hair. The nurse also goes to the bed. Henning stands up. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be here any minute, yeah. Henning walks towards Johannes. Johannes walks away from the window. Yeah. It might be fun. Think so? Maybe. So maybe it's not exactly the kind of party one looks forward to. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, you fall in love. How stupid, right? <laughs> and then there you are with your wife and your mother-in-law and whatever else comes with it. Mm. Yeah. Including your sister-in-law's childhood friend and... Trina. She was Hilda's friend. Was. Yeah. But it could be worse for us. Or it could be better. Sure it could. But I'm fine. I am. Yeah, I'm happy, man. Yeah, me too. But you two haven't had kids either. We're thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I'm fine, too. It's not that. We are, I think, yeah, as good as one can expect. But they really should be here soon. Yeah. Yeah, imagine that. Mom turned 60 today. Yeah, yeah, she is like a, a mom to all of us, isn't she? She is generous. Caring, as they say. And today, 
She turns 60. She'll be here soon. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be here soon. And mom, she, I bet she'll be the first. You'll see. This is her day, you know? She, her big day. And when she gets here, yeah. Stand up straight. Stick out your chest. And when she walks through the door, she'll hold one arm out. Henning sticks out his chest, lifts up his head to look important, walks, swaying his hips, holding his little finger out. He imitates. No. Is that really you? <laughs> it's so great to see you. This is so great. So nice. So cozy. So good. So fantastic. So fucking fantastic. <laughs> and so outstanding and so grand. <laughs> because everything is so fantastic. Everything is so incredible. It is so extremely outstanding. And I am the most outstanding of all. Because I have the biggest <laughs> And today is my 60th birthday. Imagine me, one so grand, so young, so youthful, so yeah, put it to put it bluntly, yeah, so attractive. And I am 60 years old. Imagine that. And that Trina, she's just divine. I'll go there. One is young and, and divine, the other is old and divine. Don't say that to mom. Yeah, about her being old. That stuff about being divine, on the other hand. No, of course not. No. Yeah, I guess it's not that easy for mom either. She really just wants to be grand and yeah. And and she's alone a lot of the time. Yeah, that's how it is. I think she sometimes gets together with uh yeah, with uh Trina and they go out to cafes and stuff. Henning starts across the floor. Hey you. Yeah. <laughs> Henning walks over to the window, looks out, and Johannes walks over and stands next to him. Pause. The nurse steps out a bit into the room. Yeah. I actually have to go, you know. Yeah, there's a lot to do. But I'll come back. I'll check check back in, yeah, in a bit. Well, what, what should I do? You should just stay here with her. Isn't there anything I can do? Just stay here. And, yeah, you've already called your sister and your brother. Uh, yeah, I called my sister, yeah, and, yeah, she's supposed to call our brother. And they're coming? Yeah. Yeah, my sister is coming at least. That's good. Yeah, I'll check back in again in a bit then. And if you need anything, yeah, don't hesitate to call for me, yeah? The nurse goes out. The youngest daughter strokes mom's hair again. Mom, can't you say something to me? Don't just lie there. Say something to me, my love. Don't just lie there. The youngest sister takes mom's hands. Mom. Don't just lie there. Can't you say something? How you're doing, say something. Henning starts walking around. Please. Mom. Mom, say something, please. Mom, can't you, Mom? Don't just lie there, Mom. Sweet Mom, sweetie. Uh, um, uh, Mom. Is there anything I can do for you, my kind, lovely mom? Yeah, they'll be here soon, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Nora was supposed to pick up, yeah, the birthday girl, right? Johannes also starts to walk around. Yeah. Well, he's supposed to come as soon as she's done at work. And then, of course, he's coming. Yeah, him. The brother, Ola. Right, he's coming. Of course he's coming. And we have to spend time with him, too. No escaping it. Yeah, that might be the worst part. Spending time with him, the hopeless one, brother, yeah? Yeah, the brother. Yeah. I don't go there. 
He doesn't exactly make himself useful. <laughs> no, can't argue with that. But we have to live with him, too. You marry the daughter and the mother. The mom, yeah. And the brother. Yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> I mean, but now they have to get here so we can get the party over with, be done with all this. With the brother. Ola. And with the mom. Yeah, yeah. But she is nice, mom. Kind. Yeah. I think, you know, that Hildy feels bad that she doesn't visit her often enough, you know? But she's got a lot to do. Work and everything, somewhat. And if they don't get along, yeah, well, then they just don't. Maybe that's how it was. Yeah, maybe Hildy's stuck with the father and your Nora stuck with mom growing up. Maybe that's how it was. It's often like that. Henning looks at the clock. <clears throat> but now they should be here. Johannes also looks at the clock. Yeah, the time has come. Yeah. You sure... You sure he's coming? Yeah, the brother? Apparently he said he was he coming, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's a character. Character. <laughs> is one way of putting it. Oh. Uh. I'm sure they'll be here any minute, yeah. They should have been here by now, yeah. But why aren't they here? Good question. Yeah, Nora's supposed to pick up mom... And then come straight here. Yep. And Hildy was supposed to come as soon as she was done at work, yeah? She should have been here by now. She's never this late. Neither is Nora. Yeah, according to what she said. It's strange that no one's here. Yeah. But we can't really do anything but wait. We could go outside. Maybe. The weather's nice. We could. Get some air, yeah? Yeah, let's go outside. Let's do that. Ah. 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 Yeah, let's go. Henning and Johannes start to leave. Henning and Johannes walk out. Are you getting worse? How are you, Mom? Mom! The youngest daughter puts her hands on Mom's forehead. Mom! 
Mom twists a bit. Don't be afraid, Mom. I'm here. I'll take care of you. I will. And soon, yeah, they're coming. Hilda's coming and, and, and Ola, right? Mom, I don't want you to be in pain. Is there anything I can do for you? Don't be scared, sweet mom. I'm here. I'll take care of you. The youngest daughter strokes mom's hair, strokes and strokes, and mom closes her eyes. Pause. The youngest daughter stands up, goes over to the window, stands there, and looks out. Pause. The nurse comes in. She has a bowl with water and a sponge. How's it going? I don't know. It's the same. Is she sleeping? I don't know. She's making some noises sometimes, but yeah, she's not saying anything. No. What should I do? Just stay here. Is she in pain? I don't think she's aware. She probably can't feel anything. But... Yeah, if her mouth gets too dry. Yeah, well, she can't really drink, but here you go. Yeah, I've brought some cold water and a sponge. And it'd be good if you could moisten her lips. With this sponge? Yeah. The nurse and the youngest daughter go over to the bed, and the nurse hands the bowl and sponge to the youngest daughter. Her lips seem dry, yeah. The youngest daughter wets the sponge, puts them to mom's lips, moistens her lips. And she turns 60 today. Yeah. Yeah, we were supposed to celebrate her 60th birthday. I was supposed to pick her up. And yeah, I guess I told you that. The youngest daughter moistens mom's lips again. Do you think that's enough? Sure. You don't think, yeah, that she was lying there for a long time? No. No, I don't. Don't think about it. And the doctor didn't think so either, right? And what if I hadn't? Don't think about it. I'm sure your sister will be here soon. Yeah, yeah, she's coming. That's good. <clears throat> There's nothing they can do? No, it was a severe stroke. There's so much damage that it wouldn't be much of a life. Yeah, the doctor said, yeah, that it'll have to take its course. He thought that I actually have to move on. <clears throat> the nurse goes out. And the youngest daughter again wets the sponge and puts it to mom's lips, moistens them. Mom opens her eyes suddenly. Oh. What is it? What is it, mom? Don't be scared. Hey, Mom, I'm here. And Hilda's coming soon. And Ola will be here with you. We will. So don't be scared, my sweet mom. Mom tries without opening her eyes to sit up in the bed, but she lies down again. Mom, what is it that do you need? What do you, what do you need to, Mom? Mom, to say it. Oh. <laughs> oh, but Mom, what is it, Mom? Mom, it's me, right? Nora. Mom, you do recognize me. Nora? Mom, it's Nora. And you recognize me, right? Sweet mom, you, sweet, sweet mom. Uh, uh, 
mom. Mom. The youngest daughter sits down on the edge of the bed. Mom, you and I, you know, always you and I. You and I, you and I, mom, always that. You and I, you, mom, sweetie, always you and I. You and I, always you and I. Oh. 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 Nora. The youngest daughter looks up, slowly looks at the oldest daughter, who stops. Pause. The oldest daughter then goes toward the youngest daughter, who doesn't look at her. This is so awful. And today, oh. exactly today, on her 60th <clears throat> birthday, today of all days. <clears throat> and so suddenly, so completely unexpected, yeah? It's, it made me feel sick, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> and I came as fast as I could. Yeah, get out of there. Yeah, and you called Aura. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. The oldest daughter goes over to the bed. And he's coming. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's just so awful. Yeah. Poor mom. Poor, poor mom. She lay on the floor. <clears throat> yeah. In the bathroom. You know, I... We really haven't always gotten along. Not always. Well, actually, but... And you. Yeah, you actually spoke to her on the phone every day. Right? I did. And so yeah, she lay there, just lay there on the floor. Yeah. In the bathroom, they're on the floor. The youngest daughter stands up, crosses the floor. She didn't answer the door. No. And I got scared, of course. So I let myself in. And then I knew as soon as I came inside, I knew it. Yeah. And then you, you called the. Yeah. And then, yeah, they, they came pretty fast. The doctor, the ambulance. Yeah. Yeah, we were supposed to drive to your place, yeah? And then, yeah, instead we drove here, yeah, in an ambulance. It's so awful. Yeah, so awful. And I've planned a party for, and now, this can't be happening. No, and they, yeah, Henning and Johannes. Yeah, you did call Johannes. I couldn't find his number, but yeah, yeah, I called Henning, but he didn't pick up. There was no answer. No answer. Henning didn't answer, but I left a message mm -hmm. and told him to call Johannes. Yeah. But Johannes. I told Henning to call him. So Johannes doesn't know. I don't know. Yeah, if Henning got the message, I had to come here, you know? But, yeah, well, I told Henning to call him. Yeah. They, Johannes was supposed to go to your place, yeah, after work. And there's nothing they can do. They're saying it will just take its course. Nothing? But when you found her, yeah. Yeah, she just lay there. She didn't say anything? Yeah, it's really awful. She just lay there. Maybe she... And I don't know how long she was lying there. I don't. No, of course not. I and mean, the doctor couldn't say, but not that long. For a while. For a little while anyway, yeah, of course. It's so awful.
But not that long. No. I'm sure it wasn't that long. An hour, maybe? No, no I don't, don't think so. And Johannes doesn't know yet. I don't know. I cannot really. But Johannes has to come. You know, I did. Johannes has to come. I'm sure he's coming. Yeah, if only he, yeah. The oldest daughter hugs the youngest daughter. She stays standing there, holding her tight. Karsten and the friend come in, a little hesitant. Yeah, this is nice. This place is ready for a party. That's clear. But I, uh, yeah, I don't know. really belong here. It's like, I, I don't really know anyone at all yet. Well, the mom. I, I met her that one time in passing. That, that's all. But you know me. Yeah, yeah, but... Still, I've never, ever met. Who do you mean? Yeah, uh, her. The, the the one you were friends with, yeah, uh, growing up. Hilda? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hilda. Of course you have to be here. Of course you have to be here. When you were little, you were always together, but not so much later on. Nope. Did you have a falling out? No, not exactly. Maybe. But you and the mother, mom, as you call her, you, you two became even better friends. Yeah. Kind of strange, I guess. And today, as she celebrates her 60th birthday, you are the only one who comes, yeah, besides family, that, that is. I guess. And then there's me, of course, uh, someone who doesn't belong here. <laughs> And they made it pretty clear. Yeah, the son-in-law, what the hell is he doing here? They said without a word. Now you've met them at least. <laughs> yeah. And they sent us in here. So they could get out of being with us. It does seem like that. No. What am I doing here, really? You can't go. Why not? No, don't go. Why did you come? Why did you become such good friends? Yeah, you you and, and that mom. I don't know. You are kind of alike. You think so? Yeah. Carson goes over to the window, looks out. The way mom, as you call her, is 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 an older person or whatever you'd say, that's that's what you like to be. Thank you very much. Or the friend also goes over to the window. Anyway, it's a nice day. Very nice. The oldest daughter lets go of the youngest daughter and walks over to the bed. I don't understand it. And so suddenly, totally unexpected, she was, you know. Yeah, I talked to her yesterday and she was really looking forward to today, to the party. Yeah, she was really looking forward to it. She said she'd have to come to terms with turning 60. It would be okay. She could accept it if she got this party in exchange, she said. <laughs> she was like a kid. There wasn't anything. Yeah, nothing was the matter, was there? Yeah, except, yeah, well, there was always something. There was something or other. Yeah. But nothing specific. Yeah, just, yeah, the usual things, I think. Nothing specific that I know of. No, it's so awful. I don't understand it. And there's nothing they can do, but, yeah, should we just accept that? There must be something they can do. Yeah, the doctors. We can't just... But is she speaking? I mean, yeah, is she saying anything? Yeah. No? The youngest daughter goes and takes the oldest daughter by the hand. They walk away from the bed as far as possible. The friend goes and sits down on the sofa. Maybe. Yeah, I think, yeah, maybe she can hear. So the nurse said that she couldn't, but... 
She's not speaking. She is speaking or yeah, some sounds, but yeah, it's incoherent, meaningless. She's just saying, yeah, things. Just saying things. Uh, But she can hear. Maybe she can. Yeah. Yeah. She's making sounds, kind of, but they don't mean anything. They're just sounds. She can't speak. She just says, ah, eh, like that. And they can't do anything. The doctor said, yeah, that she's so severely yet damaged that nothing could be done. He thought it was best to just let it take its course. That's what he said. He said that? Take its course? Yep. But, yeah, should we just accept that? We can't, can we? What else can we do? Well, that's true. Yeah. (laughs) She's sleeping. Yeah, it looks like it. She must be sleeping. And yeah, it's good that she's sleeping because if... Yeah, I'm thinking, I don't know how much she's taking in. Yeah, if she can hear. Yeah, you said she could. Yeah, but. Yeah, if she can understand. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, if she's scared. If she's aware. Yeah. We, she and I, you know, we, we're together. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure of that much. I can see it in her eyes. Yeah. When her eyes are open. Yeah. Yeah, Sometimes, anyway. We speak. Yeah, in a way, I know that, yeah. But I guess she's sleeping now. Yeah. The youngest daughter goes over to the window, stands there, and looks out. The oldest daughter sits down on the edge of the bed. But hey, what took you so long? You had to get here? So long? Yeah. I came as fast as I could. But it took so long. Yeah. And you haven't gotten the message uh, to Johannes. I tried to call Henning. Yeah, like I said, but he didn't answer. I left a message asking him to call Johannes. But you got a hold of Ola. Yeah, and he's supposed to come. Yeah, right away. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sweet mom, don't be scared. Yeah, you. Yes, sweetie. Henning comes in. Sweetie. Sweet mom. Don't be scared. You just rest. Now you'll get to rest. Don't be scared. Now you'll get to rest. The oldest daughter takes mom's hands, stays sitting, and holds them in her lap. Yeah, here you are, waiting. I guess we are. They should have been here a long time ago. Yeah. I don't understand why they're so late. No. They'll be here soon. Henning sits down on the sofa. Yeah. Mm. I don't understand. Henning puts his arm on the back of the sofa, and the friend looks down. Johannes comes in. There's nothing we can do. Yeah, but wait. No? Yeah, just think that mom is 60 years old. It's unbelievable. No. (laughs) She takes care of herself. She doesn't look like she's 60. No way. No. She seems so young, Mom. Good that you two are here, at least. And I just don't understand what they are up to. (laughs) Maybe it's the brother. Hola. Yeah, you... Yeah, you know him. 
Like maybe he's planned a surprise for mom with some sort of trip or something. Yeah, it's strange. That might be it. Yeah, that he's planned something or other. Another one of his plans. Yeah. <laughs> they could have at least called. But that must be the point that we're supposed to call them. Call and ask where they are. I'm sure that's part of the plan, too. And they'll be hiding behind a fence or something. <laughs> or in the closet in the attic. <laughs> no, I just don't understand. If they'd been, yeah, coming in the same car, I'd be scared there'd been an accident or something. Yeah, it's strange. They'll be here soon. But they could have called. Must have been a plan. Must be a plan to do something or other. Yeah. Yeah. Something or other. Yeah. Henning takes his arm back off the sofa. Pause. So here we are. Should we call? Uh, that must be what they want us to do. Yeah, to call them. We could call, couldn't we? I mean, it can't hurt to call. Anything is possible. I just don't know. But what I do know is that I will find something to drink. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. Henning goes out. Carson looks out the window. Johannes goes and sits down next to the friend. Pause. Mom, you have to answer me. Please. Say something to me. Don't just lie there. Say something to me. Ola, do you know when he's coming? No, but I'm sure he will come as fast as he can. That's what he said. Sure. Of course he will. Mm, yeah. And Ola will be here soon. Everyone's coming. Everyone's coming to see you. Henning and Johannes, Ola's coming. He'll be here soon, right? If only Johannes would get here. The oldest daughter puts down mom's hands, stands up. But, yeah. Ola, what did Ola say? Yeah, when you called. No. Yeah, well, I guess he asked what it was, how it happened, who had found her, if there was anything that could be done. And then he said he'd come. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Mom? Yeah. Mom? Oh, Mom. The youngest daughter goes over to the bed. Isn't there anything we can... Yeah, but... Yeah, she's just lying there, so... We just have to stay here. Yeah. I think she fell asleep. Yeah. Yeah, I guess she's asleep. That's good. Yeah. But yeah, she's so peaceful lying there. So, and so lovely. She is you, beautiful, isn't she? <clears throat> and now she's sleeping, sleeping soundly, tucked in her bed like a little kid. She lies there sleeping. She's breathing, isn't she? Take her pulse. The youngest daughter stays standing there. You don't want to? No, I'll do it myself then. Yes, but yeah. You think it's gross? No, but. The oldest daughter takes mom's hands and mom opens her eyes. But mom, I'm here now. Hildy is here. And Nora is here. I just got here just now. Do you recognize me? I'm here. Mama, can you hear? I am here. Can you hear, Mom? Can you hear me? She's not hearing me. Do you think she can hear? Of course she can hear. Mom, now, you're both 
Hilda and I are here, Mom. I am here. It's me, Hilda. I'm here, Mom. I am here, right, Mom. And Ola's coming soon. And everybody else is coming. Henning's coming and Johannes. Everyone will be with you. Everyone's coming. We are with you. We'll take care of you. We'll be here with you. We will. We'll take care of you. Don't be scared, okay? Mom closes her eyes, and the youngest daughter goes and stands in front of the window. The oldest daughter gets up, stands next to the bed, and looks down. Pause. Henning comes in with a bottle and four glasses. Here we are. Yeah, it's about time, but finally. Henning hands a glass to Johannes and pours. Then he pours another glass, hands it to the friend. Thank you. Henning pours again and hands a glass to Karsten. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's toast. A toast to the birthday girl. To our extremely dearly beloved mom. Everyone lifts their glasses, drinks. Short pause. Henning shoots his chest forward, wobbles a bit, spreads out his little finger, imitates. Thank you. Thank you all very much. <laughs> and you have organized, yes, yeah, such a gorgeous party. <laughs> gorgeous, divine, yeah, it's truly incredible. Yeah. <laughs> A, a toast, a toast, a toast to mom. <laughs> Johannes and the friend toast together, drink, pause. <clears throat> yeah, but where are they? I don't understand. No, me neither. Maybe we should call. Yeah, we should. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes out, taking his glass with him. Johannes stretches his arm along the back of the sofa. Carson looks out the window again, pause. Let's hope Ola gets here soon. And Johannes. Ola and Mom, they have never really gotten along. They've always argued about everything. And now he'll regret it. But he he's not even coming, is he? He doesn't care. He never cared. It's He's coming. Of course he's coming. And of course he cares. Sometimes they didn't speak to each other for long stretches at a time. Once it went on for years. And he didn't say anything when you called. He did. Yeah, I told you. He said, yeah, that he'd come. That's all. Carson goes and sits down on the sofa. Yeah, what did you want him to say? For years, they didn't speak. They didn't see each other, had nothing to do with each other. It went on like that for years. Not a single word to each other. Never spoke. Not a single word. But then... There's a soft knock at the door. They almost never spoke. The only son. They never speak. But now... Yeah, now she can't speak. She's never liked me, he says. She hated me. Always hated me. I never wanted to speak to her again, he said. Never speak to her again. A soft knock at the door again. They didn't get along. In a way. They didn't fit together. Too different, maybe. Ola comes in. He stops. Ah, standing there. Ah, 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 ma, ma. Yeah, I. Nah. Uh, 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 yeah. But this is sad, really awful. Yeah, but yeah, it was a. Uh... Stroke? Yeah. And nothing can be done. No, I guess not. Yeah. 
You were the one who found her. She was lying on the floor. Can she speak? Yeah, she was lying on the floor. And there's nothing that can be done? Nothing? She can't speak. Just, yeah, you heard it yourself. Yeah. It's too awful. Yeah, really way too awful. I have to, yeah. Yeah, can I, yeah, go out for a bit? I need some air. Yeah. I should. I can stay here. I can. You, you two go. The youngest daughter hands the bowl and sponge to the brother. He takes it, looks at it inquisitively. She walks away from him, stops, and stands there. No, I can't. I'll stay. I can stay. No. Now it's my turn. You two go ahead. The youngest daughter goes out. I don't know. Yeah, if if I can take any more of this, I know. Go on, you two. Get some air. Yeah, I can stay here. The oldest daughter goes out. The brother looks toward the bed. Pause. Mom sits up in her bed, opens her eyes, looks at the brother. Mom. How are you, Mom? Are you better, Mom? Mom lies down again. And, and you the brother goes over to the window stands there and looks out the friend goes over to the window and looks out both Johannes and Karsten walk out into the space. They stop and stand there. Pause. The nurse comes in. She goes over to the mom, takes her pulse, then places her hands folded in her lap, closes her eyelids. So it's over. But, but hey. Yeah? Just now. Yeah? Just now, while I, while I was standing here, while I was standing here looking out the window, yeah. Hey. Do you know? Yeah, I was I was standing there and I was thinking that I didn't feel grief. I didn't feel anything. And I thought it was because mom and I, you know, we weren't very close. Not always. No. Or maybe in, in a way we were very close in another way, but I, yeah, I wasn't sad or anything. When you and just empty, like emptied out, like nothing. That's how. That's how it was, and and yeah. But hey, yeah, I think I. I should yeah get the doctor. But hey, yeah. Yeah, while, while, while I was standing there, just, just now thinking nothing, feeling nothing, just empty, I, I looked out the window. It's it's routine, so I... Uh, but, but I, yeah, I stood there, and then, and then, and then quiet. It became quiet. Everything became quiet, and there, there, there in the sky there, And through me, through me, yeah, like this yellow and quivering kind of came through me, you know, from that bed over there towards me, through me. 
and up into the sky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm listening. Karsten goes over, stands next to the friend. He looks out the window. There was, there was a, there was a light, an ordinary light, and then a kind of light that 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 couldn't be seen. It, it could be seen and, and 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 not seen at the same time, and it was yellow, yellow and white at the same time, if that's possible. That light, that that light. That light up there in the sky, that light went through me. Yeah. And there in the sky, over there, I, I don't understand it because the light goes through me and the light expands. Golden light. First wide and then light is the wind. And at first, at, at first it's dense and then, and, and then airy. And then it spreads out, golden across the sky, everywhere, vanishing, vanishing out into the sky. And, and everything feels good. And everything is, is golden and everything is quiet. And everything is golden silence. And then... Maybe that's how it is to die. The brother stands there and looks into the sky, and then he turns. Here. I can take that. The brother hands the bowl and sponge to the nurse, who takes them. The youngest daughter comes in. It's over now. Mom is dead. Now she can rest. And now we'll, yeah, prepare her. The oldest daughter comes in. Mom is dead. She died, died while, while... The nurse goes out and stands, and the oldest daughter and the youngest daughter hold each other, Stay standing there, holding each other. The friend goes and sits down on the sofa. The brother walks over and strokes mom's hair. Then he goes out. The sisters let go of each other. They walk over and stand next to the bed. The nurse comes in again, and she walks over to the bed. Pause. I have to call Henning. Yeah, go ahead, call. The oldest daughter goes out. Well, it's over. Now she can rest. Yeah. It went fast. I wasn't there. But your brother was. She wasn't alone. I should have been there. Now we'll, yeah, prepare her. Yeah. You can see her again later. But I should have been there. I was outside. She was alone. He was there. She was alone. I wasn't there. The nurse begins to wheel out the bed. No, 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 don't. Don't do that. You can see her again. Mom died alone. The nurse wheels the bed out, pause. The youngest daughter goes out, very long pause. Henning comes in. Hey, yeah, she's, yeah. Dead. Yeah, mom. Mom is dead? Yeah, she... Carson walks over and sits down on the sofa, puts his arm around the friend's shoulders. I just talked to Hilda. She had called. She... Yeah, left a message. On the voicemail. Yeah, I didn't hear the phone. I'd, I'd left it in the hallway by the door. It was a stroke. That's what she said in the message, but now. Yeah, I was trying to call her, but then she called. Just now, I stood there with the phone in my hand. Trying to call her one more time, and then. Yeah, Mama just died. It went fast, a stroke. Yeah. Yeah. Mom was dead. The friend and Karsten stand up, put down their drinks, go out slowly. Yeah, it's awful. She, Hildy, didn't sound like herself at all. I 
I guess we have one, two. Yeah. Mamas. They were there. Yeah, when she died. Apparently they were outside right at the moment. Ola was there. And Hilde. Yeah, she said, you know, that mom couldn't stand being alone with him, that it killed her. He came in and then she died. <laughs> yeah. It's too much for mom. Mm. Yeah. That's what she said. Mm. I guess we should. This turned into. Johannes goes out. He takes his glass with him, and Henning goes out after him. Very long pause. The nurse wheels the hospital bed again. It's empty now. She goes out. The lights go down. Black. Uh, then we have we have a little bit of a break. Um, yeah, we, there is a little bit of a break, but this is a time when we were going to invite some of the cast for a bit of a cast conversation. Um, so if uh, if you guys can also just pull up your chairs, maybe okay. to be here between, and we can sit a little bit like this. If you just sit between them. And then, uh, and Sarah, it was sort of prim primarily the people who've done it before, but in a way it's interesting with everyone. We, we just sort of, I mean, we'll, we are, we're gonna, we have a bigger conversation happening later, but just because there's so many, um, so many of you beautiful people who, um, who were in original productions, um, we wanted to just give a moment, um, and, and this, uh, this play in particular, actually, you're going to see some of the footage from the original production behind you. That's going to just be running, and uh, and and it's been so fun to to reunite with with you all um, just in in this little preparation. <laughs> so we wanted to just like give a second to like sit, to to open the floor to see if there's any things that are that are striking you coming back to this text after so many years. Yeah, because and, and actually, uh, Diane, you can come down here too, because when, when we had some Zoom conversations over the last, okay. when we had Zoom conversations over the last couple of weeks, no, no, oh, Deb. I was going to say for her to take my spot, but I'm not original to this product. Yeah. No, but you're original to being in the, being in, in, in FOSA. And when we had some Zoom conversations over the last couple of weeks, it came up that people had found old notes from old scripts, um, I know both Raymond and also Diane mentioned that. Uh, so that could be fun. Um, but I actually first wanted to ask a little bit how how things have felt differently. Because like I mentioned earlier with Night Sings It Songs, it's very different to do Night Sings It Songs now after I've had children myself, for example. And uh, and for you who have also done either some of these plays a long time ago and to now, and I know Birgit, for instance, might have something she wants to share. I, we I can, can start have... with you <laughs> if you want to. Oh, sure. Um, I had a stroke um, six years ago. And when I came to look at the play again, uh, after you know being asked to come i had no recollection that the mother had had a stroke that that was why she um you know was uh in the hospital and died and it was i didn't really have any connection to what a stroke was or anything and then all of a sudden i'm reading i'm like Oh wow, this is really intense to um have that uh yeah be what I'm dealing with here. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, so it certainly takes on in a whole nother resonance for me. And um 
and scary and beautiful uh, to get to be me now and telling this story and getting to reunite with everyone. And thankfully, my speech wasn't affected. I was told possibly because I'm left-handed and left-handed people, their language center has more, doesn't always stay in the same place. And so that might be why I didn't have that I still have my speech mm -hmm. um but um okay <laughs> I can talk more but I also don't have to go on forever <laughs> yeah no but th thank you so much for sharing and, and for and for joining us today you know to be part of this for us that's very important me too it's really special to be back with you all and mm. new people too mm -hmm. uh Raymond do you want to share some of your uh Oh, I just. Uh, you should take the mic. I usually don't need one. No. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I got it. Um, yeah, I was sharing with Sarah that I was, I was. She had just. They had just asked me, and I was like, I need to. I want to look at the script as soon as possible because I knew, leading up to this, I had a lot going on, and I have had the same email address for twenty years now, apparently, and I all of a sudden notes from Sarah started to pop up mm. and I'm pretty sure she just whispered in my ear. One of those notes, <laughs> just like keep it, keep the party needs to stay lively. You don't know what's going on in the hospital sort of thing, which is a spot on note uh, that she apparently has to give me year after year after year. <laughs> but no, and then I looked for, um, I keep all my scripts, uh, but there's been a lot of moving since 2008. So I was trying to find this script because I know I have it. I was hoping to find um, it packed with all the notes and the margins and everything. I wasn't able to, but it was really wonderful to be able to pull up those old notes from um, 2008. Crazy. Did Sarah come around now also and tell you? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, she gave me notes before yeah. and after. She said there's no same after thing. Yeah. This. Yeah. <laughs> and she said the same thing again. Keep it light. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She mumbled something about you were an alternative choice for the part. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> Is else I, was, I was just surprised. I was surprised to, to, to hear how young 60s seem today <laughs> versus when we did before. I was like, oh, he's young, of course. Yeah. Of course, I'm the only one. But now it's like, wow. It's, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, in my 40s or whatever, but like still just like right around the corner. And, you know, it's like crazy. I mean, my, my dad, he passed away when he was 60s, so only like 15 yeah. years older than me. You know, it's just crazy to, to hear the age thing. You know, it's just yeah. really, but it, it really brings back this feeling of like at that age, that wonderful feeling of being able to, as an actor, starting sort of starting out you know being able to find language that you can kind of like almost in a Chekhovian sense you know kind of like settle into and and try to find the sub subtext as as opposed to trying to like you know be on or be something you could just kind of like live in the language and let the language do the work you know um and sort of trying to find my way back to that space today was an interesting mm. experience you know um a, a reconnection with the basics, you know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, kind of delicious, kind of delicious. And Diane, I know, mentioned also that she found her old scripts with all her notes. I did. Uh, I was stunned by how um, nuanced the notes were. I hope I studied them the first time. But um, going back to it, I felt it was um, um, more relevant, had more humor, had more bite, more was was more real because I was twenty years younger, you know, and um, just more relevant mm. and deep. I think his uh, depth is in his simplicity, mm. you know, and um, that was it. You know, that it was it was fun the first time, but kind of funner this time mm. too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't know. I was just going to say. Um, um, it's interesting because if I think about 20 years ago, I'd had a couple, you know, instances 
like once my mom came to visit me in college and broke her foot. And so it was this weekend that I was expecting her to like really take me out to dinner and help me with my laundry while I did my stuff. And instead it ended up being like me taking care of her. So that was like one moment I'd had at that point that when we did this death variations in 2006, but looking at this now and dealing with aging parents, it's like, there's different like levels of universality in the text Mm. that you could pick up on like at different points in your life. And I feel like, um, it just makes it richer. So even if you have only one like experience like that, you can bring that to it, but then you get deeper with time. Mm -hmm. And then in watching like other people deal with their parents. And then just to speak a minute about death variations, because I feel like that's the one that I was in, it was just powerful to read because in the one sense, this is so silly, David, but the time when we were playing like young people, I was like, way too old for this like we, 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 and now I look at it and I'm like people my age are still having babies like you know you're like we could still be making bad decisions like I don't know you just bring different kinds of thinking into it you know depending on whatever it is and I feel like that flexibility that I um still get to be the youngest daughter or that or have that anyone can play that that we it belongs to all of us that there's that feeling mm-hmm. in here and I like that he does that he's not like mid-20s da, 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 must be creepy person whatever like you know <laughs> It's like the, 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 that he just says, this is the role that you're playing now. Like, this is the voice that you're speaking through now. So it it's kind of cool to see it happen because it didn't matter. Like, it, it just it just reads. Yeah. And I just think it's just interesting as time goes on that you just pick up different things, hit you in different ways. Like, it floods back differently. Awesome. Well, and, and it is interesting what you're saying there about how he, almost all of his characters always named younger woman, young woman, older woman, mm-hmm. yeah, younger daughter, older daughter. It's hardly, there are just a few, very few characters have names yeah. or like the friend, the, the nurse, young friend, the, the nurse. nurse. So it's almost like it's more these prototypes yeah, than it are yeah. archetypes in a way. And it also is interesting what you're saying that in that sense, age doesn't matter too much yeah because part that you're like let's say younger and older daughter yeah you know that between older and younger daughter you still have that dynamic it's a status dynamic even More than if it is you're 65 yeah it's still the same dynamic totally and it wouldn't matter if the like we buy that the mom's the mom because we've been told that the like she mm. put on the costume that is the mom her job is to be mm. there mm. saying those words and it wouldn't matter if you were a lot younger i think that i the same parts it's like we understand by virtue of what it is to be sisters Mm. you're the older one because of the dynamics of family relationships and all mm. those things. So it's kind of cool that like anyone can don any hat and it's not so much about, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, you know, and there are two more of the old cast here <laughs> from, from death variations though. Uh, do you have something to share? Sure. I mean, along those lines, I'll, I'll just say I, I was in death variations a long time ago. And, um, and I was a little mortified when I got the email saying I'd be playing the daughter. Like I thought, Oh God, like, isn't there like a 20 year old they could find. And it's been so trippy to see people who I worked with 18 years ago. Like it's really, there's something just basically very moving about like revisiting not not only the plays, but getting to see people you haven't seen in a long time. And we haven't read Death Variations yet. And I, I think this is a little more present in maybe in some of the plays we're going to read this afternoon, but there's this sense that the plays are actually people telling stories about themselves that have happened. And in a way, I feel like it could all happen out of time. Yeah. Like we could all be 80 and describing what yeah. happened. Yeah and reenacting it. And there's something kind of moving about reenacting it as well. Like that the layers of understanding, you know, I have more life experience now <laughs> than I did then, <laughs> you know, and uh, um, anyway, so it's just, it's a real gift for us. This is a real, I've never had this kind of experience before of getting to see people. And I feel like it's understood between all the different cat, like, I don't know some of you, but it's um, <laughs> I feel like there's a common language. Yeah. We, we talked about that. Um, that on, sorry. The um, rehearsal process, we started ours for Sakala with a retreat trip uh, out Ooh. to the Appalachians. And I remember, in fact, uh, Frank and I were joking about it. There's a song that, my char- that I chose for my character, um, Sister Christian by Scorpion. I felt like that was Henning's song. 
Anyway, every time that song comes on, I think about that retreat and how wonderful it was as a bonding experience for our cast. I've, uh, this has been one of those casts and some great friendships have come out of it um, that I've never forgotten. And it's it was just a, a wonderful experience. And you can feel that in the dressing room. I could almost at first blush probably tell who was in what cast with yeah. who. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, my my um, comment is actually not about my own experience, though, because it echoes a lot of what's already been said. But I just want to shout out to Lizanne, who, after reading this play again, I have seen the original production of this, and and then revisiting this that character in this play, and just how much work that role is, particularly, and how moving it is to hear it out loud. I mean, the difference between the on the page and having it out loud and, and that that's one of the really sort of magical characters in these five plays even that um, sort of is so loosely tied to, you know, you know there's meaning, but it's not tied to language. And, um, and so, yeah, that was, a wonderful experience to see and feel that again. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going to wrap it up. I just want to ask uh, Neve how the experience was to 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 be inside of the experience. Well, I'll, say, I'll say two things. I mean, one, this was an ingenious bit of casting on your part because, of course, the nurse isn't in the family. And she just sees the family from the outside and whatever compassion she has to offer is the compassion of her professionalism, yeah. but she's not invested. And so that was really nice. But the second thought I had just listening to you all speak is that I feel like a, a little bit like I'm actually in septology right now, yeah. where people are coming into contact with the younger versions of themselves uh, and coming into contact with the people or the places that make those younger versions of themselves available to them once more in both a real and a distant way. Hmm. And so there's something about this experience that has a really kind of Fossean logic yeah. to it. And that's another ingenious thing about what you've you've done. So so lots of wonderful resonances here between the setup of this and Foss's own aesthetic. Love that. <laughs> Yay, yeah. Yeah. So we'll be moving and, and just about the experience that she had now. So as we mentioned, we have the Fossa Corner, but I think we're going to have to wait until the next break. Yes. But in the at the next break, I think it's like Xavier who will be in there in the next break or or Dad um, next break, I think. Uh, so after the next play, you'll have a chance to go in there and have a bit of experience that Mary had now of reading with uh, and, and, and do it because there is something very particular about how his language is that it's almost as if you can just, because he has these line breaks, if you look at the scripts that are laying on the table over there, if you haven't seen his scripts in writing before, take a look and go in there and try it because the line breaks kind of makes this rhythm in the language where you, even if you have never read it before, don't know anything about it, you will feel quite accomplished as an actor. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, we need to let's, set up then. Yeah, yeah, let's the say that we're going to start the next one at 2.45 since we're... Yeah, so like a 10-minute ten, ten yeah. break. Woo! I think that's this one. <laughs> Oh, that's so fun. It's kind of surreal. Yeah, yeah. It's I'm going to go now. Okay. Well, 
Good job, dude. I need to make sure I have your phone number for future. Yeah, I got some questions. So I'll give that okay. 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 But, but that's the problem. That's the problem. But the email is the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you get it? Yeah. 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 Period, but I'm going to I'm not, but she was here earlier. She came to the first reading. She's a yep. friend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just gonna say bye. Yeah, and then they also might yeah. know that she's like, I know, okay. We had talked about sharing food with, but I'm, is there enough food for audience? I think we finished there? some of it. Yeah, okay. that's for the audience.
Yeah, let me know. Well, this was a okay. Okay. You, You've got the stage versions, right? Yeah, they're all I here. The wrong, I got the wrong one. Oh, no, I got the right I only am in the big and I'll look at it and have nothing to do with it. Um, so I'm not sure about here tonight. I don't know about the question. So I'm going to go back on the So I'm going to go back on the question. So I'm going to go back on the question. So I'm going to go Okay. Oh, I'm okay for now. Thank you. You know, but that's the good thing you want to understand. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh -huh. good. Yeah. Yeah. You're amazing. That's why I'm snapping. <laughs>
And thank you for all the help. Mm -hmm. You no bought problem. some of the snack, a snack that my girlfriend had been trying to try for so long. You know, the sway. Because mm -hmm. we get the non sway. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to try these. I saw them in your back, and I'm like, I'm right. Hey, it's so an outtap. I'm not doing Thank you. I, yeah, I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, I think it's Oh, Asla? I don't think that's the that's where I got the money. Oh, I thought it was Asla, but I think I'm 436. Oh, no, I can say that. Victoria Dev is right there. Oh, no, no, she's not. That's sorry. No, that's Diane. I'm sorry. I have no help. I have no help at all. Yeah. <laughs> I 
That's uh, like the yeah, yeah, because it's better in terms of what they have to be able to do. Yeah, or better at the center of the thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 I've asked. Um, I know, I can wait for the rest of that. Oh, yeah, no, but I see the No, <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't look like it. You're right. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Oh, what is that? I mean, like that, like that. Yes, actually, you can never Sitting on this box, so you can sit there in the area, okay, cool. and the tanks there, so just make space for each other. Is it okay? Yeah, sit there, yeah. Yeah. And okay. Do not place anything behind you because behind you the projector is projected. Okay. So you, you just can't like suddenly like put your script or your bottle like yes in the middle. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very exciting. I see it's Arlene and James. We're reading together. How lovely. We are. Um, yeah, but also in terms of reading stage direction, we like to take a break. Sure, long well, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I noticed only one of those. I didn't realize, but I guess we didn't know that the mics were that sensitive. So, no, no. In the first play. No. <laughs> I was paranoid that, it, you know, I, they wouldn't be able to hear me, so I was kind of like standing yeah, yeah, yeah. here. I guess it turned out to be too loud. Oh, but no one said anything, but they said something after. So. I feel like I'm I, conscious I, of turning my page softly. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, no. I mean, they know they're listening to a reading, but yeah. And yeah, I guess I, I was kind of the guinea pig today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. We've got about eight people here doing this. <laughs> Not to mention a million streaming. Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Actually, they've been sticking around. I'm surprised. I haven't seen that many walkouts. I thought I was going to see a lot of like, oh, this sucks. Bye. <laughs> or like, just passerbys, you know? Okay, okay, okay. All right. You can go right out of each side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. if it gets a bit too much, I'm standing. Oh, that one's on. Sit. Yeah. Switch. Alina, the location is where they're going to be. So you have that option. Yeah. If you don't really have a second hit, we're good. We should do it, though. 
Okay. Should we turn this on and off when it's? Do you feel like you have the capacity to remember to turn it on again? I'll, okay. I'll turn it on for my first session. Yeah, yeah. Turn, yeah. turn it on for your first session. Is on now? And you just held this the whole time. I, saw I just want to make sure we get batteries, but if you don't want batteries going out, it's I just held it because it's printed on both sides. Um, I do it now. Right. Okay. That first, yes. No. I don't know who or what you just think that was. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I was, <laughs> so I was like, I knew the kids were really good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
acknowledge yeah and and then uh, as you see uh eric is here he's going to be filming for the for the live feed and he wants you to feel like he's or i you know he's kind of invisible but he's a part of our experiment here today and um and yeah you know give us another opportunity to listen to uh, to you on fossa all right Okay, who is it? Is it girl? Yeah. Yeah, so so can we just test this microphone? Yes. Hey, 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 hey. Test, 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 test. Hey, hey, hey. Hey. Yeah, it's on. Does that work? Hey, hey, hey. Hey, test, 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 hey. Huh? No, I, I know. I know. Uh, hey, hey, hey. But yeah, did you know? Because I could say, uh, yeah, or or that they might have to lean in towards it. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? <laughs> okay. It's kind of nice okay. then if it becomes intimate between the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 this is her life. That's certainly very nice. Hey, hey, Paul, can we see the light for this one? Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. One black lights up a living room in an old house on a bluff overlooking the water. An older woman stands by a window and looks out. She turns and looks towards the older friend who has stood up from the sofa and walked across the floor a bit. Are you leaving? Uh, yeah, I thought I'd take a walk down to the water. And it's so nice down there by the water and it's such a nice summer day. Mm. And it'll be a while before he comes to pick me up. He has lots of errands to run in the city. Yeah. You want to come? No, I think I'll stay here. She turns towards the window again. Are you really going to stand there looking out the window again? Don't you ever get tired of it? Whenever I think about you, I have got to say, I see you in front of that window looking down towards the water. Yeah, well, I, I do a lot of that. Yeah, it's true. Mm. That's how I see you. Don't you ever get tired? I don't think about it like that. No. Well, then I'm going for a walk. <laughs> the older friend walks towards the door on the right, stands there, looks towards the older woman. I'm going down to the waters and it's a nice day. Yeah, you do that. You don't want to come? No. I, you have to be I know you don't really like it down here by the water. No, I know you don't really like it down by the water. It's just... Go then. I'll just go then. Yeah. You go ahead. The older friend goes out to the right, and the older woman turns toward the window again. She stands there looking out. Pause. Two. When I stand at the window, I can see him in front of me. It was a day like today, except it was autumn, the day my friend came to visit me. It was many, many years ago now, but I can still see him as he walks down the water. I, I see him walking toward the water, and maybe he turns around, waves maybe, if it occurs to him. Or if he's caught up in his own thoughts, maybe he doesn't turn around. I can still see him. He's walking down toward the water, and I can see him. He's walking back up the road, maybe carrying a bucket of fish, if he's been lucky. 
and caught something. Or sometimes carrying a trout or salmon. And then I could see how proud he was. <laughs> he could be like that too. But now, it's so long ago. Everything's gone now. And soon everything will vanish. Soon everything will be gone. When I go, everything will be gone. Just like he's been gone so long now, and he was here. And then suddenly he was gone. She looks around the living room. And this is where he lived, where we lived, he and I. We lived here together. We lived here together. We bought this house and we moved out of the city. And then we lived here, he and I, just the two of us. And this house is just how it was at that time. I left it that way. Almost everything is just how it was. She looks around, walks around, straightening photos and things. So yeah, most of it is just how it was, because I don't like changes. But even now, so many years later, I don't understand what happened to him. That autumn day that my friend, just like today, came to visit me, as much as I have thought about it, I've never understood what happened. I could say that it's bothered me or it's probably wrong to say that it bothered me. It's more like, no, I don't know. It's more like it's just been there throughout life, like a question, like a calling. Because we found each other, and then just as quickly and unexpectedly as we found each other, we were separated from each other. But that's how life is. It's just what we have to live with. It's just how life is. Footsteps are heard. The older woman looks at a young woman who walks in slowly from right. Once she's in the living room, she looks around and then walks just like the older woman did before, all around straightening the photos and things a bit while the older woman, who the younger woman doesn't seem to notice, stands there looking towards her, smiling mildly. Then the older woman walks slowly out to the left and the young woman goes over to the window and looks out the window just like the older woman did. She turns around, walks around a bit more in the living room, then hears footsteps and Asla comes into the living room from the right and the young woman and Asla nod to each other. Nice of you to stop by. Why you say that? I see you so rarely. But I'm here all the time, I am. Yeah, you are, in a way. You look anxious, is there something wrong? No. No, it's nothing. Are you okay? I'm okay. Is something bothering you? No, no. Don't you like it here? Should we not have moved here? Don't you like being with me anymore? Well, I do. It, it's not that, but it's 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 so quiet here. It's so peaceful it, uh, that I get anxious being here, I guess. <laughs> no, I don't know. Nothing much happens here, it's true. But that's just what we wanted. We didn't want to live in the city anymore. Yeah. But I can get, it can get too quiet. No one to see, hardly any, hardly any cars. Every once in a while there's a car, but down, down there on the road. <laughs> but that's just what we wanted. We didn't want to live in the city with all the people, all the cars. Yeah. And you were the one who really wanted to move out of the city. You did too. Yeah, I did too. Don't get me wrong. But now we've moved. Now we've moved out of the city. Now we've got a nice old house on the water. It's just how you wanted to live. You said. So now we're here and you're still unhappy. You're almost more sad than before. 
Isn't it what you'd imagined it'd be living here? It is. Maybe it is. But it, it gets so quiet here. Yeah, I can tell you're anxious. But can't you just try to be happy about the nice house, about how calm it is? Can't you be calm? Don't worry so much, you know? You just have to settle into something, you know? I think yeah. that no matter where you were, no matter where you'd live, you'd be like this. You didn't like it living in the city, and now you don't like it here either. You wouldn't have liked it wherever you lived. You just want to live somewhere else. That's just the way you are. Maybe. But you're happy. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm happy too. Yeah. <clears throat> It's not, it's not that, I, but I, I, I just get anxious or whatever it is. No, I, I don't know. I can tell. Is it me? Do I bore you? Don't you love me anymore? I do. It's not that. Don't think that. You are so good to me. You are. But I worry that... What if you didn't feel anything for me anymore? When you're like this, that's what I think. I start to think it's me you don't like. No. No, I don't think that. Not like that. No, I know, but... Today's the day. Your friend is coming by. She, isn't that right? Yeah, she talked about coming by. She had to drive by here on the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you nervous about her coming? No, not exactly. Is her husband coming too? I don't know, but I don't think so. <clears throat> You can't become a complete hermit out here, though. It's easy to become like that when you live like this. No, but you shouldn't be. She goes over to the window, looks out, turns towards him. Even though it's not exactly a nice day, not sunny, not a sunny day, it's not that bad either today. Now that we're well into autumn, you can't ask for a better than this. Goes over to the window, looks out. Ooh, it's drizzling, isn't it? <laughs> but it's a nice autumn day, clear and cold. But it is drizzling. Yeah, I think it is. But it's hard to tell. Maybe it's raining a bit. I think it's raining a bit, but I'm not sure. Should we go out and see? Sure. The young woman goes towards the door on the right, turns and looks towards Asla, who's still standing there, staring blankly ahead. Come on, don't just stand there thinking. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming. He goes over to the young woman and together they go out to the right. And as they go, the older woman comes in slowly from the left. She stands there looking after them, smiles wistfully after them and walks around a little, walks around a little looking at photos and things in the living room. The, the older woman. It's all so long ago, but I still remember. At least that particular day, I can remember it as if it just happened. It was a nice autumn day, clear, not warm or cold. And we went outside to see if it was raining. And it was, but just barely. And we stood there for a while out there in the drizzle. And we walked around the house looking at it. And he talked about the house needing paint, about the old wooden planks needing to be replaced, about things he always talked about, he talked about. And we both agreed that it was a nice house, nice and big, nice and white. But if we didn't want to get wet, we really had to get inside as fast as possible. So you ran back inside. 
Footsteps are heard. The older woman goes over and places herself by the window, looks out. The young woman comes skipping in from the right. She stops a bit on the floor. She stops a bit on the floor, stays standing there looking towards the door where Asla comes in a bit after. But at least we've got a nice house, right? And it's right on the water, right? Yes, it's very nice here. <laughs> we've been lucky. It's not easy to find such a nice house. And we tried for quite a while before we found one. Yeah, we took our time. And in the end, we found a nice house. But I, I can see there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I, I should have done something about that over the summer, but now... Yeah, now it's a little late in the year, but there's no real rush. <clears throat> Asla goes. What are you doing today then? I think I'll take the boat out on the water. Again? Yeah, I think so. You're hardly ever home. I am. You're almost always on the water. Never home. Hardly ever. But there aren't that many things to do here other than go out on the water. But you're out there more than you're at home. It seems that way. Yeah, maybe it seems that way like that. But I'm actually here at home with you more. And uh, by the way... Uh, I love it out there on the water. <laughs> I have never understood. What's so great about trapping yourself on the water in a little boat, spending hour after hour in a little boat? You just sit out there in the middle of the bay for hours, all day, all evening, until it gets dark. You can just sit there in the middle of the bay in that small boat of yours. Hmm. What's so amazing about it? I mean, it must be cold, windy, especially now that it's autumn and ridiculously boring. It must be boring. Yeah, it might be boring. I don't know, but I like it. <laughs> what about it do you like so much? No, I really don't know. But you must know there has to be something. Yeah, I, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> Just say it. No, I don't know. I just like it because, no, I, I really don't know. Yes, you do. Yeah, I guess it's the waves. Maybe, I think so. The waves? Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's, I like to just sit there feeling the waves crash and crash, maybe. And also, like, the boat diving up and down. <laughs> And I like to watch the water, and I like to think about how incredibly far it is down to the bottom. You know, it's very deep. It's one of the deepest in the country. Right here, I sit there in that small boat, the waves crash, and it's a long way to the shore. And the boat is small. A thin hull is what separates me from all that water, separates me from all that depth. And the boat dives up and down and up and down and, and the wind grabs my hair and I'm alone. Looks towards Be her. Because you, you ever hardly want to come with me. And so I sit there and the waves crash and the boat dives up and down and time passes and you should come with me once in a while too. No, mm -hmm. but you know that I really don't like it out there on the water. I, I get scared and, and I get bored. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's how it is for you. I'm not saying anything. I, that's just how you are. I understand. Yeah, it's how I've always been. I guess I've never been, I've never liked being out there on the water. But... It's because of her, my friend coming. Is that why you want to go on the water today? No, I'd be out on the water no matter what. But <laughs> I, I have, like you say, become something of a hermit or that's how I've been, always been. But it hasn't gotten better since we moved out here, to tell you the truth. So that's why you want to go out on the water because she's coming. No, it's not just that, but that's part of it. I want to go out on the water because I like being on the water and because that friend of yours is coming. Both, <laughs> both things, okay? But you've known her longer than you've known me. 
Does that matter? No, I guess. <laughs> what do I know? No, I've never liked being out on the water. I get scared. I, I think it's scary. I don't know, but... I, I guess that's exactly why it feels safe out there. For, for me, to be out on the water? Yeah, safe. Because it's sort of, but not really very dangerous, maybe. That's why it feels safe, in a way. Well, you could at least wear a life jacket. <laughs> <laughs> no, whoa, no way. Come on, I might as well just stay on land then. Yeah, well, what do I know? How long will that friend of yours be here? It'll just be a short visit, a couple of hours, maybe. Do you know when she'll be here? She said she'd come in the afternoon, but she didn't say exactly when she'd be here, just that it would be in the afternoon. Yeah, <laughs> cool that I should hurry. <laughs> you know her yeah it's not that <laughs> but I'm going to put on some warm clothes and go out on the water that's what I'm going to do if you really really want to then I really can't stop you it's not that bad okay yeah just go you you go Asla goes out to the right and the young woman goes over to the window, stops to look outside, positions herself beside the older woman without seeing her or acknowledging her presence in any way. After a while, the older woman walks around the room a bit and stops at the back of the room on the left side, looks towards the young woman who now walks away from the window and stops in the middle of the room and looks towards the door on the right. The older woman also looks at the door where Asla comes in wearing a raincoat. Yeah, okay, I'm ready. Well, if you really want to go out on the water, then... But you could. You're hardly ever home. Yeah, I mean that. You're always going out on the water. I thought it was okay. There's not that much to do here otherwise. Yeah, well, it was you who really wanted to move here. And, and you were already on the water this morning. And... <sighs> And you were yesterday there, and, and you were there yesterday afternoon. What is it with you? It's like you can't find a sense of calm. Yeah, you go ahead, but I, yeah. I do think you could have been home more often. Ashley goes and sits down on the sofa. Yeah, fine. Now stay home. Hmm. No, that's not what I meant. If you want to go, yeah, then just go ahead. I won't hold you back. You... Just go. No, I'll stay, I'll stay home. It's fine. No, you go. I shouldn't have said that. I, if you want to go, you just go. Just go ahead. I won't hold you back. Go, please. Just go. No, I'm staying home. <laughs> Asla stands up, takes his raincoat flippingly. Takes off his raincoat flippingly. <sighs> no, I mean it. Go. But you don't like it here. Is there something wrong with me? Don't you like being with me? What is it? What is with you? You're always so anxious, never calm, always wanting to go out on the water. And you won't ever come with me out on the water? Yeah, not today, obviously, So you, you, since your friend is coming. But every once in a while, you could come with me, right? But you know I don't like... The water, I get scared so easily. The boat's so small, and even though we're on a bay, the water can be quite rough. Don't you remember that time? No, it wasn't that dangerous. No, maybe not, but the waves did crash over the side of the boat. A couple of times. Yeah. No, I don't like being on the water. Yeah, I know. But you, go ahead. Asla stands up, puts his raincoat on again. Yeah, okay, I'll... Yeah, okay, then I'll go. Yeah, do it. Will you be gone long? Not that long. He nods to the young woman, goes out to the right, but comes in again and gives her a hug, then goes out again while the young woman stands there looking after him. Then she goes and sits down on the sofa where he'd been sitting. She picks up a book off the floor, looks at it for a bit, and as she does, the older woman goes over to the window, stops there, and looks out. Then the young woman puts the book back down on the floor and goes over to the window, stops there beside the older woman, but still as if the older woman wasn't there. Then the younger woman opens the window. Be careful now, and don't be gone long. Yeah. 
Don't be long. Mm, no, no, just a short trip. How long will you be going? No, it won't be long. I don't know exactly when I'll be home. It won't be long. The young woman puts her arm out the window and waves, then closes the window and stays standing there watching quiet and motionless, while the older woman walks slowly out across the floor. And so I stood there, looking for him. Watched him go down the road toward the water, but he didn't turn around. And suddenly I felt anxious, and inexplicable anxiety came over me. The young woman begins to walk around the living room. But I thought it was nothing, that the anxiety I felt didn't matter, didn't mean anything. It was just something that came over me. And then I thought, I have to run after him, ask him to come back. The young woman goes over to the window again, stops there, and looks out. I have to ask him not to go on the water. But then I remembered that my friend might come any minute, and I, I really had to be home when she came. I thought since she was my friend and she was coming... It would be just as well that he wasn't here, actually, because then I could be alone with her, I thought. And that would obviously be better to be alone with her than if he was here, I thought. And so I thought the anxiety I felt didn't mean anything. It was just an everyday anxiety that I shouldn't worry about. It was just something I was imagining without reason, I thought. And so I sat down. The young woman goes over to the sofa, sits down, picks up the book. And tried to read. The young woman begins to read. But I felt so anxious that I, I, I couldn't read. I, I was unable to concentrate. The young woman puts the book back on the floor again. So I just sat there, staring straight out in front of me. The young woman sits, looking straight out. Not doing anything, but I felt so anxious. So I went. The young woman stands up and goes over to the window again, stops there and looks out over to the window to look for him, but I couldn't see him or his boat. And then I thought, okay, come on. Now I, I have to stop. I'm driving myself crazy going on like this, I thought. The older woman turns and look toward, looks towards the younger woman standing in front of the window, then turns out again. But was it, what is it with him? I thought standing there, it had to be something. Was it, he didn't like me, I thought. Didn't he like being with me? Something was bothering him. That was clear. Never wanting to be at home, always heading out on the water. It had to be something, but what was it? He didn't even know himself. He wasn't able to feel calm when inside. He wanted to go down to the water all the time. Now that we finally found the house we dreamed of about so long, something had come over him, an anxiousness, a darkness, something I didn't really understand that he, he probably didn't understand himself either, had come over him. While he was walking around with his fishing pole, wearing his raincoat, thinking about the planks needed to be replaced, the house needing paint, that, he, that it had been hard to get the ladder up there under the cable. That's what he walked around thinking about and didn't understand himself. I realized this as I looked out the window down toward the water. He didn't understand himself, what it was that was bothering him, but that something had come over him, that was for sure. It was something. And I stood there feeling this huge anxiety in me, and I decided that there was no reason for me to be anxious. But he was, in fact, exactly the same as he'd always been. No, he hadn't said anything. No, he hadn't done anything to indicate he wasn't exactly the same as always. But there was something about him, something. And I felt even more anxious. And it occurred to me. The young woman looks towards the door on the right. That I should go up to our bedroom. It, it, it just occurred to me. And I went up to our bedroom. The young woman goes out to the right. And then when I got up there, I saw that he'd straightened his clothes. 
They lay there more organized than I've ever seen them before. So I picked up one of his shirts and looked at it, smelled it, folded it again neatly, put it back on the pile where he had put it, all his shirts together so neatly he had folded all his shirts. And all of a sudden, I felt unbearably sad. I, I didn't know why exactly, but I did. And so I sat down on my bed. I sat there looking at the piles he had organized his clothes into. And I thought about how I'd never seen our bedroom so nice and neat before. It was like everything was in its place. And what could that mean, I thought. And that made me more anxious. What, what was he up to, I thought. Why had he straightened his clothes, I thought. I felt so unspeakably sad. But then I thought about how he'd been exactly how he always was. There was nothing unusual about him. No, there hadn't been anything unusual about him. He had just been how he always was. Nowadays, a, a little anxious is all. But there is something. I need to understand what it could be, but I, I wasn't able to understand what it could be. Didn't he like being out? Didn't he like being out here? Didn't he like being here with me? What was it with him? But he was the one who wanted to move out here away from the city. And in the beginning, everything was pretty good. But then, yeah, something came over him. I, I don't know what it was. But he was out on the water more and more. Some days, he'll go out on the water several times a day, but he'll only be out there an hour or two before he comes back home, and then only to stay for a little while before he'll come and tell me he's going out there again. The older woman goes over to the window and looks out. Then she walks out across the floor. I felt so anxious and, and so unspeakably sad that I wanted to go down to the water to look for him. The young woman comes in, dressed in a raincoat. She looks around to the living room, then goes out quickly again. Yeah, that's how it was. And I went down to the water to look for him, and I, I stood there on our dock, looking and looking across the water, and the waves were crashing against the dock because now the wind had started to blow. And now it was raining harder, and I stood there listening to the waves crash and crash against the rock, and I turned around and saw the boathouse. And I went inside the boathouse and I saw that everything was nice and neat. And I went back out from the darkness of the boathouse and I stood there on the dock looking out across the water and the boat was nowhere to be seen. And I thought that I shouldn't be standing here because, oh, my friend might be here already so I should probably go back up. But I didn't really want to go back up. I felt like I just wanted to stand here but I really had to go back up and it was cold and I was freezing and now it was really raining. So I should just go back up, I thought. So I walked up and as I did, I could feel the wind blowing and it began to rain even harder. And I walked up and I tried to think about how there was nothing to be anxious about. I thought it was, it was probably just my imagination, I thought. He'd been out on the water in this kind of weather so many times before, I thought. So I walked up, and as I got close to our house, our nice white house, I saw my friend standing in the front yard. She was here already, and I yelled to her, waved at her, and she yelled back, waved back. And she asked where I'd been, and I said, I'd just gone down out for a little walk. And she said it was a good thing that I'd come back because she was freezing. The weather was terrible, she said, rain and wind, and she had gotten quite wet, she said. And then we went inside the house. The older woman looks towards the door on the right where the young woman, her hair a, a little wet, comes in and then looks towards her young, and, and then her young friend comes in, whose hair is also wet. These two women look at each other. They seem to tremble a bit as the older woman walks somewhat quickly out to the left. The young friend goes over to sit on the sofa. The young woman walks over to the window, stops there, and looks out. 
Hey, this is nice. Yeah. The two of you are really lucky to have found a place like this. Yeah, we think so too. Come over here and look at the view. The young friend stands up and walks over to the young woman. They stand next to each other, looking out the window. Really nice. Even though it's raining pretty hard now, you can see all the way out to the bay. And way out there, I think I can see a little boat out there in the middle of the waves. Maybe that's Asla. So you have a boat? Starts walking towards the sofa. Yeah, and Asla is on the water all the time. <laughs> the young friend going over to her. I didn't know he was interested in that sort of thing. No, I didn't know he was interested either in it either. But anyway, now he spends a lot of time out there on the water. I don't know why. And in all kinds of weather. Yeah, pretty much no matter what. Today, yeah, he was out there on the water this morning, and now he's out there again. And yesterday afternoon, he was out there on the water. It can't be much fun when the weather is like this. But does he have a big boat? Just a rowboat? Yeah, an old wooden boat. No, it's not exactly the best weather to be out on the water. It's raining. Windy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know why he always wants to go on the water. Home is the last place he wants to be. <laughs> oh, he's almost always out there on the water. I don't know what it is. Maybe he doesn't want to be with me. At least I start to wonder. Of course he does. But he probably likes being out there on the water. You know, he lived in the city for so long that he probably just likes. Yeah, he grew up on the water, you know. But he's so... Is something wrong? No, I don't know. But it's like he can't find a sense of calm. He'll be home for a little while and then he'll get anxious. Are you worried about him? It sounds like you are. No, not exactly, or, but, yeah, maybe it's me, that he doesn't like being with me anymore. Oh, no, that's not it. That he gets bored being with me. Because when we lived in the city, he wanted to move out of the city. And now that we've done that, found ourselves a nice place, he, he can't calm himself down here either. That, yeah, I don't get it. But hasn't he always been like this? I mean, well, always? Yeah, I mean, as long as I can remember, he's been a loner, sort of withdrawn into himself. Yeah, you've actually known him longer than I have. Yeah, he's just lived in his own world. <laughs> yeah, it's actually your fault since you're the one who brought us together. Yeah, you have a lot on your conscience. <laughs> But okay, so he just sort of withdraw into himself? That's how you remember him? Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, he's like that a lot. Out of it, in a way. It must have been something to do with his childhood. Yeah, that's what you'd think. But actually... Because he and his mother, yeah, they haven't exactly had much to do with each other. He was raised by his grandparents. Yeah, I know with a devout grandmother, but they got along. But he and his grandmother, have you met her? No, she's dead. She died many years ago now. His grandfather's also dead. So did he go out on the water because I was coming? Sure, that could be partly why, maybe, but he goes on the water no matter what, so. <laughs> I'm sure it's also because I was coming, if I know him at all. He's like that. I don't understand him myself. No, he's just shy, insecure, doesn't think he's worth much, always thinks he's bothering people. Yeah. I feel sorry for him. Yeah. Have you met his mother? Never. He hardly has any contact with her at all. A couple of years ago? Yeah, a long time ago anyway. I don't remember exactly how long ago he visited her and she's called once or twice. That's all. They hardly have any contact with each other. And it's a little sad. She is his mother, after all. I, I don't know exactly what happened. 
the last time they saw each other, but he grew up with his grandparents, with her parents. His father? He's never even seen his father. Never? No. And he doesn't know anything about him. But he said, <laughs> no, nothing. He doesn't know anything about his father. No, nothing, as far as I know. His mother won't say anything, or she really doesn't know anything, or very little anyway. Maybe she doesn't even know who the father is. No, that can happen to anyone. <laughs> but it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's because he grew up with his grandparents near the water. That's why he wants to live near the water. Sure, that's probably why. But you're doing okay? Me? I'm doing great. I just worry a bit, but otherwise, I'm okay. And oh. you? Oh yeah, I'm I'm okay. <laughs> Me too. We have a good life together, my husband and I. Did he drive you here? And he'll be back to pick me up in a couple of hours. He drove into the city, had some errands to run. Yeah. Do you want me to show you the house? Yeah, of course I do. They stand up and walk across the floor. Yeah, we can start in the attic. They go out to the right, and as they do, the older woman comes in from left. She walks and stops in the middle of the floor. And so I walked. Looks towards the door on the right. Around showing my friend the nice old house we bought ourselves. But the whole time I felt this anxiousness. And when we got to the bedroom and I saw his clothes, there they were, folded so neatly in piles. I, I was filled with sorrow again, a heavy and constant sorrow. And my friend must have sensed something because she asked me what was going on. And I, I said it was nothing. And we walked from room to room. And she said she found a nice house, a nice old house as we walked. I felt my anxiety grow and grow. And I, I felt I had to go down to the water. I said to my friend that I'd like to go down to the water. And I said that I could show her the boathouse that came with the house. I said I could show her our dock. At first, she didn't really want to go, said it was raining, too windy. It started to get dark. But I pulled out the rain gear for us, and we went down to the boathouse, down to the dock. And we stood there on the dock, looking out across the water, across the rain and the waves, waves that crashed and crashed. But the boat was nowhere to be seen, just waves that crashed and crashed. And we stood there in the rain, in the rain and the wind, and... Then my friend asked if we could go up to the house again. It was so chilly, she said. And even though I didn't want to go back home, I could easily say that we had to stand there when she wanted to go back home, so we walked back up. And as we walked back up, I noticed that it was starting to get dark. We walked back and came into the house. The young woman comes in from the right. And as we came inside... I was consumed by anxiety, and I went straight over to the window. The young woman rushes over to the window, stops there, and looks out. The young friend stands there and looks towards the young woman. What's going on? Oh, nothing. Yeah, no, I feel he's been gone too long, and now the water is bad. It's getting dark. No, he better come back soon. He'll... Yeah, he'll come back soon now. Don't worry, okay? It's probably just really good fishing out there. Mm. You'll see. <laughs> but I feel anxious. It's getting dark now. I mean, look. She points to the window. And it's raining. Windy. He better come back soon. He's been so strange lately. I'm scared. I can tell something's going on with you. Don't be anxious, okay? It's probably nothing. You'll see. No, maybe not. They go and sit down on the sofa, looking towards each other. It's probably nothing. He'll probably come back soon. But soon it'll be dark, and it's really windy. He'll probably be here soon, too, my husband. Are you going to leave, then? We could wait until he comes back home, if you want. <laughs> But he doesn't want to see people, so maybe it's best for us to leave. No, you have to wait. You can't leave. Don't leave. The older woman goes slowly out to the left, but stands there. No, of course. We'll wait if you want. We're in no rush. 
Footsteps are heard. Maybe he's coming now. Did you hear that? Someone's coming. Yeah. Knocking on the door. Someone's knocking, so it's your husband, I'm sure. Will you go and see? Yeah, it's probably him. Unless Asla is joking around by knocking on the door. Knocking again. Go and see. The young friend stands up and goes out. The older woman and the young woman look towards each other as if they acknowledge each other without seeing each other. Then the older woman goes out to the left and the young woman goes over to the window, stops there, looks out. After a while, the young friend comes in. It was him. The young woman looks towards her questioningly. Yeah, my husband. The young woman nods and then the man comes in from the right. He smiles towards the young woman. Uh, Long time no see. Years and years. Yeah, long time no see. Many years, I think. Yeah, ever since you got together with that uh, Oslo, really. (laughs) And uh, moved out here, we hardly ever see you. You like it out here? Yeah, I can see you've got a fancy house. Nice and big and white. Not bad. You have a boat, too? Yeah, they have a boat and a boathouse, and on top of that, a private dock. Ah, yeah. Then uh, you must have come into some money. But it's not that expensive out here. Everything's cheaper. Yeah, it's not exactly what you'd call central, but isn't it boring to live out here? Definitely nice. Can't deny that. But uh, yeah, nothing really happens out here, though, does it? It's fine. Yeah. Uh, Where are you keeping him? Hmm. Yeah, that husband of yours. He's out on the water. Oh, right now? But it's dark and it's raining. Windy. Yeah, apparently he likes it so much out there on the water. Stays out there all the time, practically, right? It's true, he does. He's... Out there more than he is here, practically. (laughs) He's got a nice boat then, with lights, if that's what they're called. Maybe uh, they're called lanterns? No, I I don't know. I've never been a man of the sea. (laughs) No, you haven't. He calls himself a man of the sea. (laughs) I'm a man of the sea, he says. (laughs) Ah, so he's got a big boat. No. Really? No, just a little wooden boat, a, a rowboat. He'll be coming back soon now. But uh, an outboard motor, he must have one of those. Yeah. Without light, when it's this dark. Hmm. I don't know. But aren't you scared? It's really raining, really windy. (laughs) It's dark, it's dark autumn. Not a light summer evening with calm waters. The young woman goes and sits down on the sofa. The young friend and the man look towards each other. The young friend goes and sits down next to the young woman. I'm sure he'll be coming back soon now. He has to. He can't stay out there on the water in the dark night. He must be coming back soon. Yeah, he has to. He'll come back soon enough. The man goes over to the window, looks out. Don't be scared, okay? We'll have him back here soon enough. You'll see. He's used to being in a boat, so probably nothing's happened to him. Definitely not. Yeah. But he'll come back soon. I know he will. The man walks and stops by the side of the sofa. The young friend looks towards him. Right? Yeah. (laughs) Mm. It can't exactly be fun to be out there on the water when it's (laughs) so dark. And weather like this, I mean, it's quite cold, too, out there now. I got pretty wet. <laughs> and I started to freeze just walking from the car to the house. It was it was damn chilly. No? Looks at his watch and then towards the young friend. But uh, it is getting late. Maybe we should make a move? Yeah, uh, you know, our place isn't exactly central either. In order to have enough to live on, we had to go out a ways. Yeah. That's the way it is. Yeah. We can stay a bit longer. Yeah. Yeah, a bit longer. Okay. The young friend looks down, stays sitting like that for a while, while the young man goes over to the window, stands there looking out. 
The older woman comes in from the left, stands next to the man, looks out too, but he doesn't see or notice her. Maybe. Yeah. No. But is he usually out this long in weather like this? I mean, no, no. The older woman walks across the room and while she does, the man stands still in front of the window and the two women stay seated on the sofa in the same position. Then the older woman stands and smiles gently while looking towards the two women on the sofa. Then she looks towards the man, then looks down and then looks carefully up again. But maybe we should, you know, it could, maybe we should go look for him. The man turns towards the young friend, looks at her, while both the young woman and the older woman look down. Uh, yeah. What do you say? I think maybe we should. Perhaps you could? But where? You, you just go down the road. Yeah, we went down there already, and then... Looks yeah, then, then you just go to the right and, and then take a, 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 the first right down to the water. There's a boathouse, a dock. He nods but stays standing there. Yeah. Yeah. But, I'll uh, stay here. Yeah. Just put something on. <clears throat> yeah, you can use my rain gear. It's hanging in the hallway. He nods, goes out to the right. The young friend stands up, goes over to the window. The young woman stands up, walks a bit across the floor, such that the angle between her, the young friend, and the older woman form a triangle. They stand, they stay standing like this for a while, then the young woman goes over to the window, stops beside the young friend. They'll come back soon. Yeah. And I stood there. And I felt as if I was being emptied out. Placing I, her hands on her stomach. I was emptied. Emptied like the rain and the darkness, like the wind and the trees, like the sea way out there. I wasn't anxious anymore. Now I was vast, empty, calm. Now I was darkness. I was pitch black darkness. Now I was nothing. And at the same time, I felt like I... Yeah, like I was shining deep from within me, from the empty darkness. I felt the empty darkness shining quietly, without meaning, without words. The darkness shone from within me. And I stood there in front of the window and my friend stood there beside me and she didn't know what to say. She just stood there. What else could she do? And time passed, but I don't think I noticed it at all. I stood there looking out at the darkness and the rain, and then... The young friend goes and sits down on the sofa. My friend sat down, but I stayed standing. And I looked into the wind and the rain and the darkness, and the darkness was my face. I don't know how long I stood there, but I stood looking out into the empty darkness, out toward the rain, and I felt like... I couldn't be separated from darkness. And then the young woman opens the window. I opened the window and I could hear the rain and the wind much more clearly. I could feel the darkness much more clearly. And I could hear the waves, hear the waves crash. The waves crashed and crashed. And I stood there listening to the waves crash and crash. And I felt the waves crash through this rain and darkness, which was now me which now would be me forever. It would be me. Now I would be in the shining darkness and the crashing waves. I stood there feeling this. And then I heard my friend say that I shouldn't stand there freezing. I had to come and sit down. I had to come close the window. It was getting cold, she said. You're getting cold. It's freezing, too. <laughs> and I turned to my friend. And I asked if she wanted me to close the window. Do you want me to close the window? 
It's getting a little cold, so if you don't mind, yeah. Of course, I can close it. So I close the window. The young woman closes the window. And then I stood there again, stood there in front of the pitch black window and looked out into the darkness, listened to the rain, listened to the waves. Well, now he's been gone a long time too. Maybe I... Do you want to go look for him? Don't let me stop you. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Yeah, you just go. And so she left. The young friend goes out to the right. And I stood there in front of that window. And after she left... The young woman opens the window again. I opened the window again. And I stood there listening to the waves. I heard the waves crash and crash. I heard the waves crash and crash. And what the waves crashed into, I know this now. It was me. And would always be me. I don't know how long I stood there, but I stood there. I stood and stood and felt that now I was empty. Now I was empty. Like the waves and the darkness, I just stood there. And then I heard footsteps. And then I see my friend come inside. The young friend comes in from the right. No, we haven't seen him. But there's no boat at your dock, so he... Yeah, he's probably still out there on the water. And... Nope, can't see him. And we walked along the road looking out towards the water. Uh, but we didn't see anything. But it really is so dark, so it isn't that strange. But I couldn't hear anything either. No outboard motor anyway. So maybe... Yeah, uh, we talked about maybe uh, someone should maybe, uh, yeah, alert someone. I, I don't know. It is late now and dark and the water's nasty. It's not exactly weather to be out in a boat, especially not in a small boat. Uh, someone with a small boat uh, could, you know, uh, no, no, no I, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe just to be safe and not that anything's necessarily happened, of course, I mean, but. Uh, yeah, I think it'd be wise just in case you don't need to, but uh, it's getting pretty late now. Or what do you think? And you must be cold. You're standing in the draft. The young friend goes over and closes the window, puts her arm around the young woman, takes her over to the sofa, sits her down, then sits beside her. Should I? Yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, what do you think? Yeah, do it. There, there's a phone in the hallway. Just, just call. Yeah. It might be nothing, but it doesn't hurt. I mean, maybe his motor has given out and he doesn't have oars. It could be so many things. Yeah. Or it might be that nothing's happened. Maybe he likes to be on the water in stormy weather. I mean, maybe we shouldn't have called. I don't know. It's probably nothing, but just in case. Yeah. The man comes in again, looks toward them on the sofa. They're coming. Uh, they had a boat, but uh, they want to talk with you a bit, find out a little more. Uh, they're on the phone out there. Uh, in the hallway. They're waiting for you. You have to... The young woman stands up and goes out in the hallway. The man and the young friend look to each other. What do you think? It's really strange, anyway. And she's not saying anything. She's just sitting there, just standing there by the window with the window open, looking out. No, I, I don't... We can't really... No, we can't leave now. <laughs> uh, but I do have to be at work early tomorrow morning. Wait, you can leave. I have to stay. I can't leave now, clearly. I can stay a little longer. Me too. Uh, but it is after midnight already. I can leave early tomorrow morning. I don't know. The young woman comes back in. She goes over to the window, opens it, stands there looking out. The young friend and the man look to each other. Pause. The young friend stands up, walks a bit across the floor. What did they say? They're going out in a boat. Uh, 
to look for him. Yeah, that's good. It might be nothing, but but if it is something, his motor might have given up. Uh, yeah. Can't we go out there, go down to the road? They'll probably come with the boat soon. We've got to go look for them. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. The young woman goes out to the right. We have to stay with her. They go out to the right after her. The older woman, looking after them, walks around the living room for a bit. Yeah, so we went out. We went out into the rain and the wind down to the road, and we walked along the road, looking out towards the water, but there was nothing to see. So we walked, waited, walked some more, and none of us said anything. But then we heard a boat, and then we saw the lights, bright lights that spread across the water, far away, but not too far from shore. Lights spreading farther and farther, yellow light that cut through the pitch black darkness and the rain. Out there in the middle of the waves, we saw the yellow lights moving not too far from the shore, close to land. And then we saw the lights cross the bay. And then the lights moved along the shore, but on the other side. And the whole time, the waves crashed and crashed. The waves crashed and crashed, and the wind blew, and it rained and rained. And the golden lights out there, and all the pitch black darkness, and the sound of the boat. And then a distant voice yelling something indistinguishable. And then the lights are calm. They stand still, shining yellow, in the middle of all the pitch black darkness. And then the lights move again out there on the water. The lights move and they stand still and we stand still. And then the lights move. So we walk along the road and it's raining and raining and no one says anything. And we see the yellow light shining into the pitch black darkness. Lights that are moving constantly in motion, and then the lights cross the water again, come a bit closer to us and stand still. And then something can be seen in the light. Something gray, almost purple, is there in the light. And I think it's a boat there in the light. I, I can't see it clearly, but to me, it looks like a boat. Telephone rings, but the older woman doesn't pay attention, waits until it stopped ringing, and then continues. And the lights continue to move across the waves, across the water. And then my friend asks, can we go back into the house? She's freezing, she says. And I said, she can go ahead. I'll stay here, I, I say. And then her husband says, she can go up, and he can stay here with me, he says. But she says that she won't go without me. And so we stand there. We, we stand there in the rain and the wind. But we stand there watching the light spreading across yellow, across the water, the pitch black waves. And then we see the lights change directions. And then we see the telephone rings again. But still, she doesn't pay attention, just waits until it's finished ringing. Yeah. We see the lights moving across the water further and further out of the bay until we can we can't see the lights at all. We stand there, and then my friend says, now we have to go back up. We can't stay any longer. So we go back up, and she holds my arm, and her husband walks just ahead of us, and no one... The telephone rings again, this time relatively short. She still doesn't pay attention to it. No one says anything, and we walk up to the house. We walk inside. I walk. The young woman comes in from the right, wet to the bone. Inside. The young friend and the, and the man come inside, too. They are also wet. And me... I, I know nothing, because now nothing exists anymore. Now. The young woman walks over and stops in front of the window, looks out, and the older woman walks and stops to the left of the window. She looks down. The window's wide open. It's so cold in here. Yeah. He goes over and closes the window. The young friend takes the young woman by the arm, moves her over to the sofa. They both sit down. The telephone rings. It's ring. You have to get it. You have to get it. It could be. I, I can get it. He hurries out to the right. The ringing stops. Pause. Both the young friend and the young woman sit there looking down. He comes in again. They found a wooden boat. A rowboat with an outboard motor. It was empty, not too far from the shore. It was drifting. There was no one. 
they wonder if <sighs> yeah a wooden boat the man goes out again pause he comes back in stays standing there and looks down long pause as the light is gradually dimmed, the older woman walks forward, stops at the side of the sofa, looks to the young woman and the young friend who are sitting there. Then she looks to the man, gives him a sign that he should leave, and he goes out to the right. Then she looks to the young friend who stands up, and she gives a sign for her to leave as well, and she goes out following the man. And then she goes over to the sofa and sits down, and she and the young woman stay sitting there looking towards each other for a while. Then the young woman stands up. And she also goes out to the right. The older woman stands up, goes over to the window, opens it, then turns around, looking around the living room and begins to collect things and photos together. She stands back, looks at what she's gathered. Then she walks and places herself in front of the window again, looks out. Three, footsteps are heard. The older friend comes in from the door on the right, looks first towards the older woman who is standing there in the window, and then at the things she's gathered together. Are you gathering your things? Yeah, I guess I am. It's just something to do. <laughs> it was nice down there by the water today. Yeah. But he should be here soon. Yeah. In fact, he should have been here already. <laughs> He's in the city, running some errands. Yeah, it's what he does when I visit you. I ride with him, and then he picks me up when he's done with what he has to do in the city. You haven't thought about moving back to the city, I mean. No, we're happy. We live in a small village, of course, but we're doing okay. We've got our own place here, build our own house just like we wanted it. Yeah, but you know how it is. But how can you stand living here alone? Yeah, I don't quite understand it myself. Such an old house. It is old, yeah. And in the winter, it can get pretty cold, but then... I stay here in the living room, and when it's really cold, I sleep here too, with the fire going. You know, it's been so cold that I've I've had to get up in the middle of the night to keep the fire going. Had to set my alarm. You haven't thought about moving back to the city. I have. I think about it all the time, that I really should get out of here. Yeah, but it doesn't. No. And also, yeah, I've lived here a long time, all the memories... Yeah, but well, why have you gathered your things? I don't know. Doesn't it get lonely? I guess I'll stay here. Yeah, we did. It, it does get lonely. And boring. It does. <laughs> off and on, it, it, it gets boring, too. But for the most part, it's actually fine. You should have had a husband. No. No, you like being alone, you say. Yeah. That's good, then. So everything's fine. Yeah. Oh, no, he, he should have been here by now. She goes over to the window, looks out, and then looks towards the older woman. I'm a little cold. Do you mind if I close the window? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. She closes the window. She looks out the window again and then looks towards the older woman. Oh, but I think he's here now. Yeah. Well, I promised I'd meet him outside. I uh, Yeah. I think, yeah, he'll be here in a moment. I think I've got to go out to meet him. Yeah. I, I think so. Okay. Goodbye, then, and take care. We'll talk soon. The older friend goes out to the right. The older woman stands up and goes over to the window, stops there and looks out. The older friend stands, looks to her. No, oh, are you standing there again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't think about it. It just happens. Goodbye. And take care, then. Yeah. Thanks for coming. And don't stand in front of that woman a window too much. Okay? The older woman shakes her head. The older friend goes out to the right, and the older woman stays standing in front of the window looking out. She opens the window. Long pause. Lights down. Blackout. So now we have a little bit of a break again. Um, yeah. Just really quickly, um, 
Thank you so much again for being here. We're going to throw up on the screen just a little bit of documentation from the production in 2012. Um, first, the like climactic moment when the waves actually came. And a little fun fact is that the water that we threw up here on the water on the wall to sim symbolize a window, that is sh footage that was shot by Eric, who is shooting the... Um, so he's our amazing cinematographer who is just doing all that camera work for 36.5, a durational performance of the sea, which is my other project yeah. that I talk about as being um, kind of or how, Fosse, how how working with Yun's text really influenced um, that work moving forward. Um, and oh, and last thing before we break is just that um, the Wilma Theater in Philadelphia is actually doing a production of A Summer Day in no, she she got oh, sick. Right. The person, somebody was supposed to come and talk about it, but she's sick, so she's not here. But we, I'll just give that plug that that is happening. So it's kind of exciting because it's actually like a, a production that's in the regional theater that will happen this coming year. We're hoping many more productions will happen in the future in the next few years. So um, if you can check that out, and yeah. So how long a break should we take now? Should we start uh, at a cool we're supposed to we are supposed to start at 4 30 yeah for the next one maybe 4 30 ish let's say yeah. 4 30 uh so now the the participatory fossil corner will be open for those who would like the experience of reading some yun fossil with mm -hmm. uh so that will now be open all right Woohoo! let's make sure all the mics are
Got another one. So good what? <laughs> yeah, I worked with Sarah. Oh, okay. I worked with Sarah a lot for a while. Oh, okay, so we probably crossed the line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, no one just died. Yeah, huh? you don't have to worry. You, now you can turn it off. Okay, okay. Yeah. just leave it on. Okay. Um, okay. All right, team. Are we all here? I think so. Oh, a few more people coming in. Okay. All right. So we are about to go into Dream of Autumn, where, and first of all, welcome to those of you who have not, there are a few people who have been with us all day. Thank you so much for <laughs> all your amazing attendance. Um, and uh, and then there's some new people. So I'll just s say that, you know, this is a, if you didn't get the memo, this is a sort of workshop space that you are part of. Frank wants to say something. Oh, I'm I'm supposed to introduce the Consul General, the Murray. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm... I love this theme a lot, um, so I'm very excited to be here. And then I will say a few words before the panel discussion, but thank you for organizing all this. Amazing. Um, so definitely, or not, what play are we in? Dream of Autumn. <laughs> Dream of Autumn was produced in Pittsburgh in 2013 um, by Quantum Theater, and it hasn't been done in New York yet. Um, I... I I feel like there might be a production in the future that could happen. Oh, oh. I think Sarah will be doing a production in New York. I think <laughs> you should. Well, we, yeah, there's some ideas. So like one, um, and you know, it's been interesting to go back to this work after so many years of not touching it really, but having it like live in my body. Um, and um and and see where does it where does it live in relationship to my practice now? Um, so I'm I'm interested. We're we're sort of toying with some ideas like maybe it's this returning to this play. Maybe it's looking at one of Jung's newest plays because he's started writing plays again after a ten year hiatus where he was working on his novel, which you may have read, Septology. Um, so anyway, this but one of the ideas for that is actually to examine or to to think about bodies in landscape um in a vast landscape and and to really then and so just to see bodies back at amazing actors who have bodies um to see them at a distance in a very visual way um but then to hear their hear what they're saying very intimately so that's part of why we're experimenting with microphones this whole all day today and because this play takes place in a graveyard, um, what we're going to do for our experiment, there's not going to be video for this one, but what we're going to do is we're going to get the lights really, we're going to go really dark, and we're going to focus on listening. Um, and we hope that you are awake. <laughs> hope you've had some coffee. Um, there is some coffee over there. If you need it, feel free to get up and grab it if you need to. We have extra flashlights if you need them. Um, so the actors are going to have flashlights and um, and we're going to see if we can handle it. If we, it might be too much. We might all start to fall over, but I think it's going to be interesting to actually do this in real darkness. So that's the experiment we're trying Paul's up there making our lights go low. Um, let me introduce 
everyone. Raymond is playing the man. Natalia is playing the woman. Arlene is playing Guri. And David and Lizanne are playing older men and older women. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, is it, or do they say? Mother, father. Mother, father. It's mother, father this time. Sorry, I forgot. Um, okay. So I think, are we all ready? Any questions before we start? Okay, let's do it. Oh yeah, and Xavier's reading stage directions. Right. And I just, okay, cool. Making sure that was on. On a small section of a large graveyard, Late autumn, it has just rained. Dark trees, some leaves hanging low, some lying around, a gravel path, a worn painted bench. A man comes in, walking on the gravel path, goes off the path, over to a tombstone, reads what's written on it, stays standing there, looking towards it, goes to another tombstone, reads what's written on this one as well, stands there for a while looking at it, goes back to the gravel path, goes and sits down on the bench. He looks up and it's possible he has cried. He pulls his coat tight, looks down at the wet gravel. He stands up, opens his mouth, as if to say something, stands there stiffly for a bit, but then closes his mouth and eyes. A pain goes through his face. He opens his eyes, looks out of the corner of his eye into nothingness. And as he stands like that, a woman comes walking in. She sees him, but she tries to avoid his noticing her. She doesn't know whether to run towards or walk past him, hesitates, and he notices her. She looks down. He sits back down on the bench, shy, embarrassed. He looks around towards her cautiously and recognizes her. No. Is it really you? It is indeed. Yeah. She looks down, begins to kick the gravel with her shoe. But that you're here, that, that I would run into you here now, it's unbelievable. No, it's nice. It's been a long time. Yeah. I didn't know you were here in town. I'm just visiting. No, it's nice. Just a short visit. No, it's unexpected. Yeah. It's wild that we'd run into each other like this, yeah? Here in a graveyard? I mean, we haven't really... But that's how it is. <laughs> Very strange. He looks towards the bench. I'm sitting here now, as you can see, quite alone in the dark of autumn. You sit there thinking thinking and thinking. I sit here grieving, maybe. You sit there searching. Yeah, I guess I do. He goes and sits down on the corner of the bench, looks towards her where she's standing, looking down, and again, she cautiously kicks the gravel with her shoe. Do you want to sit down for a bit? Do you, do you have time? Or maybe you don't have time. Maybe you have something to do. Maybe you're in a hurry. But anyway, it was just... Nice to see you again. It's been so long since the last time I saw you, and it was so unexpected that suddenly you'd be standing there when I sat here alone. No, I, I never would have imagined that you'd suddenly be standing there. I can sit for a bit. She goes and sits down on the other corner of the bench. They look timidly towards one another, look down again. Oh, it was unexpected. Yeah. I actually thought about you when I knew I'd be in town, but yeah, we'd never had much to do with each other. And it's been a long time since we last met. And you, you tend to wander around graveyards too. In the summer, lots of people do that, but not so many now in the autumn, in the dark. In no, the almost no one now that it's autumn and rainy. Hey, hey, 
Hey, when I flew in yesterday on the plane, there was, yeah, there was a kid who said up in the plane when we were way up there in the air, we can't see the birds. Isn't that a strange thing to say? And today I was talking to a little girl. She couldn't have been more than two. She showed me her doll. I said, it's a beautiful doll. I asked what her name was. She said the doll's name was Amelie. I said, it's a beautiful name. You know what she said then? She said that all beautiful names are sad. As she says this, she bows her head down low and looks towards him out of the corner of her eye. And he also looks towards her quickly. Then they smile briefly at each other. Beautifully sad. They say so much, little kids. They can effortlessly say what's true. Do you have kids? Do you still live alone? And you still live with your wife and son? Yeah. But why are you sitting here? Oh, I'm just sitting here. Do you come here often? Not very often. In fact, pretty rarely. But it does happen. Do you live nearby? A ways away. But not too far. Did you just end up here? Or did you mean to come here? I just walked and ended up here. Yeah. That was sort of how it was for me, too. You don't usually walk this way? Well, it's happened, of course. I've been here before, but not very often. It's strange that we'd run into each other here. Are you doing okay? Oh, yeah, thanks. I'm serious. Not too bad. I'm not too bad. It's going mostly okay. No, I don't know. And you? I'm okay. The woman shifts as if she's about to stand. Do you have to go? No, not yet. Do you have to be somewhere? Hey. Yeah. No, nothing. Just say it. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that maybe I came here to the graveyard. I mean, so I could run into you. And maybe that's it. They look at each other as if being pulled towards each other, but they resist the pull. They smile quite openly towards each other and become shy again. Maybe. And why did you come here then? Maybe to run into you. That could be. <laughs> Who knows? No, I don't know. That must be why I actually thought about you before I came here. It's true, but of course I've done that before too, but you you haven't come. Is that true? Yeah. They both look down, lean away from each other, staying, sitting like that. Did you think I'd be here? No. Or, yeah, in a way. I did think that. I didn't really think about it consciously, but in a way, I walked, <laughs> yeah, where I knew you'd be anyway. But you didn't think I'd be here. No. Same. Here, uh, once in a while, not very often, but once in a while, I think about you. It's true. I think about you, too. He reaches his arm out abruptly towards her. She reaches her arm towards him, and they quickly and lightly stroke each other's fingers and then take their arms back. They stay seated and locked and look down in front of themselves, embarrassed. The man stands up, turns his back to her, looks at the tombstones, he then goes over to one of the tombstones he was looking at earlier, stops, looks towards it. She looks towards him. You walk around reading the tombstones? Yeah. Doesn't everyone who walks around a graveyard do that? That's what I was about to say. I think everyone does. 
I do, at least. The man nods. She stands up, staying standing, and looks at him. Maybe that's why tombstones are there, maybe. So that we can walk around reading what's written on them and imagine who the deceased might have been. I think they're there so God can remember who's lying there. Hey. They walk closer to each other. Hey, yeah, all the dead. Yeah, the million, billions and billions of people who are dead. Hey, yeah, whenever I'm in a town, when I stand on a high point overlooking a town, you know, I look at house after house, and I think about the people in those houses who live there now, work there now. Yeah, how in a few years, none of them will be there. How in a few years, they'll all be gone, and new people will be there in the houses, in the streets. Little by little, all the people will be replaced with other people. Everyone will be replaced. That's what I think. And if you think back 100 years, or not even, there were completely different people in the town walking through the streets. But the town remains. The houses remain. Yeah, I think that's why I like old houses so much. They take care of those who've been, but who are no longer there in a way, at least. <laughs> that's the way it is. You know, I have had many old houses. You have? Yeah, but I'm not very handy. It doesn't work out with me and my old houses. <laughs> I can't maintain them. I've moved, sold them. You have? Yeah, we have. Woman goes over to him, also looks at the tombstone he's standing in front of, looks towards him. Dorotha von Obstfelder, 1876 to 1903. He goes to the next tombstone. She follows. Knut Hjelmeland, 1959 to 1982. Did you know him? Do you know anyone who's buried here in this graveyard? Yeah. Many? Yeah. I do, but... You don't want to talk about it? She goes over to him, puts her hands under his hands. His arms, they smile at each other. Should we go somewhere to be alone? <laughs> to be alone? Hey. <laughs> My hotel room, maybe? Yeah, I'd like that. Yeah, maybe. Oh, did I say that? <clears throat> Do you want to? Yeah, maybe. No, don't joke. I've always wanted to. But why haven't you said that to me before, I mean? You can't just say things like that. Yeah, but do you want to? I've missed you a lot. I have. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah, I thought maybe I'd run into you when I came out. It's true. I thought that. Seriously, I knew I'd run into you. Isn't that strange? Really strange. Can I tell you something? While I was standing looking at that tombstone over there, before you came, the one with something or other von Obsterfelder on, on it, I, I thought about you. It's really strange. I was standing there missing you. We haven't seen each other in a long, long time. And then we run into each other here in the dark of autumn, in a graveyard. And all this right after I'd been standing there thinking about you, missing you. The woman walks away from him, stops. Sometimes in the evening, when I lie in my bed or on the couch, I feel you there. It doesn't make sense, but still it's how it's not very often anymore Maybe, but once in a while, it's like you're lying beside me and I'm holding you. It's true. I've often wondered if you feel it too, as if you're lying beside me. I mean, you can? Yeah. But it's probably just a feeling, something we imagine if we, you and I got together all that would vanish. Everything would be 
tension and frustration. And after a few years, we wouldn't want to be together anymore. We'd just break up after all, like everyone else. That's how it is. Maybe. Yeah. That's how it is. And that's not how it is, obviously. Maybe. Can I touch you? She goes over and cautiously touches his hand. They look towards each other. Good. Right? My whole body is tingling. <laughs> Me too. But we can't really. She pulls her hand back. He grabs for it. He stands there holding it. We can't really. And soon we'll want to sleep together. To Is it important to sleep together? In a way, it is. But I... I can sleep with whoever I want, as a matter of fact. But that's something else. Yeah, obviously. Because love exists. Maybe. But love, in a way, doesn't care about anything other than itself. It's not considerate. It, yeah, I don't know. If I like love, I think I'm against love. <laughs> love that makes fathers abandon their children. I know I'm against that. But we all die. They take each other's hand, press themselves cautiously against each other, stay standing like that for a while. They let go of each other, walk a little ways away from each other. He looks towards her. I don't have children. I don't have a husband. I am alone. And you know that I... We have to be together. We've known this for a long time. We can't just let time pass. We can't just let the years pass. We've longed for each other for a long time, but neither of us has dared to say it. It's been too dangerous, maybe, but we've felt the same. I've often felt it, too, how it's like you've been lying beside me or me beside you. Even though you weren't there, you've been there. I have felt you. I've known that you were there. Yeah, that's how it is. Maybe. He goes and sits down on the bench. The woman stays standing, then walks out onto the gravel path. He sits and looks down, then looks towards her. I suddenly felt so empty. Almost worn out, completely empty, completely stiff. That's how I felt. She begins to walk around a bit on the gravel path. But you were just sitting here, crying. I saw it. I saw that you had cried. Why were you crying here alone? It doesn't matter. It's just how it is. It's nothing to worry about. He stands up and walks a little bit towards her. And I've got to tell you that I can't stand these feelings. 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 Damn feelings. I hate feelings. And you have your family. Wife. Kid. Yeah, yeah. And yet you sit here, crying alone. No. No, I wasn't sitting here crying. You and what you call love sit here crying. I and what I call love sit here crying. Yeah, exactly. Love and death. So no. that life will go on. So that houses and streets and towns will fill up. So that people will die in fear and pain and despair. So that people will press themselves against each other in passion and pain and fear. And new small people who talk about how beautiful names are always sad will be born in fear and pain and despair. And on top of that, this what we call love will be so irritatingly incomprehensible, so completely impossible to say what it is but that it's there. We can feel it. It is love that we're in. Here we stand alone and together. We both know that, we know it. Maybe it's love that saves the dead, maybe. God's love. I don't know anything about God's love, but maybe, maybe it is God's love, maybe. But then it's, 
the God within us, so to speak, that saves the dead. Maybe so. Or are the dead saved when babies are born? We're just saying things. It's just, it's a joke. Everything we're saying, it's just talk, yeah? Yeah, obviously. But the dead, they are here. They are lying there and... Pointing towards the graves. It's no joke. They have lived, and now they're lying there. Now they're dead. Now there's nothing left of most of them. They were nothing, non-existent in the world. And then there were two people who, however they did it, in a moment of passion and lust anyway, yet there were two people who, maybe there was a man who grabbed her mother in a graveyard, maybe in this graveyard even, and that's how she came into being. A graveyard, really? Yeah, maybe in a graveyard, one dark night, in a graveyard, like this one. Her mother was grabbed. Maybe he pressed himself against her, desperately, pulling her by the arm. She screamed out of fear, out of passion. When he pulled her into him, he lay her down on the hill and he pressed himself into her and he pulled up her skirt. Maybe that's how she came into being. She who's lying there now. Points towards a gravestone. And now there's nothing left of her. Look at her tombstone, but once upon a time she screamed and moaned. Can you hear her? Screaming and moaning. Take me. Take me hard. Take me. She screamed. You might... Be right. And him there. Maybe he was created like this. A young woman, a young man, snuck away during a family celebration. A family celebration? Really? Yeah, during a family celebration in the kid's room. <laughs> in an old upper-class villa not too far from here, they snuck away. It could be. But things were... More conservative back then? Is that what you were going to say? I suppose so. Maybe. Maybe not. He points towards yet another tombstone. But anyway, maybe he came into being after much pain and effort. <laughs> yeah. For a long time, they had tried the father and the mother, the father weary, the mother afraid and stiff, but somehow they got to it. After trying for a long time, and that's how he came into being when uncles and aunts and grandparents and whoever else said that the mother began to show they were so happy, so happy. But everyone was also a little embarrassed because they knew what the mother had done to become like that. They thought about it. They thought it quietly to themselves all the time. They thought about how the respectable mother and the respectable father had done that which can't be talked about. And therefore, maybe the respectable father was not so respectable after all. When it came right down to it, maybe he actually ripped open his fly every single time he had the respectable mother to himself. He ripped it open and pulled out his stiff rod and would make her lick it. No, now that's awkward. <laughs> Oof. Not everything should be said out loud. The worst thing I know is when people are so free and open and they talk about everything. I agree completely. It's terrible. It's always so awkward. It's always so terribly unsexy to talk about sex. Unsexy. Really? Yeah. Sex. What a word. And God is the same. No, come on. I mean it. What do I mean? Or or what do I mean? But the more you talk about it, about sex, yeah? And the more you talk about, yeah, about God, the more what you're talking about vanishes. And in the end, it's just words. There you go again with all that love and all that death of yours. I've missed you. It's true. I've missed you, too. But it's so strange. We don't really know each other, or of course we know each other. I, 
very well in a way we, we know each other very well, right? True. But then again, we don't know each other in the regular way. And so I never would have dared to think that you'd care about me. Not really, anyway. And I suppose you really don't. I miss you. Simple as that. I feel like you're there when you're gone. I feel like you are almost in my body, inside me in a way. I feel like that a lot. But we've never said to each other that we care about each other. We've never said it. But we have known it. At least I have anyway. I wouldn't have dared to think that you cared about me either. I really thought that you had so many other men and I'm nothing special. Yeah, I mean that. I'm I'm not worth much. The one you talked about, the mother of, yeah, was it von Obstefelder? Her, there. Yeah, her with the screaming, the skirt. Tell me more. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, what did I say? That she was taken? Here in the graveyard, maybe? Tell me more. Tell me. No, now you have to choose. Stop it. Yes. Tell me. No. Yes. Can't you just do to you what he did to her? Don't you want to? Do you? Why do it then? Well, you're supposed to do things like that, right? It demonstrates that you belong together. It kind of, right? Well, I don't want to be unfaithful. What do you want then? I don't know. You don't know? No, I don't know. Maybe I want to be with you. Do you? Maybe. And then I'll... You don't have to say anything. No, I don't know. Let's not talk about it. Everything is the way it is. Yeah. But you want the two of us to be together. Don't you? I do. Yeah. So then everything else isn't that important? Yeah. Your job, everything, isn't that important? Yeah, I guess that's the way it is. He walks yeah. over to a tombstone, stops and looks at it. He straightens some withering flowers standing in front of the grave. He brushes away some leaves. All beautiful names are sad. The man goes over to yet another grave, touches the stone, and then looks down at the uncovered dirt. We can't see the birds here, high up in the sky. Looks towards the stone, reading. You, my love. I am alone. Completely alone. Goes over to a white cross that's standing on a mound of dirt, reads the name. Ida Gentoff. I am alone. And I will be your love. I don't know. Do you want to die? Often. And I should tell you that often when I want to die, I think about you. Sometimes I feel you there. Sometimes I feel nothing, and that's when you're not there. But you're often there. And I want to die more often when I feel you there than when you're not there. Walks to the gravel path, walks around a bit. This is pretty crazy. We met here completely by chance. We've met before as well, yeah? I am married. I am faithful. I have a kid I want to take care of. Yeah, I know. I know all that. I love my wife. I have loved her. Yeah, the same way I can love you now. I'm alone. I miss you. Everyone is alone. Not you. I am alone. Everyone is alone. Everyone is alone. She begins to walk across the gravel path away from him. Are you leaving? No, don't go. Come. He goes after her. They stand looking towards each other. Then... They get closer to each other, press themselves into each other. Then they turn and walk or walk out hand in hand in the opposite direction. And they both look like they are about to laugh. 
Just then an old woman in mourning clothes, the mother, comes into the graveyard. She's carrying a wreath. She walks forward and short steps, stops, looks in the direction that the man and the woman left. Now you have to come back. You can't go. You can't just vanish. An old man in mourning clothes, the father, comes walking in along the gravel path, following the mother. Think about me, about your father. Come back. You can't vanish. You can't. Don't forget us. Come back. Come back. You can't go. The father catches up to the side of her, puts his arm around her shoulder. No, no. Don't take it like that. It's not like that. But he... He's walking straight into his own death. Don't you see him? Don't you understand what's happening? He'll die. He'll die here right in front of our eyes. He's walking away from everything, from his whole life, from everything. He's walking straight into his own death. He can't handle it. He'll vanish. No, it's not like that. It's not like that? No, it's not like that. It's I can see it clearly. There's no doubt about what's happening. You've got to understand, even you. You won't be able to handle it. I don't understand what you're saying. We are here because my mother will be buried. She is dead. That's why we're here. But don't you understand anything? I saw him go. Your son, our son, walked over, over there. And he's never coming back again. The father moves her slowly over to the bench. They sit down. He takes the wreath sits there holding it in his lap. She puts her hands up in front of her eyes. It's not like that. But I saw him. Did you see him? She points to where the man and the woman disappeared. I saw him walking over there. I saw him vanish. Didn't you see him? No, I didn't see him. Can't you take it easy? It's not like that. It, was, it wasn't him. <sighs> But if he doesn't come soon, he has to come to the burial of his own grandmother. He'll come. It's just that we're early. He'll come. Do you think she'll come too? Who? His girlfriend. His death. Is she coming? I don't know what you're talking about. I think she'll come. Yeah, yeah. The father stands up, puts the wreath on the bench, walks over to a tombstone and looks at it. The same one the man first stood and looked at. The mother turns around to look at him. Come here. Sit down here next to me. Don't stand there. The father comes back. It said something about Van Obstvelter on the tombstone. Aren't you scared? No. Not at all. No, I'm not. I saw him. He was with a woman. I didn't see anyone. Just take it easy. He'll probably come soon. He and his wife will come. Of course he'll come. To the burial of his own grandmother. I saw him with a woman. It wasn't his wife. Yeah, yeah. Are you scared? No. Not at all? No. <sighs> Stands up, almost yelling towards the place where the man and the woman walked out. Did you come and sit down here next to me? Do it now. Takes her by the arm. No, you sit down. Take it easy. <laughs> but turn around. Look, he's coming. He and that woman. Doesn't turn around. No, you sit down now. Can't you look? Just take it easy. But he said that he'd come when you talk to him on the phone. He'll come. It's his grandmother who will be buried. He'll probably come. Yeah, we're just early. <laughs> I'm so scared. Don't be scared, okay? We are old, too. Yeah. I'm scared that you will die and leave me. I'm so scared to be alone, and I'm, I'm scared for him, for what will happen to him. I know he's going to die. We all die. But the years have gone by so fast. I don't feel like it's been that long since we met each other. Where have the years gone? Time just passes, the days, the weeks, the months, the years. Everything just vanishes into nothingness. And nothing is constant. Everything is shifting like the clouds. A life is a sky full of clouds before it gets dark. Yeah, I'm so scared what's happening to him. Just take it easy. When the burial is over, you'll feel better. That's because then I won't think about everything actual how I won't think about everything actually is. 
Usually everything just moves forward without stopping, without our noticing. But always, I'm always scared. Deep inside, I am scared. Yeah. But what can we do? Did you see him? Yeah. You're sure? Yeah. Over there. And he was with her, with that new girlfriend of his or whatever he's calling her. Yeah. She's probably not coming to the burial. She wouldn't want to see us. And she never even met grandmother. Hmm. So why would she want to come to the burial? No, she's probably not coming. But he's coming. He said that he'd come when I talked to him on the phone. Yeah. He's coming. But she's probably not coming. Since she's never even seen our home, then I wouldn't think she'd come to the burial of his grandmother either. But Gree and Gata, they're coming. I talked to Gree. What'd she say? She said that she and Gata, Gata would be come. And he also said that he'd come. Yeah, he and, and my mother were always so close. He's coming. He said that, but I don't know now. We're early. Yeah. I'm scared. Just take it easy. Yeah, I'll try. Yeah, it's probably for the best. The grandmother's dead? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the mother takes the wreath, puts it in her lap. The father stands and looks down. And from far away, the man and the woman come walking in hand in hand, wearing their normal clothes. She lived a long life. Yeah. And we have, too, lived a long life together. The years have gone by so fast, incredibly fast. The man and the woman stop, stand and look at each other. Then they wrap themselves around one another, press themselves into each other. The father goes over to a tombstone, stops there looking towards it. The mother looks towards the man and the woman. To the father. But can't you see? The father doesn't react, just stands there looking towards the tombstone. The mother stands up and with the wreath in her hand, she looks towards the man and the woman who are holding each other. Then she turns towards the father. But don't you see? He is standing there. It's him standing there holding her. The father doesn't look up. The mother begins to walk over towards the man and the woman. She goes and puts her hands on his shoulders, shakes him a bit, and he looks towards the woman, the mother, surprised. No, but it's really you? The man and the woman let go of each other. Yeah, it's me. I was sitting on the bench with your father. You didn't notice us. And over there is your father. You see him? It was nice of you to take the time to come to the funeral, to the burial of your grandmother. Yeah, of course. I had to. It's my grandmother, after all, who will be buried. You've been sitting there on the bench, your father and I, for a while. I saw you standing here, and I thought, I... Yeah. You're early. You too. Yeah? But you two... haven't said hello to each other yet. So you didn't come alone? No, she... she's with me. You two haven't met each other yet, but now you finally get to meet. Yeah, you should have met earlier, but yeah, it just didn't happen. You should have perhaps met under happier circumstances, but yeah. Well, it's good that you came. You and your grandmother were so close when you were little. Can't we go sit down? Of course. On the bench over there. But is there something wrong with sitting on that bench? No, no. The mother begins to walk towards the bench. She sits down where she was sitting earlier. With the wreath in her lap, the man and the woman stay standing. We have to go sit down. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Come on. We do have to. Yeah, please come sit down. Can you come? Can you stay with me? We'll go sit down and you can sit and next to me. Come on. Yeah, come on, please. 
Can't you come? I don't know if I should be here. Come on. I don't know. Come. Yeah, come on. Begins to walk towards the bench. The woman stays standing there. He stops, looks towards her. You have to be with me. The woman walks slowly towards him, and he takes her by the hand. They go hand in hand over the bench. They sit down. He is the closest to the mother. The woman is tightly next to him. Yeah, well, your grandmother is gone. Yeah, it's sad. And today she'll be buried. She had a stroke, and nothing could be done. Nothing. The people at the hospital, yeah. She was sent to the hospital. Thought it'd be best to do nothing. Just let everything take its course. Yeah. It'll be the right thing to do. It was a powerful stroke. Very powerful. Yeah. It's like that. It is terrible, obviously. But, but she did live a long time and she was healthy her whole life. It was only in these last few years that her, her health went downhill. You can't ask for much more. No. You were with her when she died? Yeah. We got the call in the evening from the nursing home. They sent her to the hospital. We left immediately. And she died that night. We were there. Both your father and I. As the father's name is spoken, he turns around and looks towards the bench. It happened so fast. Was she scared? Yeah. I suppose she was. But she wasn't completely withered, but she knew what was going on. She couldn't talk, but I'm sure she heard everything that was said. I saw it in her eyes. But it went fast. The father begins to look at the tombstone again. Walks further away. Looks at the tombstones. I... She actually had a stroke a number of years ago, too. A long time ago. A number of years ago, yeah. But she came around afterwards, after the stroke. She even learned how to talk again. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. At first, she couldn't talk. But after a few hours, she gradually began to talk again. First simple words, then complete sentences. And after that, she talked just like she always had, almost. You almost couldn't tell the difference. Imagine learning all that again, as old as she was at the time. But right after the first stroke, she couldn't talk at all. Not one word. Just a few sounds, a few meaningless sounds. Then she gradually started talking again. Yes. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. <laughs> you remember? You remember it, yeah. I know you're busy with your own things. It's not that... But once in a while, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean. I'm, I'm here for your, her burial, at least. Yeah. You don't have to say that. But you could have visited us. You haven't been home in a number of years. It's like you're dead. We're dead to you. Yeah, I've thought a lot about how we should visit you. It's not that. It's good that we're finally getting to meet your new wife. Yeah. How was Gree, by the way? Gree? Yeah. Probably fine. I don't know. I, I never talk to her anymore. You haven't talked to her in a long time. No. No. I guess that's how it is. But it's going well, as far as I know. She came to visit us. Not too long ago. She visits you? Yeah. Once in a while? She and Gata, the two of them visit us, just like before. And why shouldn't they? No, why not? It's really nice to keep in touch, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. Not too long ago. She and Gata came over, actually. Recently? Yes. It was a weekend just a couple of weeks ago. I called her, obviously, to tell her that grandmother died. She said she wanted to come to the burial. She's coming to the burial? Yeah, she said so. Yeah, of course she should come. She said she'd come, yeah. Yeah, so how's it going with her then, since you've talked to her, I mean? Well, I think it's going okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, obviously she should visit you as much as she wants. That's up to her, isn't it? And up to you too. Yeah, she visits us once in a while, but not very often. But you know that, you must know that. Once in a while she visits us. She's done that ever since you got divorced. But you know that. And I'm glad she visits us. The woman looks towards the father and he begins to walk towards them. The father and mother look towards each other. Then they quickly look down. Yeah, of course. I have nothing against it. I guess it's okay. It seems like you think that I don't like it. I have nothing against it. Quite the opposite. I think it's good that she visits you. She does visit us. More often than I do. Yeah, she does. Yeah. You, you haven't come to visit us in a number of years. You've never gotten to meet your new wife. You never actually visited us. I mean, our ex-daughter-in-law visits, visits us far more often than our own son, and she... Calls more often than I do. I just want to go to my grandmother's burial. The father comes over to the bench. He stops next to the bench, stands there looking down. Yeah, well, that's something. <laughs> We've always liked her, but you know that. It's very hard for us when you decided to get divorced. It was really very hard. It was terrible. It was. It's grandmother who will be buried today? Yeah. Let's talk about something else. And grandmother, she was pretty old, but it's sad anyway that's, that she's gone. Yeah. She got old. Yeah. Yeah. She got old. Yeah. Really old. And even more incredible than that is the fact that you are 40. This is unbelievable. Yeah, it is. But it's so nice to finally see you again. It's been so long. It's been years and years since the last time I saw you. The grieve visits you often. Not really often, but she comes by. She drives in that old car of hers. She and Glutta. It was you who bought that car, wasn't it? It's still running, that car. Yeah. Here's... You two have to meet. This is his new wife. Yeah. Now you finally get to meet. The father nods, reaches out with his hand, and the woman stands up and she and the father shake hands. They stand, they stay standing next to each other. The mother then reaches her hand towards the woman without standing up, and they shake hands as well. Yeah, it's about time we got to meet you. Yeah. I've already said this to him. You took a visit us once in a while. Yeah, of course. We've thought about it a lot, but it just hasn't happened. Yeah. This, this is so sad. Yeah. But she was pretty old. Yeah, not that it matters, but. It's really incredible. We, we were just talking about that, about how fast time passes. And now Gota's almost grown up to her. And Gota, he comes over. Yeah. He comes to visit us not too long ago. And he's actually old enough to get married. He is now. You could say he's almost 20. It's really unbelievable. Yeah. Gota and his mother actually come to visit us not too long ago. Came to visit us not too long ago. But before that, it had been a long time since we'd seen him. He's doing okay, Gota? As far as I know, he is. Yeah. But it hasn't been easy for him either. He seemed a little tired, a little worn out, sort of. Gota, the last time I saw him, I was a little worried. What has he done since graduation? Not much. But that doesn't necessarily... 
The woman who stands there cautiously kicks the gravel. And your work is going well? Oh, yeah, thanks. Her work is going well. The man goes over to the woman, puts his arm around her shoulders. It's mostly okay. With your work too? Yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah, everything's just fine. With me too. Except that it's sad today, I guess. No, I don't know, really. But she was old. And time does go by incredibly fast. The years just vanish. It's, it's incredible how fast time passes. Yeah. Yeah. Our grandchild, Gota, is almost old enough to get married now. <laughs> now, that'd be crazy. He must have the sense to not get married yet, right? <laughs> Yeah, you could say that. Something he didn't have. No, he was pretty young to become a father. Very young. But the marriage didn't work either. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, he was quite young to become a father. She stands up, puts the wreath on the bench, walks over to the man and the woman. I can remember the first time they came to our house, the two of them. Yeah, his wife, Gree. She was almost due. She looked like a young girl, practically, but with a huge belly. He didn't look very old either, to tell the truth. Just a kid. That's what he looked like. And really, that's what he was. Yeah, it's so strange to think about. It's so long ago now. I have a picture. About to take something out of her pocket, but she stops. Do you want to see? No, obviously not. I should have asked. That wasn't very thoughtful of me. Yeah, he was young to become a father, very young. Just a kid himself. But you weren't married before. No. And you don't have kids. No. Yeah, he was so young. Cree. And he was so young when she got pregnant. But it worked in a way. It did, didn't it? Everything works. If it has to work. But I don't think it's good to have kids when you're so young. No, it's not good. I don't believe that either. But she's done a good job, Cree, and taken good care of Gota. Yes. I have to say. Yeah. Done all right. Yeah. 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 I don't know if I should... No, stay here a bit. Talk with me a bit. Yeah. Now tell me. Yeah. Come here. We can... Sit down and talk a bit. Get to know each other. Yeah. The woman walks over shyly and sits down on the bench. The mother also walks over and sits down, picks up the wreath and puts it in her lap. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice of you. Now you and I can finally get to talk a bit. We have to get to know each other. We should have met under happier circumstances, but that's how it is. But it's nice to finally meet you. You're early, you too. Yeah. Yeah, we, we were too. Yeah, we've thought about visiting you, but it just hasn't happened. But you haven't dressed up. You're wearing your everyday clothes. It's just how it is. Yeah. It's good to see you. Yeah. And it's nice that you wanted to come to your grandmother's funeral. Wanted to come to grandmother's funeral. You never met her, did you? It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. The man walks out across the graveyard a ways and the father calls out to him. Why haven't you changed your clothes? But it, it's, it's really nice of you. 
to show up for the burial anyway. And, and you have to come over and you have to come visit us. The father stands there for a while looking down. Then he looks up towards the man who is standing looking towards a tombstone. Then the father walks out into the graveyard and both of the, both the man and the father walk around looking at tombstones. We've talked about it a lot, about visiting you, but it just hasn't happened. I guess not. But thank you for the card you sent me, the one with the picture from Rome. Yeah, I could tell it wasn't his handwriting. I'd have recognized it. I guess, I guess you were the one who wrote it. You were in Italy. Yeah, you must remember because you were the one who wrote the card. Don't you remember? No, you can't go around remembering everything, can you? And now... You're early. You too. Yeah. Yeah. You have to come to visit us. Maybe we can go on a hike together. We have a boat, and so you can fish too, if you want. Once we get this burial over with. <laughs> yeah, it's an awful thing to say, but... Yeah. She was old and sick, his grandmother. And it was good for her to die. I know it. Yeah. Yeah. It's awful how time passes. Not long ago, he was a little boy, our son, a little boy jumping from rock to rock on the shore, a little beach bum, that's what we called him. Well, he, he loved to go fishing, he did. But he was a kid. He and his father would go fishing all day long until it got dark. They'd be out on the water. Yeah, he's told me. And we still have a boat. But it stays in the boathouse year-round. You could take it out if you wanted to. The last few years, it's been pulled out. It hasn't been pulled out at all. And we're starting to get old, his father and I. Or when I think about... No, it's nothing. No. I don't know. Do you like being on the water? No, not particularly. <laughs> Me either. The mother stands up slowly, holding the wreath in one hand, and the man's turn. Yeah, yes. it was nice getting to talk with you a bit. Yeah. The mother looks towards the man. They look towards each other. Then he looks down, turns away. The father sees the mother and the man are looking towards each other. Then he walks out slowly. Yeah, it was. Yeah. We were too early. Yeah. But your parents, they're doing okay. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Everything's okay with them? Yeah. We never actually met them. But maybe they're not that old, your parents. They're healthy? Yeah. My mother was on sick leave for a while, but now she's back at work. She's healthy again now. Yeah. The mother sits down again on the bench, stays sitting there with the wreath in her lap. She looks towards the woman. The man begins to walk towards the mother and the woman. Yeah. I have to say, I'm glad I finally got to meet you. Yeah, the occasion should have been better, but I'm glad anyway that you wanted to attend the burial of his grandmother. Yeah. Yeah. It's quiet here. We've been talking. Right? Yeah. I've told her everything about you now. Everything she needs to know, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's nice that I finally got to meet her. I've told her, even though the occasion could have clearly been happier. I just told him that his first wife visits us quite often. I think I, um... Cuts her off by putting her hand on her thigh. No, sit a little longer.
Okay. Ray, we're on 67. Apologies, Island. You're good. Left side, right side, sorry, middle of the page. Top right. Yeah, well, it's quiet here. Uh, next page. I think I've got some, I apologize. You're good. Yeah. Uh, what's the cue? Find it. No, sit here a little longer. Sit a little longer. Okay. Where did father go? Now, who knows? And, and, and Gott is doing okay. Yeah, as far as I know, you know, I was as old as he is now when he was born. I'll be a great grandmother soon. <laughs> no, no, he can't be that old. I'm not that old yet. <laughs> no, he's got better sense than that. But, uh... No, you don't say. He's only 19. 19, yeah. No, it's nice that I finally got to meet you. And now that you've been introduced, you can get together more often. You have to come visit us in the summer at least. Yeah. It's really nice to finally see you, get to meet you. I've thought about you so much. You know that? I think I... Hey. I, I think I... Yeah, yeah. But after the burial, we'll talk more. Yeah. Do you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> Can we go for a walk? Yeah. It was nice that I finally got to say hello. In any case, you have to visit us in the summer. And if you like to swim, there's a nice beach just down from our house. In the summer, you can swim there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and you do like to swim, right? Oh, yeah. I did like to swim, at least. <laughs> and you can go hiking if you want. We've talked about that. Ah, you and Gotta always went hiking together. You go on long mountain hikes. Yeah. Every summer, when Gotta was little, they go hiking together. Yeah, they did. Got up early in the morning before any of the rest of us were up, and they'd head out. Yeah, yeah. And wouldn't come home until late at night. That's if you didn't spend the night in the mountains, right? Oh, yeah. And Gree and I. Would be scared, sitting at home, waiting, getting scared. <laughs> yeah, that's how it was. And Gout is doing okay. So, so, I don't know. I, As I've said, I think he's okay. He didn't do very well in high school. No, strictly speaking, he didn't. But he got through it, in a way. Should we go? No, stay here with me. I think about Gota a lot. I think I'll walk around and look at the graves. She goes. The man stands there looking in the direction of the woman's exit, while the mother looks at him overtly. When you talk, it's like you want to blame me all the time. Or her, because, yeah. Can you give it a rest? I can't handle it. She's never met you before, and this is the first time she's dreaded it, and you act like this? It's terrible. Yeah? We are grown-ups. Gota is grown up. I know. You've said it every time we've talked on the phone that you think it was terrible of me to divorce Gray. The father walks in slowly, stops, looks towards the mother and the man, stands there and looks down. I know it. I know. But can't you... For her, her sake, stop it? Or don't you understand anything? This doesn't work. It's fine that you don't like her. Fair enough. You don't like me. Fair enough. Fine. Fine. But should we get together, as you say, or shouldn't we? Should I attend the burial of my grandmother, or shouldn't I? Should we go away? Don't you understand anything? I haven't said anything. Not one bad word. No, not said, maybe. Not said, but you're saying it all the time anyway. Yeah, there we have it. There 
We have it. Soon you'll probably start talking about father, about how he cried like a child every morning, talking about how terrible he thought it was that we got a divorce. You don't say a single word without blame. I don't understand. That's not what I meant. I'm just very glad to finally see you again. Yeah, of course I don't like it that you got divorced, but you know that. Yeah, okay. He looks around and he walks very quickly across the graveyard in the direction that the woman went out. The mother stands up, stands there holding the wreath in both hands. She looks at him and watches him go. Did you come here? Be with me for a bit. The father begins to walk towards her, and she walks towards the father. They meet, and she reaches one arm towards him, and he takes her by the hand. Yeah, now it's probably almost time. They left. The two of them just left. No, they just went for a little walk. He wants to attend grandmother's burial, doesn't he? Of course he does. He's going to die. I know it. He'll die. He left. I know he's going to die. He and that woman, it's death. She is death. I know it. I see it. No, just take it easy. <laughs> she is a normal woman. Maybe. But he is dying. I can't think. I don't understand much, but I know that he went to die. Don't you get it? No, just take it easy now. He left, and I'll never see him again. I know it. We have to go soon. It's time. We have to go. Stan's looking in the direction that the man went out. Let go of the father's hands. But go get them. Ask them to come back. They have to attend a few burial. They do. Don't you understand? So go. Hurry up. You don't understand anything, do you? Take it easy. They'll come. They will. They must be here for the burial. They, they, they must. Why else would they be here? He was just here. He wasn't coming for the burial. He was just here by chance with her. Yeah. They hadn't dressed up for a burial. They were just here completely by chance. We? No, it's not like that. It's like that. So go, hurry up, go get them. No, eh, it's not like that. Come on, take my arm and we'll go. We have, we have to go. It's time. The mother takes the father by the arm. He takes the wreath from her, carries it in front of him, and they walk slowly on the gravel path. Are you leaving? Yeah, you have to come now. It's time. There you are. Now you have to come. Yeah, we're coming. The father and the mother stop. The man runs back out again. See? He is here, he's coming. The man and the woman come in walking, holding each other's hands. Yeah, now you have to come. Now, now it's urgent. Yeah, come on. My mother is getting very cook. Come on. The man and the woman look down, go towards the mother and the father, who turn around and start to walk forward. The man and the woman walk behind them. Gree, who is also in the morning clothes, comes walking in directly towards them on the gravel path towards the mother. Look, here comes Gree. So Gree is coming. Oh, that's so nice. Gree stops, stands there, and waits for them. The mother and the father reach her, then stop. It's good that you came. Yeah, I'm coming last minute, I know. Is something wrong with Goethe? We can talk about it later. What is it? Not now. Say it, what is it? There's nothing wrong with Gote, is it? Is there? Now we have to go. It's time. He's in the hospital. Tell me. Can't you tell me what it is? He was admitted last night. Is it something serious? Probably. It's not serious, is it? It is. The mother and the father start to leave. The man puts his arm around the woman and she leans into him. Guri comes over to them, stops, so... She's completely up in the man's face. He might die. Can't you go, vanish? It's not your grandmother. It's my grandmother. Get away. Go. Get away. No, don't go. You have to stay with us. Can't you tell me what's wrong with Goethe? Tell me, what is it? I have to wait. 
We have to go. We're going to the burial. Yeah, come on. We have to go. The father, the mother, and Greece start to walk ahead. The man and the woman stay standing there looking towards each other, and she frees herself from his arm and steps backwards. Come, we have to go. We can't stay here. We've just run into each other, and it's like we've always been here, as if we've known each other a long time. What is it? Where are we? And you won't die. You're alive. We've just found each other, and you're alive. Come. I'm alive. We we're just going to the burial of my grandmother. Come on. The mother and the father angry stop. Now you have to come. Yeah, come on. Doubted is in the hospital. I have to go to him. I can't be here. Yeah. If you think it's best, you should, you, you should just go to him. I think I do. The woman walks over to the bench and the man stands there watching her. We have to go. The mother and the father walk along the gravel path. You can't go. I can't stay here. You don't care about anything. Gout is lying in the hospital, and you don't care about him. There's nothing you care about. You don't care. She turns, runs after the mother and the father. When she reaches them, the mother takes Gree by the arm. They walk out slowly. The woman sits down on the bench. Long pause. The man walks over to her, stops next to the bench. Can I sit down next to you? Yeah, you might as well. I'm allowed? You might as well. The man sits down and the woman puts her arm on his shoulders. And so here we are again, on our bench, you and I. Yeah. But it's so long ago. This is where we ran into each other. Where we got together, it was here. Yeah, it was indeed. Now you have to come! Come on, and we'll just sit there. Come on, we can't wait any longer. It is time. Oh, please, come. The father leads her out. It's so you, long ago. Don't you want to attend the burial? So long ago, so very long ago. Everything is so long ago, so very long ago. Everything is long ago, so very long ago. And so much has happened. Everything has happened. And nothing. So much has happened. Yeah, we have done a lot together. You and I. And we've stayed together. Through thick and thin, we've stayed together. You and I. You and I. And who would have thought? Not me, anyway. It's been a lot. We've settled down and traveled and moved. We've lived and struggled. We've been for and against each other, but we've stayed together, you and I. We have stayed together. And it's been a lot. But nothing can be said. Everything just happened. And once said, nothing remains. But we've been together. Like the wind and the waves. Like the wind and the waves. Hey. She takes off her jacket, puts it on the bins. She looks towards him mischievously. I... She takes off her sweater. I want the two of us no, to... No, not now. Yes, now. Right now. Here. Right now. Now? No, can't you stop it? No. Stop it. No. Why do you have to? I want to. Not now. Yes, I want to. I don't feel like it. Do you have... Do you have to? Not now. Don't say anything. I don't want... I don't... I don't want any more. I, I want to be alone. Don't joke. You don't mean it. Because I want to be your dog. Go. I don't want to. Don't joke. I want to lick you. Can I be your dog? Can I lick you? I don't want to. Yes, you do. I want to be your dog. She gets down on her knee. I Why want it? it. I want to be alone. I want you to take me. No. Don't lie. I know you too well. No. I can't deal with you anymore. Don't lie. I know you too well. She grabs hold of his pants legs. I want you. Can't you take me? Take me. Not now. I don't want you. I can't deal with you anymore. I've never liked you. I can't stand you. Take me. Use me. Take me. Use me. 
takes off her hair. Leaning her head back, she opens her mouth, sticks out her tongue. I don't feel like taking you. Take me. She grabs his belt, presses her face towards his crotch. I can't deal with you anymore. Take me. I can't be with you any longer. I want to be alone. Releases her hold of his belt, falls down on her knees, looks towards him. She takes one hand down between her legs, strokes up and down between her legs. He stands and looks towards her out of the corner of his eye. Can't you come? You have to take me. I want you to take me. Come. Come and take me. Take me. I don't want you ever again. Don't say that. You have to. You have to. The man goes over and presses her down on her back, lays himself on top of her. She crawls away. No, no, you can't do that. Not here. I didn't mean it. I was just kidding. You can't do that. Not here. You can't. Why do we keep going on like this? What do we want? Why is it like this? I don't get it. What are we doing here? Why are we here? You must never leave me. I will never leave you. You will be with me. We'll always be together, always together, you and I. She puts her hand on his crotch, holds it there, moves her hand away. Can we sit down? The woman nods. They go and sit down on the bench. She takes his hands, places them on her crotch, holds her hand over his. Aren't you cold? No, not, not too cold. You should put on your sweater and your jacket. Yeah. We should go home. We don't have a home. No? We can go to my hotel room. Okay. Yeah. But shouldn't you go home to your wife, to Gree? Isn't that her name? Oh, yeah. Gree? Yeah. No. I have no place to go. I will be with you. You and I. We'll be together. True, we will. Maybe you can live in my hotel room. Or we can get a double room. We can try to see if you could stay in my room if we can get inside without being seen. We can do that. We'll do that. And then when we're in the room, we can be naked. I can get naked for you. Not completely naked. Almost naked. Almost naked. <laughs> and then you have to take me. I don't know if I want to take you. You are the most beautiful thing I know. So I can't take you. That's exactly why you have to take me. No, I, I won't. Or we can just take our clothes off, lie there, and be warm and safe next to each other. Yeah. And then we can do whatever we want, if we want. If not, we won't do anything. But... Yeah, if you don't want to, then you don't need to. It's that simple. Agreed. Everything is a game. And everything is something serious. Everything is a serious game. Oh, you're smart. Everything is a serious game. But behind that... Behind that, there's nothing. And then the light. The light. Hey, but... Yeah, isn't the light there in the other part, too? In the serious game, I mean? But... What, what do you mean, but? But can't you take me? I want to be taken, and then you have to say that I'm not worth taking. <laughs> Maybe later. <laughs> not now, not here. Don't you love me anymore? I hate you. Maybe I hate you. Why? Because, because. You love me and hate me. Yeah. You are a dog. And you are my man. Not just that. You are a dog. I am a dog. I am also a dog. Death. <laughs> Death and love. <laughs> it's not the same. No, nothing is the same. And everything is the same. Was that what you were going to say? <laughs> that was it. She kisses him abruptly on his chin, puts on her sweater. You're freezing. Yeah, it's pretty cold. I'm a little freezing, yeah. Puts on her jacket. They both sit down on the bench together. Now, a ways away from each other.
I can tell that you don't love me anymore. I do love you. I'm just tired. The first years, you loved me then. But isn't it always like that? I suppose so. And I do love you, even if I don't love you as much as I did at the time. When we went to sleep in my hotel room. Wait, remember? Remember how you couldn't come in? How the receptionist came running after us shouting, no, no, this is not okay. And how you had to wait in the reception area while I went to get my things. And so we went to another hotel, got a room for two. Remember? Yeah, yeah. And so we lived there for a few days. And then you came with me, moved into my apartment. Remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you didn't want to live there. It was like you couldn't just move into a place with the table already set. Like you said, you said that with the table already set. And so we had to move. And so we bought ourselves an old house. <laughs> you and your old houses. And so I lost all of my old friends. And I lost all of my old friends. And so we sat there then in our old house. And we're still sitting there, aren't we? Oh, yeah, we are indeed. And remember when you met my parents the first time? Yeah, as if. At my grandmother's burial? Yeah, don't talk about it. No, it was awful. But it ended with neither of us going to the burial. <laughs> I started to argue with my mother, and so we just left. And since then, neither of us, neither of us have seen my parents. And now your father is dead. That's sad to think about. We actually could have gone to his burial. Yeah. But now it's too late. To think that we just left. Didn't stay for the burial of your grandmother. She would have understood, grandmother. It's too bad that I never got to meet her. And that's when you also met my first wife. Yeah, I did. Can't we go? We can't stay here any longer. I'm freezing. We have to go. Can't you sit closer to me for a bit? She moves over to him and he puts his arm around her shoulders. There's been a lot. But we've stayed together. Who would have thought? No, I bet you didn't think I'd stay. Okay. Yeah. I guess I didn't. Or when I think about it, I did know that you'd stay with me. But what about all the other women? You haven't been faithful. Oh, really? And yet you have been, in a way. I suppose I have, yeah. Faithful in death. Makes more sense than you think. That they're... No, don't joke. Come, let's go to our house. Let's get over to our old house. It is a nice house. Nice and cold. Come on, old man. I'm coming. Have you become so old that you don't feel like standing up? I don't know. <laughs> I can't deal with the old house anymore. We have to sell the house. We can talk about that later. Not now, because you've been saying that for as long as we've had the house. Buy an old house, sell an old house. Don't you have anything else to occupy yourself with? Come on, you and your old houses. Old houses, always old houses. Come. I'm getting a little scared. I don't know, but I suddenly got so scared. It's something... What is it? I'm, I'm getting so restless. It's something. What is it? You can't vanish. You have to stay with me now that you and I have found our way to each other. You can't vanish in front of me. What is it? I'm so scared. It's not anything. Nothing. Don't be scared. It's something, and I don't know what it is. I am so scared. It's nothing. Come on, let's go. Can't we go? I want to go look at grandmother's grave. I want to visit her grave. No, come on. Can't we do that? Another time. Not now. I'm so scared. You can't vanish from me. Now that I finally found you. Can't we just go to the grave of grandmother? I would really like to see it can't we do it later another time not today it can wait a bit no now i want to go now no i don't want to i'm so scared i don't want to be alone i've been alone a lot i've always been alone we didn't have kids we 
we didn't want kids. We didn't get to have them. No, no. And now we're alone. Yeah, yeah, come on. We... No, we didn't have kids, but come on, let's go. Yeah, okay, let's do it. Everything has happened and nothing. The mother and Gree come in, still in mourning clothes. The woman walks towards them a bit, stops, then turns towards the man. Come on. The man stays standing, sitting. We can't stay here. They're coming. Look. They're coming. Come, hurry up. We have to go. Come. We can't stay here. Come. Now it's over. And you didn't come. Now it is dead. Everything is so long ago, and we can't stay here. We have to go. The man stands up. Gota died a long time ago. Nothing is a long time ago. It was a long time ago, years and years ago. Nothing is a long time ago. We have to go. No, you can't go. You'll die if you go. You can't go with her. You can't. The woman keeps standing in there holding the man's arm. And you could have just come to the burial of your own grandmother. Gauta is dead, and you don't care. I, I knew it. Knew that you wouldn't care. Kree starts to cry. I can't deal with you anymore. I don't want to see you again. You didn't even come to the burial of your own father. We were. Don't give me excuses. I don't want to see you anymore. And I don't want to see you. You didn't come to Gauta's burial either. I know. I don't ever want to see you again. Never. The woman walks over and stops to look towards the tombstone. Gree stops look, looking towards the man and the woman. You're killing me. You're going to kill me. Look at your mother. What are you doing? You're killing her. With the way that you're acting. Oh, we have to go. We can't stay here any longer. We have to go. Let him be. What are you thinking? You're the one who should let him be. Not me, you. Let him be. The man goes over to a tombstone, stops and looks at it. The woman sits down on the bench and Gree goes and sits next to her. Hey. <laughs> yeah. I'm not angry with you. The man begins to walk slowly, and while the other two are sitting on the bench talking, he walks out. I can't go. I don't mean any of what I say. Don't go. You can't vanish. You too. She walks out slowly, with her head bent over, following the man out. It's not your fault. It's just how it is. But I loved him. Me too. Even though I don't really know what that means, I think I did. Me too. And now he's gone? Forever gone. Now he's gone forever. It happened suddenly? Yeah. He just died? Yeah. He stood up, and then he was dead. I can't comprehend that he's dead, that he's gone forever. It's just how it is. But his mother, is she coming? Yeah. She said that she'd come. It's been a long time since I've talked to her. But she's coming. The mother comes walking in with her head bowed along the gravel path. As she comes in the first time, She's carrying a bouquet of flowers. She sees Gree and the woman sitting on the bench. We should go. It's time. The mother slowly walks a ways over the gravel path. Gree stands up, goes and takes the arm of the mother. They turn, stand looking towards the woman, and the mother reaches her arm towards her. The woman stands up, walks over, and takes the mother by the arm, and the three women... Walk out slowly. Blackout.
All right, that was play for end of play four. We've got one more to go. Oh. <laughs> and uh, but before that, there's a panel. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we're going to take a little break yeah. before the panel. Panel is at 6.30. So 15 minutes. 15 minutes. And if people want to go in the fossil corner, again, for the people who have just arrived, we're doing back here in privacy. You can read fossil with an actor. So come on up. Step into the world if you want to. Oh, yeah. And this she's putting on now is uh, from 20 years ago. Um, this yeah. is a Norwegian broadcast. This was our first uh, television feature in Norway. Come on. Yeah. I don't know if we can hear the sound. There's no translation. Oh, but we're all in Norwegian. We know the language. My sound. No, the language. Okay, should we try? Honorary. Honorary, right here. And how should we set up for this setup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like hang out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you ready to support it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> 
Two seconds. 
If there is anyone else who wants to do the fossil corner, now is the time. Now is the time. If anybody else wants to do the fossil corner. I write fossil so how many do you have to hold it in your hand? Yeah, yeah. How many people will we be? Three? 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 Yeah, 
so we're going to start in one minute everybody <laughs> Okay, sit on the left, on the left side. Oh, yeah. Starting. So I think the camera you really have to hold here. Because it's a never veranda shoot. It doesn't matter. On the side here or on the back. There's no need with such a good camera to be in the middle of it. Okay, that's not a camera. Yeah, yeah. Right. Is it okay if you put this at it? Have you been there? Well, you don't know. The photographer walking around. No, I have Normally, they always have the middle chair. It has never been a problem. They, they, they could get like that. There's really not. Are you ready? I'm gonna hand. I'm gonna hand you over my mic. Yeah. So is it me, her, and then you? Yeah. Okay. You can hand it up. Yeah. yeah. And then I just when I have done, should I hand it over to you? Back yeah. Soon. So uh, maybe we could take the sound down from the so um just wait here for Mary. Will we start or? Well, Mary, okay. He'll be right back. How's everyone doing? <laughs> yeah, some of you have been here for the whole day. Woo! Yes, you guys get an award. Yeah, a big hand for the people who've been. Here. Yeah. Yes. Raise your hand if you've been here for all, all day. <gasps> yeah, look at that. <laughs> Hardcore. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. 
So thank you very much, everybody, for staying all day or coming to visit us. We even have visitors who are from San Francisco just wave over here to be um, um, with us. So um, welcome to the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of the program here at the Siegel We Bridge Academia and Professional Theater International at the American Theater. And it's a big honor for us to host this event. This is a landmark event honoring Jon Fasser, who everybody knows in this theater world, and, and he uh, deserved this, especially now after his uh, a big Nobel Prize. We also had readings of him uh, before. We have collaborated with Sarah, with Anna, and so it's a family event um, here. It's uh, um, right in the middle and on target what we do to bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And I think this whole day, this fantastic a marathon durational performance Sarah and Anna created is a really an extraordinary, I think, e event really doing a great service to the field, but also for the FOSA uh, community. Uh, we would like to welcome all our viewers on HowlRound. It's a nationally uh, televised what we do now, and our uh, viewers are actually from all over the world. We would like to thank VJ and, um, and uh, Thea for all of it, and also... Um, from our side, Teresa, for making this all happy, the big team. So um, we would like to ask you to take your phone out for one second, see if, if it's on silent. And um, we would now um, go ahead um, with the reading. And Fasa, of course, is uh, so uh, uh, well known, a piece uh, and part of the Pantheon of Theatre, the Schaubühne Berlin, the Royal Court um, in London, the Theatre Nanterre in Paris, and uh, many, many um, others uh, uh, have done that right now. Friends of us just did a big FASA production in Palermo at Teatro um, uh, 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 with Valerio uh, Binasco, who was the director, with Pamela Veronesi and Elizabeth Hayes and Teatro Biondo. So uh, this is not just us, it's a global, I think, uh, event. It was a marathon reading also you told me about in Oslo. So um, I feel we are in this way part of a community and Community means from communication to be together. And, and I think this is uh, what we do here tonight. So I'm going to hand it over now to uh, a great uh, council general, if I say it right, from uh, Norway, from the Royal um, Norwegian Council here in New York, highest ranked politician. It also shows you how what significant and what importance is being placed on culture um, in Norway. So thank you so much for coming, Heidi, and I give you the mic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And hello, fellow enthusiasts of literature, theater, and big uh, admirers of Jan Fossa. It's really a great, great pleasure for me to be here and to join you here at this Martin E. Siegel Theater at the Graduate Center of CUNY for a whole day dedicated to the theatrical works of the 2023 Mega Fossa. And this event, which is produced by Oslo Elsewhere co founders, Anna Ritter and Sarah. Kamen is a delightful opportunity to celebrate and immerse ourselves in the texts that have defined Foss's illustrious career and positioned him as a global literary figure. It has been 20 years since this remarkable individuals first introduced Foss's place to the US, and we're truly fortunate to listen, witness you know, this revisitation of Foss's works today. Despite being one of the most produced playwriters um, globally, Fosse's stage works remain relatively undiscovered here in the US as of now. Uh, however, I think events like today um, signify a very positive shift and a very important, very that respect, important event. And we really uh, anticipate witnessing more Fosse productions and cities across the US in the future. I'm among the men of this group, so because I, I guess we all are. <laughs> and for me, it all started with his plays, not his novels. I saw his first play, um, Someone is Going to Come, at the Norwegian Theatre. And I think it was in late 98, because I was expecting my first child, so I kind of have some memories of that. And, I think the 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 and I think that was is still one of the strongest kind of theater experience I've had and kind of made me go to every first play that 
I could see you and I find it in my way. Um, and the only later I learned Claudia is about and learned to know his names, of course. So. And, and the play we just heard, I I I tell you this one during my walking. I I really enjoyed it. I thought that was fantastic. Can't wait to see it being played in the US. Uh, I saw that um, actually two times in, in a totally different city, in a totally different country, in Russia, in St. Petersburg, where, where I was posted around 10 years ago, uh, on a theater there, uh, also an amazing experience, great actors, but interestingly, uh, with a very different scenography than Foster's normally very minimalistic style, this was extremely maximalistic with black balloons, and they're very different, but still thought still very right. I mean, I thought that was very interesting. I Now I had the same feeling as I had when I watched that. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and uh, so, yeah, thanks a lot for doing this. I mean, we're so happy to support it. And at the consulate, so Asla Nuba, my deputy, and my pal, our advice from arts and culture, and we have our intern here, Elizabeth, we are really uh, much of our work revolves around building cultural bridges between one of the U.S. and in the field of literature. This endeavor heavily relies on translations that resonates with American audiences. So we yeah, owe a uh, debt of gratitude to Sarah for your outstanding translations of Foster's plays, and of course to Damien Serves for his translations of Foster's novels, including psychology and also the recently released A Shining. Uh, and without their dedicated efforts, Foster's unique writing style, his exploration of solitary characters, and his existential portrayal of seemingly mundane scenes might not have found such resonance here. So thank you so much for bringing Foster's essence and a touch of more late to the US. Uh, and now, in just a moment, we will dwell into a panel discussion with Sarah and Anna, moderated by Melanie, who knows Jung Fossa very well, and I think you are also a great admirer of Jung Fossa. And then after that, there will be a reading of Jung Fossa's death variation. So with that, I extend my heartfelt thanks to each one of you joining us today, and I hope you enjoy the rich world of Jung Fossa. Thank you. This on, yeah. So, um, thank you for letting me introduce myself to this branch of the Fossa family. <laughs> I know, I know parts of it, but the performance or the theater part of it is new to me. And I had this wonderful experience while I was not only watching everyone reprise roles that they'd played before, but also listening to the actors speaking backstage about what it was like to play these roles 15, 16, 20 years ago of being in a Yun Fossa novel. I felt like I was in Septology <laughs> watching Asla encounter young Asla on the swings. And I'm wondering whether you are also having a somewhat surreal Fosean experience today as you are meeting people who you've known in their past lives, if time is working in a kind of as a kind of palimpsest for you as it is as it is for me experiencing all of this. So take us back to 20 years ago and tell us how it's different from now. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to, you know, you, you do a production and you finish it and you shove the script in a drawer and, and some photos and stuff. And then you, it lives in you, it stays in you. So like, I feel like I know these plays so well, they're in my bones in many ways. And I can, I can look back at a script and recall, I, I kind of can recall everything, even though I never played a role, I still like have all the text kind of there. Um, but then also it's so different. Like I just heard Dream of Autumn 
And I was like, wait, that happened? Like, I totally forgot that part about it, you know? So you just have, and and that's some of the beauty of it, the the kind of complexity that um, that comes over time. And I think that's, yeah, it's what's so fun and interesting. He's He's really dealing with questions of time, duration and um and the way yeah different moments in time it's not linear you know it's not the way that we often see things and I think that's why it blew my mind in the beginning um and why it felt so important to to do initially yeah I mean it's in it's very very interesting to revisit 20 years later and I mentioned this to some who have been here all day that um, for me, because when we first started in 2004, uh, Sarah and I were producing it together. Sarah, 2003. Yeah, we met each other in 2003, started planning it. We had the first show in 2004 and we were producing it together, creating, you know, really making this happen together. Sarah was translating and directing. And I then in those first couple of productions, I played in them, I acted in them. And um so in the first one we read today, Night Sings Its Songs, it was a very different experience to revisit it now, 20 years later. It's the role is a woman who has a very young baby. And when I played it 20 years ago, I hadn't had children yet. And now I do have children. So just that as a, as a very specific difference made me have a completely different perspective on this character. And um, so that's one side. And then it was also this surreal experience I had today reading it was as I was reading it and we were also on the projection showing the, um, the recording from 2004. Which had been in a drawer for 20 years, yes. literally. <laughs> like never watched because why would you, yeah, watch, you don't video? Want to watch theater? theater. <laughs> and, uh, and that, but also as I was standing there and reading this text, it came up muscle memory and emotional memory from when we did the production 20 years ago. And that actually surprised me that the, that how the way we did it back then also kind of came back certain things. Do, do you think that has something to do with his particular aesthetic and specifically, do you think that has something to do with the repetition that we hear or that we experience in each of the plays of lines that are quite simple, mm. compact, but pack a real emotional and often metaphysical punch mm. that get repeated not just by individual characters, but are also shared among mm. different characters. Do you think that creates a kind of emotional groove in you as a translator, as a director, as an actress, so that you can return to it 20 years later and find that it's as well-worn a groove as it was when you first said those lines or translated those lines? Yes. I mean, and yes, because you have, and, and this is something Sarah and I have talked about a lot. There's something in the way that Fossa writes where it creates an emotion just by how it's written out on the page. So some of that just is innate in how it's written. So, so yes, absolutely. And another thing that I started noticing today when we read all the plays after each other, how many repetitions there are between the plays. Yeah, there's, um, I think that's true. We, um, I'm being told to hold my microphone a little lower. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I think. That's true. I mean, I think all really masterful text, if you if you work on it and you work on it deeply, it like stays in you, which is um, why we love it and we return to the greats, you know. Um, but I think, yeah, I do think there's there's obviously like something very special and powerful about Yun's work and why why. Um, it feels different and important and like, yeah, for us to, to do. And that's it, 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 it felt important. Then it now feels important again. Um, it's, it will always be important. I've, I've read a summer's day and dream of autumn, but I hadn't seen them 
mm-hmm. performed before and winter. I think that trilogy, the seasonal trilogy, as I think of it, is probably my favorite set mm-hmm. of plays. And especially seeing Dream of Autumn performed, I was struck, and I'm always struck by this with his writing, at how funny he is. And the play that you very generously let me read in earlier, Sakala, is also extremely, extremely humorous. In fact, there's a kind of humorous component to it that is cordoned off from the more tragic or the serious component of it. How do you think about his humor? How do you think about bringing that out in translation? How do you think about asking actors to bring it out when you give them notes on how to how to read Fossa? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think the humor is really important because especially when you're dealing with things that are are dark, there is darkness in this work. We are dealing with um, some heavy subjects, existentialism, life, death. You know, we, it's so important to have the humor. You need the lightness. You need, you need the levity. And I think that's, what's amazing, right? Is that we're, Fossa really does um, does kind of touch on this everyday language, and but he he writes and writes and writes, and it accumulates so that you're suddenly in this like oh, existential world where where it just it feels so big and it encapsulates everything. It's like the entire world in the in make, created through these very simple words, and that is. Um, that yeah, that is amazing. I'm like totally forgetting your question now. What? <laughs> oh, I think you answered it. it was, I, I okay, think you answered it. It was it was about humor. humor as a translator. Yes, but Anna, perhaps you want to speak to humor as the actor embodying a character. Well, it's very freeing because, as, as Sarah says, the plays are often about very serious situations, serious uh, things happening in people's lives. So it's very freeing when there is that humor and to embrace it. It's really, uh, I'm, I'm I'm very glad that's there. Mm-hmm. And it's so beautiful when you really, when the actors together, and and, and that's funny about Fuzz, like it really then, the humor happens when it happens together. Mm-hmm. It never is enough with just one actor, you know, doing a funny thing mm-hmm. because it's the rhythm between everybody. Mm-hmm. And when it really happens, that's when it becomes fun. And that's when it also allows it to go into the depth of, of the sorrow or of the mourning. I, I I do have one other thought, which is that, you know, when it it's it is so important actually to play to play against the poetry of it, because because when you look at it in the in the text, I mean it is poetic. It's inherently poetic. So in a way, when you're approaching it, making it live, you it, you just have to like work. Uh, and you know that it's musical, like it has rhythm to it. So you have to kind of like work against that to some degree or like it gets really it's like delicate how it how it comes out and um and in order to craft it into something that could happen like night after night after night that's why this today is fun because it's like we did no rehearsal because we're like because you just then you get the spontaneity of the moment and that is always a beautiful thing once you start working on it it actually gets harder and then And then hopefully it gets better (laughs) in order to get the real production. No, I found myself uh, while watching Dream of Autumn a little bit nervous in the moment when the man and the woman are talking about love and death and love of God or God's love. And I was like, oh God, this is about to turn horribly didactic. And then one of them says, we're just saying things, yeah. you know, and, and you find that you're actually yearning for that comic relief because you're worried that it's going to tip over into the uh, saccharine or the overly religious or the dogmatic or something like that. And he's so good at calibrating yeah. the timing of those of that comic relief in the plays. Totally. The other thing I was going to say actually about the humor is that that is why I felt like it was important to translate the works, right? Because I think I said this earlier um, to those of you who've been around all day, um, but like the, you can't, humor is cultural, right? So if we just don't get the humor in the same way, 
if we're if we're going with a British translation, because we have a very different sense of humor. Anyone who has British friends will know that. And um, and so it, it that is really it was it was there were two two reasons. It was like humor culture and then and then this uh class because sometimes when we hear british translations or british idioms you or you just in there's an in, we think they're smarter because they have fancy accents or something you know and and so and so you think they're upper class when actually they're really not his characters are not upper class and so that is why we it they they had to be translated into American English. In the binder that I got, there is a wonderful note from you to the actors where you know one of the repetitions that we see in Foss's plays is yeah y e h. It's spelled out y e h in your translation, mm -hmm. and in your note you say yeah it's a kind of filler word. It can be yeah, but it can also be okay or mm hmm or yup or or whatever. And I was really struck this time, maybe maybe it's excised a little bit more in the British translation mm -hmm. by that insistence on the filler word, mm -hmm. on the yeah, the um, the uh-huh, yeah, like okay, the the these interstices mm -hmm. of of language or these interstitial sounds mm -hmm. that are made in between signification. And I was struck by that too in Sakala listening to the actress who plays the mother. Uh, just doing an extraordinary job making sounds. I don't know how many of you were here for that production, but it was unbelievable to see how much thought and work went into simply saying, oh, oh, you know, over and over, but giving it slightly different inflections. So talk to me a little bit about the filler words and maybe more broadly, talk to me about sound mm. in Fossa as opposed to sense as opposed to words that make sense, just like the 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 nature of sound in in the plays and silence, the opposite of sound. So sound and silence in these plays. Okay, continue to remind me, Way. <laughs> All the questions, there's so much I can say. <laughs> okay, so filler words, yeah. <laughs> sounds, sounds as opposed to words that are signifying, and then silence as opposed to sound, because you also have in the stage directions, brief pause, yeah, long pause, short pause. He's quite deliberate with how... Uh, with giving you directions on how long to pause as an as an actor as a director yeah 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 <laughs> um the um well first of all i want to say actors the actors that we have are amazing incredible so they're and we're incredible. so incredible oh, i mean why are you in the back come into the room <laughs> <laughs> I won't, I won't call on you I promise I won't, I won't, nobody will call on okay. you <laughs> um, but no really we are so lucky that yeah. you all agreed to do this with us because it, yeah really great actors can make anything happen you know magic magic um but uh yeah and the yeah the yeah is actually the first time we did it um the first script, and there are some relics over there on the table. Um, the Night Sings It Songs, the I I actually wrote it Y A H. Mm. Yeah. You no? Know? Yeah. 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 Because, well, and what happened, Anna Marie, who's over there, Marie, raise your hand. She was our dramaturg for the US debut production, Night Sings It Songs. And Jeff, also, I want to acknowledge, he was. One of the co-producer, the what? What do we call you? We produced what? Spring Theater Works what produced with uh and with also elsewhere and also on his other company Unbound Theater was also involved. It was a group effort to make that first production happen. Um, and we we I really didn't know what to do with the with the yas in Norwegian it's ya right and it's all over the text. There are, I think it's over 150 times it appears in that um that first play and and i noticed at one of the, another reason why i was like we have to do new american translation is because the yeah the british translation had taken a lot of them out but when you read it in Ninarsk, it's so critical it, it's it's like a connector all the characters use it and um and and so it feels so important to actually um to hear and to hear the ways the ways that people use it differently uh, or in the british it's a very it's quite a formal yeah. yes. yes yes formal yes yes which it's a very like, formal yes which which doesn't quite meet the same function or perform the same function yeah in 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 the norwegian language you use ya yeah 
as a million things, kind of like you, uh, kind of like in, in American, you use, uh-huh, mm-hmm, uh-huh, uh -huh, mm -hmm. you know, all of those, all of those sounds are ya yeah in Norway. So we can have a whole conversations that's like, yeah, 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 mm -hmm, yeah, 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 so, so, so all of those inside of the plays sort of cover all of those. It's a whole plethora. And I remember the first time we read the new baby uh, trying out translation around a table with some actors. I, I like actually have a very strong spatial memory of this. Um, and we gave the actors little slips of paper. So I wrote YAH in the translation and we gave the actors little slips of paper that said, okay, whenever you see YAH, you can insert one of these words if you want to. Because we were like, is this really going to work? Like, are we, do, do we really want to do the repetition? Like, do we need it? And you know what happened? Literally, do you remember this, Marie? Nobody no, said, no. used any of those other words. They just use, yeah. And, and, and then, yeah. And I, and we did describe, I said, you know, that it shouldn't be ya. Yeah. Don't make it a long ya yeah, because we don't want to sound like we're Norwegian. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, but, but we also say, don't make it. Yeah. Don't make, make it that yeah. nasally, yeah, yeah. A nasally American. Yeah. Which is so right. Interesting because that is the thing that he's doing. He's writing how, how people speak not how people write and so that's actually the same and it's very translatable when you get down to it into american english we say yeah all the time if you start listening to yourself you'll you'll notice you say it all the time and yet we don't write it so therefore there there actually has not really been you know a tradition of writing yeah 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 but it's it's there in your speech um so that's how it became became that and then uh, actually it took I think it was on the third play I was like ah oh, the actors always want to make a long a and they want to make it a little bit more ya yeah. so I was like you know what it's going to change to a y-e-h so it changed to a y-e-h instead of a y-a-h and that is the definitive and I swear that people use that now. I think I started this trend. Like I, <laughs> I use it to text people or something, you know, and I think I, I see it in written language more. People do use YEH. So just want to say, I think I did it. I think that was me. <laughs> Anything you want to add to yeah. the sound silence question? Um, most of all, just, I mean, what I said already, but also that it's it's just very interesting when you approach the language as an actor, that all of these like little, little pause, short pause, kind of short pause, I mean, there are all of these variations and, and you can never time it, right? So it's sort of a feeling of how you're reading in that section. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one uh, thing I was really struck by when I was watching, um, when I was watching A Summer's Day, now I'm really aware of my filler words as I'm having <laughs> listened to you. Them. Like, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I was really aware of as I was watching A Summer's Day was the incredible cinematography that was going on in the background where you had the camera uh, shooting close-ups of the actors' faces, of their hands, and those close-ups were being projected onto the wall behind me, while onto this wall, there was a still projection of the water. And I'm curious to know how you think about a multimedia fossa. Yeah. Uh, the productions that I've seen have done incredible things with music. Mm. So the production of Into the Dark Wood that I saw in Oslo last summer had an extraordinary trumpet player mm. and the way that the trumpet playing was timed to the movement of light mm. in the theater was gorgeous mm. and helped you focus your eye. Mm. It taught you where to look and how to calibrate what you were hearing with what you were supposed to be seeing. How do you think about using film or light or music or even the amateur? If if yeah. we can we can claim the amateur actor as another medium. Uh -huh. uh, how do you In think about audience. yeah, yeah? How do you how do you think about the multimedia fossa for production? 
Well, I think so in in thinking about what this event wanted to be, um, Anna and I were really uh, interested in how to push it out of normal traditional theater because our both of us have had careers that have taken us in different directions um, in the last 10 years. I've become a sort of multimedia interdisciplinary artist working at the intersection of performance and video art and public art. So this, so working with video is part of um, what I've been doing. The And actually the film team here has all been working with me on different sorts of things. Anna's become an incredible filmmaker. So this is like, part. this was part of what we wanted to try to do with this event was really see and ask this question, what happens if we try to work with multimedia um, in, in Falso's world? And I think we learned that it probably works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, is this one? Yeah, it's on. Um, for me, because I, me, me going over into film, part of that was also because I wanted to, that I wanted to be able to let the audience see other things than what you necessarily see in the theater. So I was very curious to let the camera be so close on this actress while actually a lot of people in the audience just saw her back, but to be able to be so close into the emotion of what's going on with her in a way that you can't do traditionally in theater. Mm -hmm. So so that was that experiment that we wanted to do to see what, what does that do to the listening? Mm -hmm. When you're listening, you're seeing something, and then you're actually also seeing another angle on that, mm -hmm. something you otherwise don't have access to. Sarah, when I visited you in your studio back in the fall, we talked about an idea you had to do a FOSA production outside in an open space where each audience member would have a set of noise canceling headphones so that the actors' voices were coming straight into their ears while obliterating all of the noise around it to create the sense of both spatial distance and darkness, but also great intimacy between the audience and the actor. Are you still going to do that? Or do you have any other, <laughs> any other wonderfully creative ideas that you'd like to workshop with us while you have all of us here in oh. one room? <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind. I mean, I think the ideas that I have are sort of where you're seeing a few of those tests out um today yeah with with the with the film stuff and with the with the sound with the microphones and um yeah because my work has my work has gone into the I, I, and i i've actually like written a little bit about this but um you know i think because of working on fossil's text for 10 years um they it really changed uh or it, it embedded itself in my body and this um the sort of vast landscapes and the like really intimate um closeness of of what's happening in the everyday in that those themes have like stayed with me or or that's like what i've i don't know i feel like i, I it, a lot of stuff comes out of working with these texts. And, um, and so I, I, I have this impulse to create a very, um, very big public work in that is site specific, um, that could, and that also has a way to get that intimacy, um, through sound, maybe video too. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> I love that. I, I mean, I, I love that idea. You know, there's a kind of interesting anxiety perhaps that, I have noticed in several of the comments around these events, which is that these plays are not produced mm. in the U.S., uh, at least not as much as they ought to be. And there is a strange asymmetry between the global reception of the plays and the American reception of the plays. And this is a first step toward changing that. But I'm wondering what you think the obstacles are. Is there something inherent in these plays that makes them not as amenable to staging in a New York theatrical context? Uh, is it about the larger kind of conservatism or provincialism of American theater or New York-based theater? Uh, what is stopping this from happening? Yeah. 
Good question. You want to take it? <laughs> well, I mean, I can I can share some some thoughts about it. Yeah. Like I I I want because actually when we did these productions, I think we sort of contrary to the problem, but the yeah. positive side is like we were all, we were kind of surprised about actually how much it resonated with American audiences because it really does because the way he writes is so universal one, but also there are actually quite a lot of similarities between Norwegian sort of culture of how people are and here. There is like a strong sense of needing freedom and all of these things. So, so all of that, but so why does it not? And I, I wonder if part of it is that his plays, you know, in Norway when they're done and most places where they are done, they are done on relatively small stages. Yeah. They're not really the big Broadway theater mm -hmm. productions. Mm -hmm. Even when they're done at the biggest theaters in Norway, they're not done on the main huge stages because they lend themselves more easily to being in smaller spaces. So maybe that's part of it, that it's hard to kind of find the commercial because here, here theater has to be commercial. Whereas in Europe, it's state sponsored, you know, there's, there's a lot of sponsored theater, which makes it more possible to do these smaller productions. I wonder if that's part of it. But I actually think it could be at a Broadway theater, though. I think it could be in that, that kind of space. I just had a vision of uh, cats, <laughs> Jung Fosse's version. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Sarah, do you want to ask well, that? And yeah. then I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. So get your questions ready, please. It's funny because when we started doing this in 2003, we really were like, oh, someone's going to be beat us to doing the U.S. debut production. We were really like afraid that there was going to be that as soon as, you know, that there was going to be a race to actually like do his work and that we were going to start that was going to like spread like wildfire and <laughs> And, and, and I mean, yeah, it's true that it, it, those productions did well, everyone was happy, people got it, not everyone gets it, but like, you know, it, 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 it did well. Um, and yet, and we tried to do lots of outreach and yet theaters across the country um, did, weren't, I don't know, they, they, they didn't do it and um, they didn't pick up on it. And I think there's many reasons for this. There's like, there's a lot of American writers who need productions, you know? And, um, and I think there's also, um, they, they scare people a little bit because people don't know what to do um, with them. It's like, it feels hard. It feels hard. Um, there's a lot of death and that is something that as Americans, we don't often want to deal with. And um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of suicide. And, and people kept saying to me, they're like, Sarah, this is so dark. Like, and, 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 and for me, it's not, it, it's actually very hopeful and, and it gives me hope and, and there's the lightness, but, but I think there are like America, our initial American impulse with the work often is, is towards, it, is scary. It, it, it's to be fearful. Yeah, plus there are no musical numbers. And there's no musical number. It's true. Musical numbers. I, I would be curious to hear what Paul and Marie or anyone else in the theater actually had to say about that too. Do you have any, do you want to add to that? Oh, there you go. I think there's a, I think there's a fear of European playwrights in American theater. Yeah, how that's many, true. How many German uh, productions have you seen recently or Austrian productions or Swedish or uh, okay there's been you know there's always productions of Chekhov but any contemporary Russian playwrights Ukrainian playwrights not really those playwrights exist and people read them but I don't think that they they make it onto the stages <clears throat> and that's something we need to consider but but I think as Anna said um it's there is a there's a crisis in the mode of, pr of production in theater mm -hmm. in America, mm -hmm. and it's not sustainable. You know, um, it's not sustainable in economic terms or in artistic terms. Mm -hmm. And unless we can address that, uh, and um, remember that even artists deserve to make a living, um, I don't think we're going to see the level of imagination that we see elsewhere in the world. Yes, Paul Walsh. 
teaches dramaturgy at Yale. <laughs> um, I, I will ask my final question and then we will open it up. You know, I, there are many ways in which the world of the plays is adjacent to the world of the novels. And I often think of the novels as having sibling plays. Most recently, into the dark in the dark wood, Shining is the sister play of that. Uh, there are moments in a dream of in Dream of Autumn or a Summer's Day that remind me of moments in trilogy. I, uh, but they're also a separate kind of their world unto themselves. So, what for you is the distinction, if any? between the world of Yun's novels and why you think certain certain stories, certain characters, certain preoccupations make their way into the novels and others make their way into the plays. And maybe to just ask this very concretely, I remember asking him, there's so much sexual jealousy in the plays. Mm -hmm. And the novels, there's some of that, but it's not the focus. And he said, well, theater is easy. You just put two people onto a stage and make a third person walk across it. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, you don't have to run with the theme of sexual jealousy or the futility of adultery, which is what summer, which is what Dream of Autumn really clues us into. But, but, but what what is the difference between the things that get addressed in the novels and the things that get addressed in the plays? It's a good question. <laughs> it's a, it's a very good question. It, it always feels like the plays deal with things that are a little bit more tangible. Mm -hmm. That's as good as I go. <laughs> um, or because they have to be live. They have to be tangible, maybe. Yeah. Or it's like um, the action is in here, like in a play that you have to, there's sub, there's a lot of subtext mm -hmm. and there is action. So it is kind of dealing with, yeah, the mo like time in the moment, the re like as well, that's not very articulate, but. No, I was thinking too, listening to Sakala, that there's an amazing and, and very, very subtle moment when the mother, as she's emitting her ah and her ma, there's an um, an A-M on one line and then an N on the line immediately afterwards, E-N. So there's an amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about how the religiosity or the spirituality there is kind of buried mm. in the noise. Mm -hmm. And you can't mm -hmm. quite tell whether it is a prayer mm. or it's just pain the words emitted in a moment of pain but once you see it you can't quite you can't not see it whereas that dimension of it the kind of insistent theorization of the divine is so much more part of the novels in a really explicit in a really explicit way yeah that's interesting because also because uh, Fossa converted to Catholicism like after yeah, after these plays uh, yeah. after he wrote all of those plays that you heard. I I actually I don't think I've ever tracked that. Um, like, <laughs> no, um, but but of course there's like a spirituality and a, a, this uh, sort of philo philosophical um, existentialism that's always at play. But I think the the religion thing came yeah later um so yeah i don't but yeah cool yeah let's open it up yeah. for questions from the audience do we have a roving mic we roving got a roving mic. mic we always have to have a roving mic who's going to be brave <laughs> ask uh, you have a hand right over there yeah i mean you all have hands but huh? you have a hand raised thank you so much for uh putting this day together um so I, you, you kind of addressed uh, a little bit um, my question in in the section about humor that you were talking about, and and I really appreciated that. Um, but one of the things that I found so fascinating about this this uh, you know watching the plays in you know in this setting um, was how incredibly colloquial the the language 
came out to me. I mean, you know, when we think of things that are kind of absurdist or abstract or whatever, which these plays also seem to have, um, we think about it, I think Americans are used to a different kind of language. Like mm -hmm. you you have a, you know, if you listen to a Pinter play or something like that, you, you know you're in a different world. He seems to... Um, or at least in these translations, he he seems to be working on a very much more just normal language way. And I guess my two questions are, do they feel that that same way when you hear them in the original Norwegian? And, um, you know, I, I was a, uh, initially surprised and didn't know where to place it. And then I really got into it when when you just start hearing it coming out, you know, the the language kind of going over and over and over with these these colloquialisms. How do you think that works in his overall structure of the 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 things he's trying to the themes he's trying to address? Yeah. I mean, my, I feel like my job as a translator is to get as close as possible, humanly possible, to what it feels like and sounds like in the Norwegian. Um, and that uh, sort of everydayness, um, colloquialism, that's that's very present. That's that's what we're trying to do. And I think that that is what is so unique and remarkable about his his work is that exactly what you're honing in on and that's that's his world that's his voice you know that um that it is very every day and yet it has like it accumulates and becomes this really um full thing I was I was looking actually when we first when when he won the Nobel I, I started looking to try to see if I could pull like a quote from somewhere like one of my favorite because there are there are definitely the the text that the plays hinge on that I know were always like the core for me as I worked on the productions and I would try to pull it out of context and it like doesn't work out of context yeah. you need the yeah. whole thing in order yeah. to actually yeah. um feel it mm. and that's yeah. that's so interesting yeah. and hard you know <laughs> to quote yeah I mean that's that that is the beauty I think of his writing is that it feels so casual, colloquial, and yet it's really heightened. Mm. And I don't know another writer that quite does that. And that's, uh, I mean, I, I saw the very first Foster play I saw was in 1997. And, um, and it's part of what made me know that I really wanted to engage with his work because it's quite extraordinary to have something be so everyday and yet so heightened. And that's also what creates like all the possibilities, all the layers of meaning, all the potential of what is being said and spoken and and how it resonates in with each of us, you know, that's it's all there. But there's I'm just thinking about how much has been made quite rightly of the fact that he writes in Nunoshk instead of writing in Bokmal, right? Does that have, does the colloquialism have anything to do with the mobilization of a particular kind of oral language against a written standard? Because when people talk about the novels, there's a politics to that choice, right? Is there a similar politics to the plays? Well, I mean, he he writes in Ninosh because that's his mother tongue. You know, that's what he yeah. grew up with. So there isn't a choice that he made to write in that language. That he, That's his natural language to write in. Now, just for people who don't know, the two versions of Norwegian are very, very similar. They're absolutely like, it really kind of is the same language, but it's made into two different written languages for political reasons or from a political perspective. Um and um and 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 so and and one big difference in the languages is that Ninosk, new Norwegian, which he writes in, has a much wider wider vocabulary. So it's ten it tends to be actually a lot of poets who become successful in Norway tend to write in that language because they just have more words to choose from <laughs> <laughs> to say it simply. but um, 
Um, so, but, but, but I don't know if that's like, I think it's him who's really good. I don't think it's because of the language. If we get this. No, 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 I didn't, I didn't mean that. I, I just meant, is there <laughs> a politics to the, in the theater world, is there a politics to writing in Nunoshk the way that there is a politics in the novel world to writing in Nunoshk? That was my question. I, I, I... I mean, to writing in it when it, that's your the gro language you've grown up mm -hmm. with, I wouldn't say it's a political choice in mm -hmm. any way, mm -hmm. but it certainly becomes, you know, him having the success he has definitely helps push that language, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It helps more people to learn that language, to want to learn that language. It even makes, because so in, in, in Oslo, in the capital, there are two, the two biggest theaters. There's one that does the regular Norwegian, which is the national theater, which is like the most renowned theater. And then the Norske, the Norwegian theater, which does only work in the Norske. So obviously it's given them a lot more clout because yeah. Jon Foster really becomes their writer. Their writer. But yeah. they also then do him at the national theater. Right. And then obviously they do him still in Ninosh. Right. They don't right. translate it. I think we have time for one more question. Oh no, let's just take two because both their hands went up so yeah. quickly and they've been here all day. I'll be quick. Um, oh, thank okay. you so much for hosting this. This is my first time um, listening and enjoying Pasa's place. Um, I was like reading, I think the sign over there says that what he does is write sort of about the empty spaces. Um, and then that really made me think about sort of like the temporal dimension that he's covering, as well as almost his experience of necessity or awareness, I want to say, from characters. Sometimes it feels to me like he's writing like the character and then this all, almost separate version of them that is experiencing or has an awareness of necessity of time that is like different than sort of like our everyday experience. And then it got me thinking about how the play as like a sort of like vehicle for like a system of thinking really lends itself to to this because it's sort of like, well, you have to experience, you experience necessity because you're here for like an hour. So you know something's going to happen. The narrative event too is also kind of something that is like hanging over, you know, like the the specific moments. And sometimes it feels to me like, the most dynamic moments are those where you're like, we know you have to go somewhere. But then you're like, wait, wait, we have to go, we have to go. And then the dimension of like the, the character who's grasp grappling or struggling against necessity or the narrative event. And and then the, this other almost like mystical version who is sort of like life is as it is, you know, things are happening on almost this like entirely different plane. You'll soon realize this. And so to cut it short, you know, my question is essentially whether you felt, you know, reading or engaging with Foss's work that you've developed this, perhaps a, a similar awareness and how that's also kind of influenced your experience of, you know, like the everyday as like a more, in a more existential dimension. It's a really nice question. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, you want to start? You start. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I... I feel like I often experience my life in in different time frames. I don't know if it is because I engaged with this work 20 years ago. That I can't know, but I certainly do. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's been a, it's interesting to like figure out what the, my my own trajectory is. So like, it is kind of fascinating. I the other the other day or a couple several weeks ago now maybe <laughs> I realized that um, I started turning toward so turning to making work with water um, and it happened. So we opened a summer day in Octo October October around October twenty fifth two thousand twelve, and then Hurricane Sandy hit New York City October twenty ninth. And there was, and that for me was a shift in my own uh, existential understanding of um, how vulnerable we are as humans. And, and that play is about waves crashing and crashing and someone disappearing into the water. And I, 
I only, it, it's funny because the link, I hadn't actually sort of taken it in as this connection until recently. And I realized like where my work ended up going. I ended up doing this project where I went and stood in water for a full title cycle many times around the world. And, and I hadn't actually realized that it, it was all connected to, um, to the, what I learned from working on Falso's text, but I, but it absolutely is like, because any, anytime you devote yourself to, um, to something, it changes you. And, uh, and I do, I do believe that, um, that, yeah, he helped me understand myself, uh, and, and, and the world. <laughs> I, I think dream of autumn makes what you're saying really, really visible because you have the man and the woman who clearly exist in these three separate times. There's the moment before they embark on their affair when all is longing and all is possibility. And then there's the moment where they meet his parents in the graveyard and they sort of coincidentally happen to be there at the same time that his grandmother is being buried. And then there's the third moment where they're looking back on all of that. And so, so those three characters never leave the stage, but somehow exist in those three times uh, simultaneously. And you get the feeling that the earliest version of those characters know exactly how it's all going to turn out. Mm. They know exactly how it's all going to turn out, but they're going to do it anyway. And that seems like a very human impulse. We do things all the time knowing exactly how they're going to turn out. We have children knowing that our children will die. That's the other knowledge that that play comes bearing, right? We have children knowing that our children will die eventually. Uh, we have affairs knowing that whatever the love is that motivates it will always diminish. And then looking back, everything will seem tawdry. Uh, but we do it anyway, right? And that to me is the interesting existential question, which is we have choices. Uh, we often know how those choices will play out. Uh, and we know they won't play out well, mm -hmm. and yet we do it anyway. So did we actually have the choice and did the choice matter? So that's the kind of thought that I think gets activated by a play like Dream of Autumn or in a subtler way by A Summer's Day where the woman, the young woman standing in front of the window knows he's dead. Uh, she already has in her imminent to her is the knowledge that the old woman speaks. Mm. And so that imminence that the characters come bearing for the audience is to me, the most moving part of his, of his plays. Yeah. And it's sort of like living on that. I think that's, what's exciting about, about it being live in space is like that it, every moment this um, it's, things could change. And yet they don't. They, they don't. they don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. Yeah. The sense yeah. of what could happen in any moment is really present and palpable. Yeah. Well, that's the repeated line, right? Everything is different. Nothing is different. Yeah. Everything has changed. Nothing has changed. Something always and, happens. So. And that's what the repetition is for. That's what yeah. the yeah, 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 whatever. Um, yeah, whatever. That all the repetition is building toward that. Yeah. One last, more. Last question. Last question. You <laughs> came all the way. You want to end on that question. All right, let's all let's all meditate on free will and choice Actually, at the end I of think, this. What was our mod or we had like a tagline for death variations oh, and yeah. and or dream uh uh if if also where it was there was something where it was like is fate or destiny, destiny. yeah destiny. do you choose I get it. it was about it was about this question of like yeah do you choose your own destiny choice. or yeah. 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 Anyway, we'll look that up. It's probably in the back somewhere. Thank you for that great question. Thank you all for being a wonderful audience. Thank you, Anna and Sarah. This was wonderful. Thank, Thank you for the you. whole day. It's been so beautiful.
So there is one more reading, one more reading, which is death variations, which will start. Should we start in 15 minutes? Yeah, Maybe let's do 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Uh, so if anybody else wants to do the FOSA corner, come to the FOSA corner. Not bad. No, it looks like that's your own. All right, a hunt for the stage. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that I, I just hope Bob is having a lot. He wants to have a lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's our person. Okay. Total genius. Yeah. Cool. So, but I think at the outside project, that's 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 yeah. that's Okay. You need a good sound design. Do you think it would work in the bottom? Yeah. 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 Yeah
Did you mean the Deb? Uh, we we got started and then we totally got. Is okay. she in this last play? She is. Yeah, I talked to her for about five minutes and then I just wanted. I just wanted she's somebody who I would like. I wanted to call on and sing, but I didn't. Yeah, yeah, I know, but she didn't say what I was wanting her to say. <laughs> oh, she did. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, the alternative is worse. Is everyone okay with the Yeah, you know, I, well, I, I had texted, there was sort of a, the consensus was if we could do one more question, maybe a couple of hours, just, I don't know if the time is going to work, but it is what it is. Did, did that get Done. It's it's all right. Or it is what it is. Yeah, how many favorites? So one hour, right? It's one, one hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> feel like one of one of those dancers who did great. Oh, no, right. <laughs> like one of those dancers. We're going to be steady out. <laughs> 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 no, I'm not in this one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I was literally about to grab them and oh, um, cute one. There's the perfect the, timing. Where's the uh, the Does it taste good? I haven't actually tried it yet. Where's the um six six Sarah? Yeah. Where's the old man, the older man? Okay, okay, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's Oh my goodness, right here. Yeah, no, and it's convenient. I totally understand. Hi. Thank you. What's that? I guess I think you're in. Yeah. It took a lot of when you finally had to have readers. Yeah. I'm going to do LASIK, but my iPad's so bad. I'll have to read it. Okay. You can warn what? Character. Yeah. I had a suggestion. Yeah. Yes. I do. Although, I think, could your good already be? Okay. If if you can make that, if you can gather that, that'd be amazing. You want you you want that? Yeah, see if everyone's here. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, it is important in the least flashy of ways. People only notice if I mess up. <laughs> That's yeah. Okay. 
Hey Sarah, did you want to take the picture? Is everything still here? Yeah, I think maybe if you want to run out and see your girls, you'll get outside. That's it. <laughs> Right, right, let's get all the actors for a photo. Group photo. Yeah. Yes. Huh? Yeah, and then there is this one over here. <laughs> Get on your knees, tall people. <laughs> Maybe it's actually five days. Let's see. Wait, did Beer get leave? Yeah, she did, yeah. yeah. She did, and she did that. But... And Lizanne was. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. she left a while ago. The leave time are only happy. I'm missing you. Oh, should we go in the middle? Yeah, yeah. 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 we go in the middle. Yeah. 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 All right, so there we go. Come on. Where are where, where's uh, Michael these days? He's in Denver. Yeah. 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 Go away. Thank you all for bearing with us. Almost like it hasn't been fall out. Yeah. On the other side, maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please see. I know it was a little bit in front. I don't know. All right. So, okay. Uh, Maybe I'll you. Oh, yeah. I'm going to back to the like this. We're learning how to do some switching with the live feed. I'm going to be trusted with it. <laughs> and I might take a shift too. <laughs> Oh, 
All right. Oh, look at this. It's exactly eight o'clock. We had said thought we were gonna start a little earlier, but um but here we are back to our original schedule. Okay. Um, so this is the last reading of the day. Yay! Um those of you who are standing, you're welcome to come fill in and sit around. Um, so this is Death Variations. We did this production in 2006. We have four cast original cast members who you're about to see. We have David as the young man. We have Deb as the young woman. We have Diane as the older woman. And we have Frank playing, he's playing someone way older than, way. Yeah, he, yeah, he's playing the older man. And we have Natalia as the daughter. And we have James as the friend. Um, I think we should just start without a, 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 we, Oh, the experiment, which you're seeing, back here on the, on the wall is we're trying to play with live feed this time uh, with layering the different live feeds together yeah. and with going back and forth between them. So that's what we're, we're gonna be employing um, and the cameras will be roaming around. Enjoy, all right, ready guys? Any questions? Do we need to do some jumping jacks? <laughs> Or something? Okay. All right. Let's do it. As if it were there always and never. And it can't be understood and it never can be abandoned. It is a life with a different reconciliation than the one we will see. We'll see. And it goes back to its openings, but goes on and on into a night revealing. What are you talking about? Into a night, an illuminating space where imperfections rule, letting it be understood that one understands that, what it is to understand. That one understands. <laughs> that one understands. She moves away from him. It's so awful. I don't understand it. That she could. No. I don't understand it. Yeah, we should have done something. Yeah, long ago. Yeah. We have to do something. There's nothing we can do. Is it too late? Everything's too late. Why did she do it? I don't understand. Our only daughter, the only... Our only child. But it can't be this way. Not possible. She followed her death. Don't say that. She can't be dead. That's not the way it is. She is dead. She is gone. It cannot be gone, gone. Not forever. possible. No. No. And that she could do it. Can't you go? I, I want you to go. You want me to go? Yeah. <laughs> but we, yeah, you know, it's just the two of us left now that she's gone. You, you have to go. Because I can't handle seeing your face. She moves away from him. I just thought, yeah, but I had to, you know, tell you. Yeah. Boom, boom. But... 
You can't stay any longer. You have to go. The young woman who is pregnant comes in and walks toward them. Mm. The older woman, they look at each other. It's all so long ago. I remember how it was when I carried her. But it feels like, yeah, almost as if it never happened. Don't you feel that way too? The young woman holds her stomach, stands there and feels it. And the friend comes in. He looks towards the young woman, looks down. The older woman and the older man look at him, frightened. They look down. And I don't want to anymore. Because it all has a way of vanishing. I no longer have reason. What a stupid thing to say. The young man turns around and looks at the young woman who comes in and goes towards her. They meet, embrace each other, move away from each other, look at each other. I am no more. I want no more. Yeah, okay, we're finally here. Took a while back there talking to that crazy landlord. But now... He takes out a keychain. Now, yeah, now we finally got a place to live. Isn't it great? We have lived, yeah, how many, how many places have we lived? A number of places anyway. It's not so bad here. Sure, we can live here for a while. Anyway, it is just a basement and it's probably damp and cold here, but yeah. It really was the only thing we could get. I don't like you care. Well, I guess maybe it's okay. At least when you're here, it's okay. Yeah. But that landlord was totally horrible. I just hope he won't come and bother us and knock on our door and stuff. I'm sure it'll be okay. Just standing there, staring, saying nothing, just standing there. And it is expensive. We have to pay a small fortune just to live here. We can't afford much else after the rent is paid. We've got just enough money to pay the rent. We do think the bad man will get almost all of our money just so that we get to live here in his basement. It was the only place I could find. I just, I, I couldn't. I know that you did the best you could. You did. I didn't know that. I mean, you tried as hard as you could. And in the end, you, you found, you know, a... We don't have to live here that long but we do have to live someplace and it's not that bad here we can live here at least for a little while it feels like my belly is going so fast yeah and ridiculously fast we are way too young to have a baby you know <laughs> But since we're stupid and not careful, then, yeah. Yeah, you know, when you don't know how to be careful, then I'm sure my grandmother would have something to say about it. There, there was something she said, something about being careful, the expression. But you can't remember it? No. Sure. Something about paying the price? Maybe. Yeah, probably something like that. It will be okay. You'll see. Yeah, that man wanted a deposit up front and whatever else he could get, the landlord, and now just a little. Almost nothing. So what are we gonna do? I have to try to get a job. I can try. You. You. Yeah. You the way you look? Yeah. No. Come on. So I have to just sit here alone in that landlord's basement hour after hour while you're gone to some job? I probably won't get a job. <laughs> no. A little. But not that much. We have just a little money. But we'll handle it. Anything, you know, those things, those money. We have each other. 
and and we're young. Not a lot. It's enough. I just know. We'll handle it. If you say so. But I'm so worried. We're young and strong. Right. It's true. Up in the air. That's the way life is. Don't be scared, okay? He enfolds her. Stands there holding her. Not possible. It can't be. No. She can't be gone. She's gone. Our only child, she. Yeah, she, my only child, she cannot be gone. Not possible. She's no longer with you. She's with me. This is the way it is. I saw her lying there. They called, asked me to come, asked me to come and see her. That is not the way it is. Saw her where she lay. I had to go and see her. When I see your face, yeah. it, your face, I can't handle seeing your face. I had to come, they called. Your eyes. And she was just lying there. Your face. She just lay there. But now I'll go, I. Yeah, yeah, I'll go then. But I had to, you know, I had to come say it to you, tell you. Yeah, but now I'll go. She just lay there? And her hair. And the face. The face. She was not there anymore. She wasn't in her face anymore. Her face was empty. Can't you go? Just go. Because I can't handle... Go. Can't you go? Do you think she wanted to do it? She wanted to be with me. She and I are together. Now she's with me. No. She just did it. It just happened that way. She did it. Uh, she didn't know what she was doing. That doesn't help. It can't be undone. Now she's with me. But can't you? It's like, I, yeah, I, I just can't. Don't be scared, okay? Because yeah, you, you look so worried, but you, you don't have to be scared. I'll take care of you. I will. I'll always. I'll be your friend. I will. You understand that, don't you? Everything is gone. Now I have told you. I will always be your friend. All years, all days, I'll be there. I will be there for you in your nights, in your days. I'm so happy I met you. And it opens up and vanishes and... Now that I've met you, I can... Rest, I can sleep now. Yeah, everything's better now. So don't be scared of anything. Don't be scared. Nothing bad is going to happen anymore. No, nothing. Are you sure about that? Absolutely positive. Okay, let's say that then. <laughs> yeah, shall we? We shall. <laughs> now it's not. All that long till you'll have the baby, right? Right, that's what you were going to say. How long is it? A few weeks? In, yeah, in, yeah, in seven days. Seven days? Do you remember? I'm, I'm so bad with dates. Um, I never remember numbers. I can barely handle remembering my own birthday, but other numbers, <laughs> I, I I do remember, I, just not exactly, yeah, not the exact day. I, I mean, I have, you know, I have a lot to deal with, yeah. I know that. So don't get mad at me. I'm not mad. It was nice with your parents to let us have money. Yeah. They don't, you know, have that much themselves. No. If I hadn't been able to borrow some money from them, 
Yeah, I, I don't know. No idea. But we don't need to think about that. Now we are together and we've got a place to live and we've got a little money too. Yeah. Everything is okay. Yeah. Hey, it's tight in it. My belly. Here. She touches her stomach and looks at him. It's tightening? Even more. It's tightening even more. Hey, I think... Is this, is this the birth? Are, are you having it? Now she's having the baby. We we have to yeah. Then we have to we we, we have to. I think it's the contractions. We have, the, we have to get to the hospital. Yeah. But you gotta get the car. Yeah. Young woman doubles over in pain. Yeah. God, it hurts. Really hurts now. And now now it really really hurts. Uh, it's changing. Yeah. Uh, but it's probably the contractions. I think I'm gonna have it. We've got to. Uh, uh, can I think about it in the car? I can't take the bus. No way. Uh, <laughs> no, no, of course not. Maybe I. Yeah, maybe I could. Yeah, yeah. Go up to him, to that, to that landlord. Ask if I could use his phone. Are you serious? Yeah. He stands there, and she has another contraction, and her face grimaces. Oh, I'll go. Don't come. I'll hurry. Please. No, wait. I'll come with you. I, I can't I? Uh, well, yeah, if you want to. I'll stay. Go with you. He puts his arm around her shoulders. Yeah, it's... Now she's gone. Gone forever. Don't talk about it. I felt good just now. I pictured her where she lay, cuddling in my arms. And and I see her toddling across the floor with that black hair of hers, that long black hair. I see the child I was going to have walking around in her rain gear in the wild rain. And stomping her short little legs in the mud. Oh, she stomped as much as she could. She loved that. She's such a good girl. Sweet. And I remember it. First, she had no hair at all, and then she grew that long black hair of hers. She was so nice. Always. She was so undemanding, never asked for anything, and was happy with whatever she got. <laughs> she loved food so much. Uh yeah, when she was little, she loved everything she got, eating and laughing and eating some more. Oh. And when she got older, she'd sit there with her feet pulled up on the chair, sitting, sitting there reading. Hour after hour, she'd sit there reading. That's what she did most. She read and read. Don't just stand there. No. I had to come and tell you. Yeah. The young woman comes in. Her belly is gone. She is quite a bit older. She stands and looks around, and the friend looks towards her. Nice to see you. She didn't really like to play with other kids. She was easily frightened. When they would yell in rough house, she would just want to go home. Are you there? Yeah, what is it? Come here, please. The daughter comes in. You can't just sit there in your room. No. I need it. Yeah. I don't know what to say. You really have to do something. Yeah. You can't just stay home. No. I don't want to hurt you. I only want what's best for you. You have to have a future. You too, and so, yeah, you've got to go to school, just like everybody else. The friend gets closer to them. Yeah. Yeah, sure, of course. Oh, you don't like it here? There? No. No. I don't really know. Is there too much noise, maybe? Yeah. That's how it is. 
Yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah. Yeah, it is nice. But do we know each other? Have we met before? Yeah, haven't we? No, don't. Can't you see? You have to be careful. Don't. Don't speak to him. Nice to see you. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, maybe we know each other. Maybe we've known each other for a while. We have, uh-huh. Yeah. We probably do know each other. Huh, maybe. Yeah, I guess we do. Probably. Yeah, we do. And you're okay? Yeah, kinda. Your hair, so beautiful, long, black. You think so? Yeah. Really beautiful. But where have we... Yeah, met before. I'm not sure. Or maybe we've always known each other. That could be. I guess it could. I think we've always known each other. I guess we have. But now I have to go. You have to come back. Yeah. You'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. I can do that. You promise? Yeah. He goes. You sure? Yeah. He leaves, and the daughter leaves after him. Pause. It was so nice. And so calm. So calm and nice so we lived there and the days passed years they passed and then she moved and i hardly ever saw her she must be here she can't just vanish no she is here she must be here still the older woman moves away from the older man turns towards him and now i'll go you said you didn't want to see me anymore, and I can go. You said you didn't want to see my face. The young man comes in. He is also quite a bit older. He stops, stands there, and looks down, and the young woman looks at him. I don't know what it is about your face. I can't handle seeing it. You're no longer in your face, your eyes are no longer your eyes. They are... It all happened the way it happened. No, nothing. Yeah, why do you ask? Something with me. Don't tease. Yeah, there's something... Yeah, you said to say it, you know that. No, it's nothing. Yeah. Okay, it's nothing. It's nothing. Now why are you saying that? No, it's nothing. Why do you ask? No, I am saying it is nothing. I do. He moves away from her. Where are you going? Just out for a bit. You should stay. You're really at home anymore. Do you always have to go? No, I can just as well stay home. Did you say? Yeah, what's going on with you? Nothing. Don't mind. I know it. What's going on with you? Can't you stop? He moves further away from her. Okay. Going to bed. Do you want to pee? I do, but I'm tired. Oh. 
Don't you like me? Don't you love me anymore? It's not that. What is it then? I'm just tired. I want to sleep. Say what it is. It's nothing. Yes, it is. She grabs his arm. Tell you. Know. Say what it is. To me. Say it. Are you sure you want to know? Yeah. She lets go of his arm. Pause. Okay. It's, it's not the way it is. Don't be silly. Okay, then I do. Just say your name. That's not the way it is. Don't lie. I get it. I do. I'm not stupid. I get that much. No, it. that's not the way it is. I get that much. Yeah. It's, yeah, so now you know. Can I go to bed now? Yeah, yeah okay. And yeah, there is light in that which vanishes and yet remains. Isn't there? There is. Everything is gone and nothing is left. And yet, yeah. Yeah, it's there as something else, in a way. It's... Uh, don't just stand there. No. I, I can't quite handle going either. Where are you? Here. She walks around a bit. Here. I'm coming. The daughter comes in. I was just. Yeah, I'm here now. Say you're coming. And then you don't come. I did come. She and the young woman go towards each other, embrace each other, let go of each other. But what's going on with you? Are you sad? What's going on? Nothing. Don't be silly. I can see it. I can see that there is something. You're sad. It's nothing. Yaha, yeah, huh? say. Say what it is. Yeah. Where have you been? Just out for a little while. Went on a walk. And then, yeah, I was in my room just now. But you know that, don't you? Where's dad? What did you do while you were out? I just went on a walk, nothing else. Yeah, like always. But what's going on? It's nothing. Okay, well, so. But where is dad? Why isn't dad here? Is he on a trip? Where is he? He's been gone for so long. Where is he? He's gone to sleep. Can't you say where he is? I'll go to your home. I've already done it. Yes. What's going on? What's going on with you? Why are you sad? Can't you say it? It's Maybe I should go to bed. No, don't go. Stay here. Just be here with me. I can't just be here. You're not saying anything anyway. I guess I'm not. I'm just here. The friend comes in, stands there, looks at the daughter. But then, yeah. Hey, no. why? Why are you standing like that? Don't stand like that. You're standing so still, frozen almost. You can't just stand like that. The young man comes in. No. I will go. But I had to. Hey, there you are. Hey, where have you been? You've been gone so long. Where have you been? No, I, uh, nothing. Can't you say it? Where have you been? Do you have, yeah, a present for me? Do you? Yeah, now, like. 
when I was little? No, I should maybe. But say it. Say where you've been. I've been waiting for you. No, I, uh, no, I, I, I've just been. been waiting. But where have you been? Say it. You have to say it to me. Are you going to pick up your things? His things? Pick up his things? Why? He's going to pick up his things. He's moving. Dad is moving. He is moving. Are you moving? No. You're just playing. Say something. You tell her. I'm... Yeah. Mom and I. You're not moving. You're staying here with me, with us. Tell her. Say why. Yeah. For a little while anyway, I'll, I'll be, yeah, I, I, I'm I, going to live on my own for a while. That's what mom and I. Mom and I. Say it like it is. No. But you can visit me as often as you want, and, and if you want. Oh, she's going to live with me. Yeah, I guess you should. I guess, I guess that'll be best, maybe. No, we will live here, all of us together. I am your friend. That's not really possible. Because dad, yeah, he's in love with someone else. Someone else? Dad can no longer live with us. I can help you pack. Thanks. You were so nice. Should we get started? Um, uh, then you and I? Sure. You were so good. You are my favorite. But you have to move. I guess I do. But you are so good to help me. I can pack shirts. Thank you very much. The young woman goes, and the friend goes after her. He stands there and watches her go out. He stays standing there and looks down. And socks. You are so kind and helpful. You're my best friend. And books, because you'll probably want to take some books. Yeah, that'd be nice to have some books. I can pack them. But I don't need to take a lot with me, because maybe... Maybe you won't be gone that long. No. Yeah, you have to come back. Soon. But you should probably take some books with you anyway, and some clothes, and some other things. I will help you. I will... I'll help you pack. Just say, say what you want me to pack. Hey. Yeah? You can wait a bit. There's no rush. I guess I have to go. Yeah. I guess so. But come back soon. I could be with you. Yeah. He goes out. Wait. She follows him out. I don't want to see you again. I never want to see you again. She was such a sweet girl. Now we will walk away from each other and never see each other again. Just walk away from each other. Yeah. It vanishes and comes back. Vanishes and comes back. We have to walk away from each other. But I miss her so. I think about her all the time. I'll always think about her. She is always here. Now she's with me. Even though she's gone, she is here. She is here. And I am alone, and I'll be alone. You don't have to be alone. I want to be alone. It's not good for you. I want to. I want to be alone. It's not good for you. I want to be alone now that she's... She's just vanished as well. I can't handle it. What did you say? No, nothing. I had to come and tell you. Yeah. The daughter comes in a good deal older. I'll go. I had to, you know, yeah. You had to know. 
Yeah, they called, asked me to come and see. Yeah, if it was her. But there you are. It's nice to see you again. I've thought about you a lot. Do we know each other? Yeah, of course. We have always known each other, haven't we? Maybe. Now we know each other. Now, anyway. Maybe. And maybe we have. Always known each other? But you shouldn't be with me. It's not good for you. Why not? No. And now I have to go. Why? But it was good to see each other, wasn't it? It was. We do know each other, you and me. Yeah, uh, but you shouldn't. Don't like me. Why not? No. After all these years. No, what, what do I mean by that? All my years. Yeah, maybe just that it's been a long time. You don't know me. Or do you? I know you. Maybe you know me. Yeah, I have to because when I lie there after all my years in my bed and it's evening, it's night, that's when sometimes you lie there. Yeah, it, it's like you're lying there, yeah, next to me. And we just lie there resting quietly, calmly, almost worthy, we lie there. You don't know me. I'm not like that. And it is calm, a calm rest. Like sitting and watching the sea. Just sitting there, watching the sea so calmly. We lie there next to each other in the bed, I think, as I lie there in the evening. You shouldn't like me. Shouldn't I? Don't you like me? I do. Can you feel me lying next to you? Yeah. Huh. I guess that's the way it is. After all my years, what could I possibly mean by that? We don't really know each other. We're close to each other and so far away from each other. We are far away from each other and quite close to each other at the same time. That's just the way it is. The young woman comes in. Yeah. <laughs> and there is peace in that. Real peace. Don't you think? I do. You are such a good girl. And it's good to think that you're lying there next to me. That you're always lying there. Just... Lying there. Don't. It's dangerous. Don't you understand? And should I say I, I don't want to know you? Not even you? But the... You're sweet. I don't want turmoil. Just the calm. Do not. Don't listen to him. You have to be careful. Maybe I am. Yeah. In love with you. Or it's something, anyway. I guess I need someone, too. And it's possible to have a secret, imaginary peace where you rest. Just rest with another. But I want to be alone. Always alone. Do not. Do not. Don't you understand? We are in love. But I can never live a love. It's not possible. The young man comes in, looks towards a young woman who turns away. It's possible. Everything's possible. It's not possible. I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't succeed. I'm not like that. But you are good to rest against when you don't even know it, when you just lie there far away being whoever you are, then you are good and calm when you're like the sea to think about. To watch, that's when you're good, when you are far away. And at the same time, very close. 
Maybe I'll miss you. The young man goes towards the young woman. We have to talk. She doesn't want to live with you anymore. No. She says she wants to move, wants to live on her own. She can do that, I guess. But she's so young. Yeah, bit her. She has to do what she wants. But, yeah, I don't completely understand it. She... What were you going to say? Yeah, but, you know, she's, she's so alone. She doesn't really have any friends, not that I know of, anyway. Not a single friend. No other girls, no boyfriend, nothing. She's always been on her own. And so, yeah, if she lives alone, then she'll just become even more alone. Yeah. Yeah, of course. The daughter goes towards the young man and the young woman. You're standing here talking, you two. Yeah, I guess we are. Yeah, now, are you sure that you want to move out on your own? Yeah, yeah, I've decided. And you found a place? Yeah. Now, if you've decided, then there's really not much I can say. But if you want to live with me, you have to stay here. You're welcome to. Yeah, and you, you can always live with me if you want. With you and that woman? No, I don't think so. I couldn't deal with that. But if you wanted to, yeah, well, you could. No, now I want to, yeah, live on my own. You can. Yeah, that's what I want. She walks away from them, and she suddenly sees the friend. Nice to see you again. Yeah. I've missed you. You shouldn't miss me. You are good to lie next to, and you are calm. Calm like the sea, aren't you? Maybe. Yeah, and a lot of the time, yeah, it's like my heart is around you. Or it's, yeah, it's more like, yeah, like my heart is bigger than myself, and in the part that's bigger, there you are. Or not you, of course, but it is you who is there. She and the friend walk towards each other. For you, how is it for you? Don't think about me. It's not like that for you? Say something to me. I don't know what to say. Just say something. I don't have anything to say. He begins to walk away from her. No, don't go. He stops and she smiles at him. Hey. I'll call for you. Say your name. Say my name? Yeah. Yeah, I'll say your name. I don't know what to say. <laughs> walks away from her a bit, turns towards her. I'll go then. Hey! He stops, and they stay standing there watching each other. Then they go a little further from each other, and he turns around and looks at her. Hey, why are you so far away? I have to be far away. And I have to go. No, don't go. And then we can't ever... Because... You know, love always hides. Yeah, hides and shows itself all of a sudden. Yeah. I have to go. No, don't go. I'm scared. Don't be scared. I'm so confused. I have to go. No, don't go away. I have to go. No, don't go. Don't. I think it's better. You must be careful. Don't you understand? Do not. No, don't do it. Maybe I'll go. I miss you already. She looks around and then begins to go towards the older woman. But is it really you? <laughs> it's so nice of you to come by. It's been so long. <laughs> but you must be really busy. I haven't seen you in so long. Are you doing okay? Yes, thanks. That's good. Yes, thanks. Everything's okay. But I haven't seen you in so long. Hey. Yeah, hey. Can't you? Yeah. 
you know, come and yeah, see me? Come and visit your old mother a little more often? Hey, you should do that. Hey, I... Yeah, I just thought I'd stop by briefly. Yeah, just to say hi. Yeah, I don't have much time. I have to go right away. You have to go already. But you just got here. It was nice to see you, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to stop by, really, but I have to go now, right away. Yeah, yeah. goodbye, then. Uh, and let's talk. Can't we? But, hey, I haven't seen you in so long. It was so good to see you again. She and the daughter walk away from each other. No! Don't go! Don't! The friend comes in, walking towards the daughter, and they stand there. She looks at him, then looks away. He was there, and I didn't know it was him. But then he stood there in front of me, came towards me. He came walking towards me, far, far away. Towards me and towards me he came with his hair and the rain in his hair and the light from his eyes. Closer and closer he came and I couldn't. And then he stood there in front of me. You shouldn't come and see me. It's not like that. You really shouldn't. The daughter then looks towards the older man, and she goes towards him. Uh, oh, this is nice. I haven't seen you in so long. Good of you to stop by. I thought I should after so long. And you're doing okay? Yes, thanks. Everything's okay. That's good to hear. No, but that's nice. So everything's okay? Um... Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's nice you stopped by. Really nice. Yeah, thought I should stop by. That was thoughtful of you. <laughs> Otherwise, you're doing okay, yeah? I guess I'd say so. That's good because you know, I yeah, I just worry about you. That's just the, the way it is. Obviously, I think about you a lot because it's just you know, yeah, that that not that easy being young, either. I'm not so young. And not no, not that young. No, I couldn't be. Not when I look at my father, how old he's become. Oh, there's, there's old, and then there's old. I mean, not so hard, there's... Not so hard? You mean not so hard that you couldn't go and find yourself a new girlfriend? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You see each other a lot. Yeah, we... <laughs> yeah, we... We, yeah, we, yeah, we were thinking that we might, yeah, move in together. You're not getting married. No. Married for the third time? First mom. And then that woman. You never liked her. No. <laughs> and now a third one? Are you getting married? It might very well end up that way. <laughs> Are you moving? Yeah, to where she lives? Maybe it'll turn into that, but we'll see. Nothing is decided. But I'd like to live here in the same town as you, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have to go. Do you have something to do? I have plans. T tonight? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to stop by and say hi, since I happened to be in this part of town. Yeah, well, then, 
But it's it's nice that you stopped by. I haven't seen you in so long. You, you have to come back soon. I will. Yeah. Do that. Is she coming soon? Yeah, her, your girlfriend? Yeah. Yeah, she's staying with me right now. Went out to run some errands. She doesn't want to meet me. She does. <laughs> if you stay a little longer, you'll get to meet each other. But, you know, it's not that simple, really. I guess that she thinks that, yeah, maybe, yeah, that maybe it, it can... It can wait a little while. No need to rush. No. I think I'll... Or you can meet each other later. Maybe that's just as well. But, yeah, you could... You should obviously just stay. And it's, it's about time you meet each other, obviously. I have plans tonight. You're going out? Yeah. Yeah, and then... What? No, nothing. The daughter turns and walks away. Hey, hey uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about, yeah, when you were a kid, uh, is there something you remember, something you remember better than anything else, something or other that has stuck? She keeps walking. Yeah. Yeah, something that's there and, and keeps you going. Something that is you. Something you can live on. She doesn't turn around. Yeah, something that's good and, and, and fills you with, with happiness. Or if not that, yeah, well, something yeah, something that makes you happy and makes life worth living. Something that, but can't you wait? Just Do you have to go right this minute? You, you just got here. Can't, can't you wait? Stay here a minute longer? Don't go. Just can't we be together for a minute? He turns around, looks at the friend, then looks down. No. She turns away from the older man. Long pause. And he comes walking towards me. With rain in his hair, one night, he comes walking towards me. In his own light, he comes walking. In that... Music that's his own. He comes walking. And the rain in his hair will always be there. His hair in the rain. One night, right there, right then. She walked out into the night, into the rain, into the wind. Because most things change, vanish, turn into something else. That which never changes is rain in his hair. One night, right then, right there. The older man and the older woman looks towards each other, say standing there and look down. He came walking towards me, his hand waving. She must have walked down to the harbor, walked along the wharf. Because his hair in the rain is there, like heavenly light. Because love resembles death, the way his hand waving is also always there his hair in the rain, and just one night of rain. The friend reaches out to her, and she goes towards him, and he takes her in. And they stand there, holding each other, and they let go of each other. She goes from him, and he stands there and looks after her. She walked along the wharf in the rain and the wind, in the darkness, in the pitch-black darkness. I can see. Everything becoming calm and nothing becomes clear and like pain and rain in his hair. She walked there along the wharf in the darkness, alone in the night. And far, far away, he comes walking towards me in his very own light. She and the friend move a little bit apart from each other. And there, inside that great luminous sleep, in the darkness there, in the luminous darkness there, we find, we find the great desire. The desire in that great sleep. She walked there in the night, along the wharf, in the darkness and the wind. She walked there alone in the rain. I can come to you. Can't you come to me and be with me, talk to me? Come to me if you want to. You can live with me. I'm here. I need you. Can I help you in, in some way? Can I do something for you? 
Come, talk to me. Be where I am. Come to me, please. I love you so much. I could come to you. I am with you. We will be together. I have to be alone. You have to come to me. Speak with me. But I miss you. The friend goes towards her and she looks at him, scared. You were inside my heart. Again. You were there. In the pitch black night, she walked there alone, the wharf, alone in the darkness. Don't come. And the waves crashed and crashed against the wharf. The daughter and the friend look at each other, then both look down. You'll always stand there in the rain, with your hair in the rain, and your hand waving. And it's so scary. It is such a vast nothing. But it's just the way it is. We can't choose. We're simply each other. We're just standing there in the rain. She walked along the wharf alone in the night. But it's just the way it is. We are there. We're standing together there in the rain. We always stand there. And we never stand there. And it's kind of good. And kind of bad. It is. Why is that? It's just the way it is. Maybe. And everything is long gone, and everything's just happened. And it makes no difference what we do and what we don't do. Because it rained in your hair, and we'll never leave each other. It's just the way it is. And your hand waving far, far away, guaranteeing loneliness. And I walk out on the edge, and I stand there looking out over the sea until your hand enfolds me and touches my hair imperceptibly as a dark night and your hand runs through my hair. And then, yeah, no one really knows what happened. And your hand has never run through my hair and yet it does all the time. I feel your hand in my hair and I stand there on the edge I see your hand, I see your hand. I see that the dark sky and the rain is your hand. I want to hold your hand. The friend reaches his hand out towards her and she stands there quite far away from him and he looks at his hand and looks at her and they go towards each other, reaching their hands towards each other and they stand there like that and hold each other with their hands they move their fingers in and out of each other, telling each other their stories through their fingers, and after a while they fold into each other, and they stand there holding each other, and they calmly hold each other, let go of each other. They embrace each other, kiss each other. Long pause. They found her in the morning, floating in the sea. She lay there, floating in the sea. We'll handle it. It'll be okay, you'll see. I never come back. I always come back. And now you have to go. I don't want to see you. I never want to see you again. I shouldn't have done it. I want to live. I want to watch the sea. I want to watch the waves in the sea. I want to walk in the rain, in the wind, in the darkness. I want to be with the two of you. I didn't want to. Everything was just black and wet. He was black and wet and luminous. And the water and the waves and the waves that crashed and crashed. And then he was good. He was peace big as love and calm as the sea, and the sky was his hand. But I didn't want to. I'll go. 
I can't handle seeing your face. I regret it. I want to go back. I want to be alone again. I shouldn't. We did it. I feel like we need to get all the actors up here from all the plays and yeah. just give them a big applause, all of them. And, and, also and, and the video, the film team, and, and Stephen, Stephen, and the film team. Everyone's excited. Yay! Yay! Okay, now. And big hand to the audience. Yes, and thank you, Frank Henschka and Siegel Center for having us. Thank you all for being here. Um, I think we don't, do, do we have anything else we need to do as a group? Frank, anything else you wanna say? Yeah, there we go. That's really cool. It's so good to be reunited with that. You want to know why, doesn't it? Now you're layering it all on. Thank you. Got to bring some, you know, to go into some, some layers with Jossie, uh, right? Okay. Oh, please. Yeah, you should like to show it around. No, no, no. But you know what? No one really did show. No, it's okay. I just need that. Because yeah. well, I had it digitally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's how I was. Yeah, yeah. I was still afraid to not look at it at yeah, all, yeah. but I got to glance a little. So, so. Yeah. Yeah. Now we have to find Are something delicious to do on. Are you getting enough challenges? Yeah. 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 challenges? Yeah. With that artist? Yeah. Well, now we just you know, sort of just moving into this weird thing and writing. And all. I feel that. But as an actor, no. 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 Even doing, you know, if you get the big money jobs, whatever, you know how it is, network television, whatever, you're not getting any, any colors. You know, I need some, I need a good, rich indie, you know, you know, as a lead, you know? God forbid. Yeah. Play with all the colors in the palette. But I believe it'll come, you know, it's, uh, you know, keep creating, uh, you know, going, out, going down that path. It's like you're the, kind of actor, kind of go more and more into like, what you are. Yeah. So in that sense, it's yeah. Yeah. It's not like you're, it's not like you're on. Right, 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 not at all. Okay. Oh, I got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is right. Did you shoot across two parts? I I must I must give a for the Yeah, I 
gro alltså jag var på konsulatet och det var Nobel Nobel Ja. Nej, jag har inte sett vad vi får till när jag säger. Kom igen. Ja, det är det. Kom igen. Ja, det är det. 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 Ja,